Picture the world on fire. Mechanized cyborg nightmares wander battlefields choked with human corpses. Machine guns and spinning blades decimate anyone in their path. This isn't a battle. It's a massacre of the most brutal kind. And it's the future Prometheus wanted. War is changing. Change with it. The words nod at the back of Agent Perez's mind, a parasitic phrase burrowing into his brain. Until now, it was drumming loudly in his ears as the beam of his flashlight fell over the unsettling sight. There had to have been a dozen of these things down here, left to rot in the dark, like the broken, discarded toys of some demented child. They were still as the light caught the glint of the metalwork protruding from beneath flesh, taking the place of limbs. Perhaps it was the heat of the desert above, but even a seasoned agent like Perez was having a hard time stopping his stomach from turning at the mere sight of them. A sudden clang of metal hitting the ground caused Perez to turn, startled, pointing the beam towards the source of the noise. Something had moved, there was no doubt about it, or had a piece of unused equipment just fallen. Surely there was nothing alive down here. Flexing his fingers to stop them from shaking, Perez dragged his sleeve over his forehead, mopping up the sweat from his brow before reaching for the bulky handheld radio. He raised the boxy device to his face and pressed the thumb down on the push to talk button. He gave them the usual, reported his location, possible signs of movement, and request for backup. It all fell on deaf ears the only response being the hollow squawk of static that followed. Perez repeated himself, word for word, hoping the signal would carry his voice to the others. Still, there was no reply. Perez was still for a short moment, listening for any further signs of movement. He clicked off his flashlight, heart racing as he did, letting the light disappear and leaving the underground lab in darkness. The absence of light seemed to make the agent's ears all the more sensitive, so much that he was able to detect a footstep placed gently against the stone floor. Click. The flashlight was on again. Nothing. No sign of anything. Perez gave an uneasy, shaky sigh. He was sure to be jumping at his own shadow next. Yet still, the words and the noise from before were nagging him. He couldn't have misheard it, could he? There was no wind down here. Nothing else that could have possibly caused something to fall over. So he tried again letting the room stay dark for longer this time. The air shifted around him. There was something there, something moving. Perez waited, directing his flashlight towards where he thought it would be, whatever it was. He kept his hand gripping the flashlight as still as possible, despite the tremor shaking his wrist. As he reached into his shoulder holster with his free hand, the trembling fingertips of his right hand unclasped the leather catch keeping his standard-issue revolver snugly affixed to the left side of his body and slowly producing the small firearm. Perez said a silent prayer that it was at least loaded, and he crossed his wrist, pointing both the barrel and the gun toward the moving thing. Then, his thumb flipped on the light again. Immediately, he saw it, and it saw him. The Sahara, as beautiful as it was blisteringly hot, Agents had been issued with wet towels and additional bottles of water aboard their jeep as they barreled across the sand towards the site. Probable anomalous, Command had said. Some kind of open subterranean space beneath Jabil National Park in Tunisia. One of the agents sitting next to Perez joked that they'd been sent out to the desert to find some empty catacombs. He'd soon be wishing that was the case. They reached the area and set up a temporary base camp in record time. Their objective was simple determine the exact coordinates of the empty space, examine further, and report back to command. Easy. It should have been a by-the-numbers operation for Foundation agents. One hundred meters down. The digging had taken hours, made all the worse by the scorching desert sun, still not that much closer to setting by the time their shovels clanged against the access hatch. Time and the wind had buried it under piles of sand, but it couldn't have been more than a decade or two old. The agents heaved the metal wheel keeping the hatch closed, and it was met with rungs that led down into a dark tunnel. Not one of them volunteered to be the one to go down and investigate. Most were of the opinion that they were far enough from the Foundation to not bother. Out in the middle of nowhere, nothing but the vast, expansive plains of the Sahara around them. Who would care if they just contacted Command to say they'd found it? 
what would be the harm in calling it a day and spending the rest of their time in the desert working on their tans and trying to avoid heat stroke. But Perez just had to be the one to urge everyone to take their job seriously and to follow protocol. It was as if he had willingly pulled the short straw. Descending the rungs, he reached the bottom of the access shaft and found himself in an empty corridor carved into the bedrock beneath the Sahara. It was empty, still, the only sounds being the gentle buzz of his flashlight's bulb and the noise of his footsteps on the stone. Reaching an access door, he opened it and was met with lettering emblazoned on the wall in front of him. Prometheus Labs Defensive Products. War is changing. Change with it. Established 1965. Traversing further, Agent Perez found himself in a maze, an underground complex that seemed to be utterly deserted. He guessed that it had been at least 10 years since anyone had set foot in this facility, whatever it was. His flashlight beam waved over empty dormitories, cafeterias without anyone sitting and eating, silent recreation areas. The place was even equipped with hydroponics and water treatment facilities that had fallen out of use, as dead as the power generators that had once kept everything running. There were several large chambers that looked like testing areas, some containing industrial machinery, others home to disused medical equipment. Following the layout of a map he found displayed on one of the walls, Perez was able to navigate his way around with ease, first examining the areas labeled as exits. Apart from the hatch he'd entered through, the other access points to the surface had been sealed by cave-ins. The way he'd come in was the only route back out. Within minutes, he'd be frantically trying to run back towards that access hatch without the aid of the facility map, with a monster coming after him. Perez could not determine which cacophony was worse. The garbled noises coming through the speaker grafted to its throat, the whirring of pneumatic limbs, the revving of a saw blade, or the wild spray of gunfire. It was all bad, and all coming after him as the creature gave chase. Bullets were striking everywhere around him, narrowly missing Perez by mere inches and embedding themselves into the stony walls or kicking up dust on the floor. He ran in serpentine, weaving his way back along the path he'd come from in the hopes of avoiding the manic shooting. Every time he turned, another burst of shots littered the floor right where he was about to step, causing him to hurriedly turn heel and try to weave back in the other direction. He realized only too late why. The creature was not trying to hit him. It was using the gunfire to shepherd him down a specific route. Turning the nearest available corner, Perez gripped a bulkhead door and pulled it shut, adrenaline coursing through his arms for a brief moment as the heavy metal door slammed. Peering through the small window on the door, he looked at the hulking shape on the other side. It looked vaguely human, still possessing a clearly defined head and shoulders that led down into two strong arms one that terminated in a large saw instead of a hand. Metal seemed to have burst out from beneath the musculature on both sides, with what resembled an automatic rifle on the opposite arm. His heart was still drumming against his ribs as Perez panted and stared at the creature. It had stopped on the other side of the door, not making any attempt to break down the obstruction and keep up the pursuit. It stood ready, like a soldier awaiting commands. The pause gave Perez a moment to look at the disfigured body, unsure whether this had once been a living human or was something else, made intentionally this way. The things done to it looked painful either way, causing the agent to wonder exactly who had done this and why. He remembered the wording on the wall from earlier, war is changing, it already looked unrecognizable. There came the sharp sudden sounds of movement again, this time behind Perez. He'd been herded into a chamber containing something else. It wasn't like the soldier stood to attention beyond the door. It was spherical, hovering just above the ground. Then his eyes fell over what was at the center of the sphere. Perez screamed as a number of arms unfolded from the new creature, and it started getting closer. Following preliminary investigations, the Foundation established a research site at the location of the subterranean facility, henceforth designating it SCP-1637. On the surface, up in the desert, SCP Foundation Area 28 was designed to facilitate the containment efforts of the anomalous underground compound, with further exploration into it being prohibited. A full-strength company of soldiers, including light armor vehicles and air support, were tasked with providing additional protection to the site 
in the case of any attempted containment breaches. Although it was apparently abandoned, SCP-1637 was far from deserted. While the SCP Foundation has been unable to find much in the way of evidence to corroborate this theory, it is widely believed that the facility now known as SCP-1637 was originally created, owned, and operated by Prometheus Labs Incorporated. This corporation has long been a group that the Foundation has taken interest in, given their penchant for creating and dealing in anomalous technology. Prometheus Labs exists to produce anomalous products, and as a result, have never aligned with the Foundation's own goal of containing anomalies. They have had involvement in every anomalous technological field, including thaumaturgy, demonology, and ontokinesis, and although Prometheus Labs has always been a for-profit anomalous research corporation, they are not as antagonistic as some other groups of interest. Or rather, they weren't. Following an incident that took place in 1998, all of Prometheus Labs' projects were seized by the Foundation, and the corporation was splintered into various smaller companies. The creation of SCP-1637 seems to predate the 1998 incident, as the administrative section of the facility's first sublevel contains records that indicate the underground complex was built in 1965 and abandoned sometime around 1972. So what caused the staff of this Prometheus Labs facility to decide not to come into work anymore? Well, that has to do with what this lab was actually designed for, the production of anomalously enhanced humanoid creatures. These entities are given the sub-designations of SCP-1637-1, SCP-1637-2, and SCP-1637-3A, B, and C. While they differ in terms of their specifications, these beings were all created for the same purpose, to serve as the army of the future. SCP-1637-1 were otherwise known as the Infantry Unit Mark I, designed to fulfill the manpower needs of a military power. Intended to be sold as cannon fodder at $1.2 million per thousand units, the SCP-1637-1s are mostly humanoid foot soldiers. While closely resembling modern humans, they are all 1.8 meters tall, muscular, and identical copies of an unknown general. Prometheus Labs seems to have had anomalous means of human cloning. However, the process seems to have been imperfect, with around 13% of these foot soldiers being born with visible congenital defects. They show some signs of sentience, an ability to operate firearms and follow commands. The Infantry Unit Mark II, or SCP-1637-2, is more advanced, as well as being sapient and able to command instances of SCP-1637-1. The Mark IIs are heavily modified with cybernetic components. These onboard weapon systems were apparently designed by Prometheus Labs to not only provide an army with heavy ordnance, but additionally intimidate and psychologically disturb opposing forces. These more formidable and more expensive units came with the capability for night vision and heat signature detecting thermal vision, as well as enhancements to their speed, along with a wide range of weaponry options including arm-mounted automatic rifles, incendiary weapons and chainsaws, circular saws, or long fixed blades. However, most of the instances of SCP-1637-2 encountered by the Foundation seem to have been poorly constructed, so much so that the components are known to break loose from their augmented body. Although these become no less dangerous, still operating until the Mark II they belong to is terminated. More advanced instances of SCP-1637-1 also exist, having been modified so extensively that they resemble humans considerably less. SCP-1637-3 is given to multiple of these Prometheus Labs experiments, with the first, SCP-1637-3A, being the intelligent heavy-armored vehicle. These were designed to be a replacement for an army's main battalion tank to be deployed against mechanical and armored targets for the low price of almost $600,000 per unit. The SCP-1637-3A consists of a humanoid torso mounted on a chassis with a pair of treads, much like those you would expect to find on a tank. Its armaments, if you pardon the pun, consist of two banks of six rocket-propelled grenade launchers mounted on either side of the IHAV's torso, where its arms would be. Over the left shoulder, an instance of SCP-1637-3A also possesses a single 150mm cannon with ammunition that it seems to naturally produce, meaning it has unlimited rounds. The only remaining parts of the SCP-1637-1 instance upgraded into an IHAV are the head and torso, 
with the rest being entirely mechanized. Prometheus Lab's defensive products also describe their high-mobility reconnaissance vehicle, otherwise known as SCP-1637-3B, to the Foundation. Designed with rapid movement and intelligence in mind, these units consist of a six-wheeled omnidirectional chassis with a 20mm autocannon. Held within a translucent green soup of protein and glucose is a human brain, in control of the unit's targeting and movement, connected to the mechanical chassis by a series of cables. Prometheus Labs intended to charge just shy of $800,000 for anyone hoping to deploy these HMRVs against infantry and medium-armored vehicles on the battlefield. Most alarming of all was the Orbcom, or SCP-1637-3C. Prometheus Labs touted this as their most advanced weapon system of all, selling them for $2.5 million apiece. Each one is a spherical automaton without any visible seams in its metalwork capable of levitating via anomalous means. The main chassis has a total of 24 different limbs, each possessing a different weapon or tool, and these are used to manage the other constructs of SCP-1637. It functions as a troop transport for a Prometheus arsenal, as well as a strategic hub for coordinating attacks and implementing strategies, while also being able to repair damaged units and traverse any terrain without the need for fuel, sleep, or ammunition. The central control unit for one of these optimal remote battalion commanders is an SCP-1637-1 fetus, suspended in a liquid nitrogen solution connected to the rest of the unit via 24 electrodes hooked up to its spinal column. Needless to say, it's probably best that the army of the future is made to stand down for now, thanks to Foundation troops keeping this cybernetically augmented army underground. It's hard to tell what's worse the cruelty that went into making these creatures, or the knowledge that no human army would stand a chance against them on the battlefield. SCP-5000 Gunshots echo down the concrete hallway of Site-22. Screams are the only thing that escape each room. A team of men in all black combat gear and masks move from one section of the complex to the next. Pietro Wilson hides in his office, listening to the cries for mercy of his colleagues. He shakes uncontrollably with fear. Who are they? He thinks. Why are they killing everyone? And how did they find us? Moments earlier, Pietro Wilson had been in the canteen eating dinner with other staff members. A group of heavily armed men entered the room. They stood silently surveying the area. One of the scientists stood up and asked if they could assist them. That's when the carnage started. One of the masked men raised his rifle and shot the scientist in the head. Chaos broke out as the other mercenaries raised their weapons and began firing. Bullets flew everywhere, and Pietro was lucky not to be struck or trampled as he escaped out the back door of the cafeteria. He ran to his office, slammed the door shut, and hid under his desk. Now he sits on the floor, with his legs pulled up to his chest, shaking uncontrollably. After a couple of minutes, he manages to take a deep breath and slows his heart rate. He regains control of his body, but is still filled with fear and adrenaline. Pietro crawls on his belly to his office door. He reaches up and pulls down on the handle. There is a slight click as the latch releases. He opens the door just a crack and peers out into the hallway. The flickering emergency lights illuminate the corridor for a few seconds at a time before plunging it back into darkness. There is no one in sight, but from around the corner, flashes of light from machine gun fire flickers down the hall. The screams of the workers at Site-22 are silenced. Pietro takes a deep breath and pushes the door open further. He crawls out of his office and starts moving away from the violence. Unfortunately, to get away from the mayhem, he must go deeper into the bowels of Site-22. The exit is the other way, but he is too scared to head towards the armed men. He stands up and brushes the dirt from his blue technician jumpsuit. The lights flicker off. The hallway goes dark. He reaches out his hands and comes into contact with the cool, damp wall. He feels his way down the corridor, swimming in darkness. After a few moments, the lights flicker back on. Pietro looks over his shoulder to make sure he is still in the clear. Standing at the end of the hall is a soldier dressed in all black with a mask covering his face. The soldier stands motionless. Pietro turns to face the soldier. His eyes open wide. His heart races. He can't breathe. The figure doesn't move. Then the lights flicker out again, and Pietro pushes off the wall and runs, blind in the darkness. He sprints as fast as he can when suddenly, there is a loud crack and a bullet whizzes by his head. He can feel the wind as it barely misses his cheek. He continues to run. The lights flicker back on. He peers over his shoulder. 
Now there is an entire group of armed men pursuing him down the hallway, guns raised. He turns the corner of the hallway and proceeds down a set of stairs further into Site-22. At the bottom of the stairway, there is a short corridor with a door at the end of it. There is nowhere else to go. He pulls a keycard out of his pocket and fumbles it. The card falls to the ground. Pietro bends down to pick it up, and as he leans over, a bullet whizzes past where his head had just been. The projectile embeds itself into the metal door. He scoops his keycard up off the ground and shoves it against the scanner. The door unlocks, and he dashes into the room. He quickly turns and shuts the door. It locks automatically. The last thing he sees is the assassins running towards the door. The lights flicker on in the room where Pietro stands. The room has only one door, no windows and no vents. It is completely isolated. In the middle of the room is SCP-5000. He knew there was an SCP in this room that was designated SCP-5000, but he never knew what it actually was. Here he is now, staring at it. A strange-looking mechanical harness hanging in the middle of the room. Suddenly, loud banging at the door fills the room. The armed men are trying to break in. It is only a matter of time before they pry the door open. With nowhere to go, Pietro Wilson knows that he is dead. He looks at SCP-5000 and shakes his head. What do I have to lose? He says out loud. Only your life. A voice in his head responds. He walks over to SCP-5000 and pulls it down from where it is hanging. It is heavy. On the mechanical suit are symbols he does not recognize. Mm. The only thing he knows about the suit are rumors he's heard from others who work at Site-22. Supposedly, it first appeared in a flash of light in the containment chamber of a Keter-level SCP at Site-62C. The designation of this Keter was SCP-579. The only other thing that Pietro knows is that everyone at Site-62C was slaughtered when containment was breached. SCP-5000 was found deactivated next to a pile of bodies. He slips on the harness, and as if it has a life of its own, SCP-5000 begins to adjust itself to the exact dimensions of his body. The suit grows and snakes across his skin, wrapping every appendage in armor. Then it begins to tighten. Pietro Wilson starts to scream as SCP-5000 envelops him. The suit rises up the back of his neck and encases his entire head, silencing his screams. The door to the room blasts open from a controlled explosion. As the dust and smoke settles, the masked men enter the room. Their flashlights move from side to side as they search for the elusive technician who had just entered. There is no one in the room. All that is there is an empty rack in the middle of the chamber. The men fan out, but there is no other exit. The room is just a solid square of concrete. They're baffled. Where did he go? One of them shouts. Pietro Wilson had blacked out from the pain of the suit attaching to his body. He comes to, still standing in the middle of the room. All around him are men in black combat gear. They are searching for him. He holds his breath and closes his eyes, but the gunshots never come. He opens one of his eyes and looks around. Why haven't they killed me yet? He thinks. He slowly turns his head as men walk by him with their guns raised. He hears someone say, Where did he go? I'm right here, he thinks. Am I dead? Pietro looks down to see that his entire body is contained within SCP-5000. He lifts his hand and waves it in front of his face. He is still clearly alive, but it seems as if the killers can't see him. He walks up to one of the mercenaries and waves his hand in front of the man's face. There is no reaction. The suit made me invisible, he thinks. Pietro looks at one of the men to see if he can find out who they are and why they have killed everyone at the base. On the sleeve of the man's jacket are the words Zeta-19. He's never heard of Zeta-19 before, but they must be part of an organization that is trying to undermine the SCP Foundation. The men continue to search the empty room, clearly confused as to where the technician went. Pietro weaves his way through the group of men and back out the door he had entered from. On his way through the wreckage that used to be a door, Pietro Wilson trips on some debris. He reaches out to steady himself, but he has fallen. He closes his eyes knowing that as soon as he hits the ground, all of the men hunting him will be alerted by the sound of his fall, but the impact never comes. When Pietro opens his eyes, it is as if he is hovering just above the ground. He looks down at his feet. The toes of the suit are firmly planted on the floor, like powerful magnets on iron. SCP-5000 has prevented his fall and is holding him in place using the feet of the suit only. He reaches out his hand and gently places it on the ground. 
He pushes himself up to a standing position. He turns to look back into the room. The men are still in there searching for him. Pietro makes his way back through Site-22. He walks by his office and proceeds towards the exit of the facility. As he passes the labs and other rooms at Site-22, all he finds is carnage. Everyone has been killed. An extra bullet has been placed in each person's head to make sure. It seems that the only mission these men were on was to kill everyone and make sure they stayed dead. He continues towards the exit of Site-22 that is guarded by two men. As he approaches the two heavily armed men, Pietro makes sure to be as quiet as possible. This is not a difficult task, as the SCP-5000 has given him stealth capabilities. He notices that even his footsteps aren't giving off any sound. It is almost as if the suit is allowing him to glide across the floor. He is almost to the exit, then he will be home free. He takes a deep breath, turns sideways, and squeezes past the two men guarding the doorway. Just as he is about to leave this nightmare behind, one of the guards turns unexpectedly. The man's shoulder runs directly into Pietro Wilson, throwing him off balance. He is knocked into the second guard. Both of the men scream, What is that? One of them shouts. They begin to raise their guns on the invisible object that just bumped into them. It's then that SCP-5000 takes over Pietro's body. The suit raises his arm and grabs one of the men by the throat. With a squeeze, the man's larynx is instantly crushed. Then the suit twists slightly and snaps the man's neck. It turns to face the second man. Even the black mask the man is wearing can't hide the look of terror on his face. But Pietro has no control over what SCP-5000 is doing. He has never killed before. The suit launches Pietro's body into the second man, pinning him against the wall. It then grabs the top of the mercenary's head and slams it against the concrete, again and again and again, until the man's screams are silenced. The suit lets go of the man and his lifeless body slides to the ground as Pietro backs out. When he regains consciousness, he's outside of Site-22, standing on top of a hill, looking down at the facility below. He looks at his hands, then at the rest of his body. He is still contained within SCP-5000. There is a flash of light, and a heads-up display comes on. He doesn't recognize any of the symbols, but as his eyes move from one area of the screen to the next, the symbols become highlighted. Before his eyes, certain symbols began to translate into words he can read. One of the symbols now says, Journal Entry. Unsure of what else to do, Pietro begins recounting what happened to him at Site-22. He makes his way through the desert towards the nearest SCP Foundation safe house. He knows once there, he will be able to reach out to his superiors for help and further orders. Maybe he can even find a way to get SCP-5000 to release him. As he trudges along, Pietro Wilson notices that his brain is telling him he is thirsty. But the vitals on the suit's heads-up display say that he is in good health. In fact, he is better than good. His vitals are all perfect. The suit seems to be giving him all the nutrients his body needs. It has even fixed his busted knee that was injured back in college playing football. The joint itself has somehow been healed. Pietro finally reaches the safe house and opens the door. It is quiet and dusty. It looks as if no one has been there in years. He walks over to the communication station and tries to contact the foundation, but all he gets is static. He gives up and walks over to the TV. He pushes the on button. The screen hisses to life. What he sees causes his jaw to drop. The world is at war. A war between humans and monsters. Whatever happened at Site-22 also happened at other Foundation sites. The SCPs have been left. From gigantic, indestructible, self-regenerating reptiles to enormous tentacled telepathic organisms, it should come as no surprise that the SCP Foundation has gone head-to-head -head against a lot of large-scale aggressors, or LSAs, in its time. Naturally, a creature of heightened size and aggression can often prove challenging to contain, and the threat these LSAs pose is often far too big to ignore. But anyone familiar with the Foundation will tell you they're not above using any methods necessary to keep these creatures contained. Huge vats of molecular acid, impenetrable cells, disposable D-class personnel, even other SCPs. But what other SCPs could possibly be big enough and tough enough to handle some of the Foundation's biggest and baddest? Meet SCP-5514, otherwise known as the Dragon Slayer. While it might sound like something out of an anime, SCP-5514 is a massive robotic mech designed to take on the worst other SCPs can throw at it. For any who are unfamiliar with the term, a mech or mecha 
usually refers to an upright standing machine or automaton controlled by a human pilot. What distinguishes a mech from a vehicle is their often humanoid shape, standing bipedally and they are often hundreds of meters tall. All of this is true of SCP-5514, and in fact, given that it requires a trained member of Foundation staff to operate it, the mech itself requires very little in the way of containment. Only members of Mobile Task Force Ada-5 are trained and authorized to pilot SCP-5514. This is one of the SCP Foundation's specialized units, specifically designed to deal with the threat of large-scale aggressors, much like SCP-5514 itself. But SCP-5514 wasn't discovered or captured by the Foundation for use for the containment of LSAs nor was it stolen from a foreign military or found buried under the ground. Then, where did it come from, and who built it? Working with the Global Occult Coalition and the Government of High Brazil, an anomalous island off the west coast of Ireland, the Foundation themselves constructed SCP-5514 using various anomalous methods and techniques. In 1988, a Foundation site was destroyed by an unidentified LSA, highlighting the inadequacy of the current defenses against these larger, more damage-resistant creatures. The Foundation, the Coalition, and High Brazil formed a joint operation, the Key Project, and examined SCP-2406, an automaton 93 meters tall thought to be created by ancient Mechanites. Together, the Key Project opted to create their own similar machine, viewing it as the best way to defend against further incursions with large-scale aggressors. The construction of SCP-5514 began in 1990. The intention of all parties involved in the Key Project, including the Foundation, was that the Dragon Slayer would be deployed in the event of an attack by an LSA. It would arrive at cities under attack and immediately engage large-scale aggressors in combat. Building of the mech continued at a consistent pace for eight years. However, it was the occurrence of SCP-5391 and subsequent intervention by the O5 Council that accelerated the creation of the Dragon Slayer by any means necessary. On June 30th, 1998, a number of seismic disturbances were detected, including tsunamis, tremors, and volcanic activity both underwater and above ground. What followed was the appearance of multiple large-scale aggressors, which would soon become designated as SCP-5391, the exact kind of scenario that the Dragon Slayer was being built for had already arrived, and the mech was still far from completion. While the Foundation and its allies deployed forces to drive the enormous creatures back to the ocean, Something needed to be done to bring SCP-5514 into the fight, and fast. The O5 Council authorized the use of anomalous materials in the continued construction of the Dragon Slayer, both to speed up the process and have it ready for deployment, but also to give the mech every advantage against the abundance of large-scale aggressors from SCP-5391. As a result, SCP-5514 was designed to incorporate features and technology far beyond that of any conventional military-grade weapons. The first hurdle, how do you power a machine the size of SCP-5514? Naturally, with the most gigantic nuclear furnace there is, the sun. More specifically, a perpetually stable, miniaturized sun known as SCP-037. Even though it only has a diameter of two inches, this little sucker is better than premium fuel. The surface temperature of SCP-037 is around 5,000 Kelvin, generating plenty of energy to power the SCP-5514 mech. Stored in the Dragon Slayer's chest, this mini-sun is kept stable by subdimensional portals that vent excess energy off this plane of reality stopping the mech, its pilot, and anything around it from melting. In fact, SCP-037 produces so much juice that only 1% of its energy output is enough to fully power SCP-5514. Now that's the power source sorted, but how do you solve the weight problem? Given the sheer size of SCP-5514, it would be easy for it to be cumbersome and potentially cause catastrophic collateral damage to its surrounding area. Well, the mech's weight is a problem for somewhere else. A whole other dimension, in fact. 
Much like the excess heat from its power source, various heavy portions of the SCP-5514 mech have their weight shunted off to a tiny pocket dimension. It was ensured during the creation of the mech that this alteration was perfectly calculated, so that SCP-5514 wouldn't lose any mass or density, so it operates as if it were only a fraction of its actual weight. Of course, being weightless makes flight a whole lot easier. Oh, did we forget to mention that? SCP-5514 can fly as well. This feature actually became a part of the mech completely by accident during the construction of SCP-5514, when an attempt to regulate the mech's internal circulation of air led to it having its own gravity field. This allowed SCP-5514 to fly without the aid of any turbines or other means. While this was an unintentional mistake, no attempt has ever been made to correct for it for fear that it could lead to SCP-5514 being grounded permanently. Naturally, going up against creatures so large that they require their own subcategory means that SCP-5514 needs an equally formidable arsenal. So let's move on to talk weaponry. Mounted on the mech's shoulder is a Beowulf Sigurd railgun, an anomalous weapon that also doesn't obey the laws of physics at all. The Beowulf Sigurd uses alternate gravity to affect the weight of its targets, causing projectiles to impact with higher velocity. Even the thickest-skinned LSAs wouldn't want to be staring down the barrel end of one of those. Big guns aside, the SCP-5514 mech also wields a cold iron sword. Over 65 feet long, this weapon was contributed to the Dragon Slayer by the High Brazil Royal Court, members of the collaborative key project that created the mech. Sure, a large-scale aggressor with thicker hide might take a few extra swings to draw blood, but it will feel those swings for a long time after, since any wounds inflicted by the cold iron sword will not regenerate. Serving as less of an offensive weapon, the SCP-5514 mech also features a unique armament known as the Thousand Word Arrows. As pretentious as it might sound, Within the mech are seven poets. Their role is to write and recite poems that detail the slaying of monsters, and these recitals are then broadcast from the Dragon Slayer. On the surface, this seems to have no practical applications during a fight with LSAs. However, the goal of the Thousand Word Arrows is a form of psychological warfare. The recital of poems telling of the mech's victory and the defeat of large-scale aggressors is intended to have the effect of demoralizing SCP-5514's adversaries while encouraging the pilot during combat. Additionally, worn atop the head of the SCP-5514 mech almost like a hat is a discus with plasma-coated edges. If the Dragon Slayer needs to deal damage at range, then it can hurl this disc and recall it immediately thanks to built-in electromagnets. In emergency scenarios, if the Cold Iron Sword is damaged or dropped and irretrievable, SCP-5514 is also equipped with an additional melee weapon. Stored in the right arm of the mech is a holdout plasma wrist blade. This superheated blade is strong enough to cut through almost anything. However, this blade is strictly to be used as a backup weapon. Finally, should all else fail, one of SCP-5514's greatest strengths can also be used as a deadly weapon. The Emergency Sun Vent allows a fraction of the excess power from SCP-037 to be released, at the risk of causing massive damage, not only to LSAs, but to any civilians or structures nearby. It is because of the destructive risk involved that this weapon is only authorized to be used as a final resort, and luckily SCP-5514 is currently undefeated. Since the arrival of multiple large-scale aggressors as a result of SCP-5391, the SCP-5514 mech has managed to successfully eliminate 12 of these LSA creatures, either by terminating or otherwise incapacitating them. Given that its completion was fast-tracked through the use of anomalous elements, SCP-5514's first combat deployments also served as field tests of the mech's operation and the various weapons and features. Arriving in Tokyo overseen by the Foundation's own Captain Rosales and Dr. Kaori, SCP-5514's first target was a creature designated LSA Wake-02, as well as several other unidentified large creatures. As the LSA was about to attack Tokyo Harbor, SCP-5514 was dispatched, its arrival heralded by the Thousand Word Arrows. Champion, champion, Exalt in the glory of the Dragon Slayer, the poets recited. Surprisingly, the poetry worked, hearing it had a noticeable effect on LSA Wig-02, causing the creature to back away shrieking. 
with a single throw of the rounded recoiling plasma. SCP-5514 immediately beheaded Wake-02, damaging a number of the other nearby LSAs as it retrieved the disc via its electromagnets. Once again, the thousand-word arrows cheered on the mech and the pilot reciting, The vicious beast slain, gone to those which were once bane. After dispatching several of the minor LSAs with its cold iron sword, SCP-5514 became aware that Wake-02 was not fully down for the count. A second head had protruded from the mouth of the creatures first, issuing some sort of retreat call to the remaining LSAs in Tokyo Harbor. This second head then shot towards SCP-5514, narrowly missing its leg but allowing other LSAs to close the distance and prepare an attack. Luckily, the SCP-5514 mech sword cleaved the beast in two. The mech began firing on the remains of Wake-02 with its Beowulf Sigurd railgun launching itself into the air and flying towards the target while bringing its cold iron sword down through the air. With a single motion, SCP-5514 brought the blade all the way down the LSA's body, from the creature's head to its caudal fin, gutting the large-scale aggressor and splitting its entire body in two. After one final squirm, both halves were finally still. SCP-5514 had passed its first field test. The mech functioned exactly as designed, all its various weapons and features working in tandem to defeat a creature far too large and powerful for any conventional force to handle. And thus the deed was done. Exult, exult in the glory of the Dragon Slayer. The Thousand Word Arrows called out as the other LSAs retreated. One cannot help but feel cautiously optimistic about our chances of survival, knowing that the Foundation has SCP-5514 as the first line of defense against huge, monstrous beings that threaten humanity. As the situation with SCP-5391 continues, the SCP-5514 mech remains on the front line, standing between innocent human beings and the looming shapes of multiple large-scale aggressors. With creatures that pose such a large-scale threat, it certainly is lucky that disparate groups were able to put aside their differences and work together to build a large-scale mech. And because they did, now we have the Dragon Slayer on our side. It was 1965, and the Chicago PD was investigating a meatpacking plant reported to be the home of a devil-worshipping cult, complete with allegations of human sacrifice. There, the cops were met with heavy resistance. A firefight broke out between the police and the occult worshippers who flooded out of the plant's basement. The cops were pinned down and in trouble, but they had a secret weapon. Heavily armed and decked out in sophisticated ballistic armor and covered in strange insignia. Mobile Task Force Epsilon-9, also known as the Fire Eaters, here to assist the cops on behalf of the SCP Foundation. As always with the Foundation, they had no interest in some mere human cultists. Those were a dime a dozen in the world of anomalous monsters. What the Foundation had taken an interest in was who or what these cultists were worshipping. It all begun a few weeks back, near Danforth Meatpacking, an abandoned meatpacking plant just outside of Chicago. No one had given the place a thought in decades, that is, until people started going missing. Rumors spread of people being snatched in the surrounding woods by figures dressed in robes. Mysterious voices and noises were said to be coming out from the cavernous belly of the plant. Some even reported seeing smoke rising out of the building. Thick, black, noxious smoke. Something was terribly wrong here. Something was anomalous. The Chicago Police Department Strike Force, in association with the Fire Eaters from the Foundation, mobilized at Danforth Meatpacking. While the police were initially reluctant to work with these mysterious figures, they turned out to be indispensable for the raid. There were 47 cultists holding out in the basement of the plant, many of them heavily armed and all of them hopped up on zealous devotion to their unknown master. All except one of the cultists fought to the death during a tense firefight with Chicago PD and the Fire Eaters. The single survivor was still heavily injured and was taken to a secure Foundation facility for emergency treatment and debriefing. Typically, the Foundation would need to perform extensive tests on the Danforth meatpacking plant to discover the source of the anomaly's activity. However, this time, it was a Chicago detective who asked the question that busted the case wide open. Ah, oh, the hell's with the giant pig? And while it would turn out to be a whole lot more than that, there was indeed a giant iron furnace shaped like a pig in the center of the facility. Measuring 15 meters by 25 meters by 20 meters at its widest points, 
The thing was a behemoth. It had an internal furnace hmm. despite no apparent fuel source, and a five centimeter slot of unknown purpose on the side of the machine's immense rusted hide. Naturally, all the police officers involved in the raid had their memories wiped and restructured, and they were lucky, because they'd remain forever ignorant of the true horrors about to unfold in the confines of that godforsaken factory. As is standard procedure, the plant was isolated, and a Foundation research team, led by lead researcher Westron, under the authority of Regional Director Caleb, was installed on the new provisional site to conduct tests. Other than everyone feeling somewhat uneasy around it, this new anomaly, dubbed SCP-4511, didn't seem to exhibit any strange activities save for its perpetually burning fire. But during the initial research period, a small white card suddenly popped out of the slot in SCP-4511's side. A researcher carefully approached and looked at the card. There was writing. It said, Current demand. A flock of my own. Satisfied. Though nobody on the team had any idea what this meant. After going through a shootout with a considerable death toll to get to it, having a giant metal pig-shaped furnace spit out a cryptic card was strange. But at the secret medical facility where the surviving cultist was being held, things were about to get a whole lot stranger. As he lay in a bed suffering from his injuries, he pulled one of the medical staff close and uttered cryptic, dying words. Give whatever it demands, or your suffering will be beyond measure. He expired seconds later less than 72 hours after the raid. Back at the meatpacking plant, at the exact same time, another white card was produced by the machine, reading, Current demand, the metal teeth that endlessly churn, period, one week. Perhaps this entity was a little more intelligent than they thought. A number of researchers on the team invigorated by this new development were eager to press forward with experiments. Lead researcher Westron, however, did not share their enthusiasm. Something about this entire situation felt like a grim omen to him. This entity had a plan far beyond their understanding, and on some deep animal level, he knew that helping this thing see its plans through would lead to disastrous results. On this first gut impulse, he denied the request for further experiments, but Regional Director Caleb had other ideas. Caleb overruled Westron's command, and the experiments began shortly after. The entity, jokingly nicknamed the Swine God by researchers, had made its demand. The metal teeth that endlessly churn. But what could that mean? It wasn't long before the entity began to produce more cards, each with their own strange and esoteric demands. However, on some instinctual level, the researchers at the site understood the demands perfectly. The next card's demand was, the metal of this suffocating prison, Upon receiving this demand, researchers collected scrap metal from around the new site and tossed them into the furnace beyond the swine god's jaws one by one. Inside, they heard the sound of metal crunching. Hours later, all the other metal in the site began to rapidly oxidize and rust, though SCP-4511 itself remained unaffected. The card that came after delivered another simple request. Oil to slicken my frozen joints. The researchers understood and procured three large barrels of oil and tossed them into the furnace. The entity let out a deep gurgle, before shaking violently and expelling excess oil, rusted metal, and two domesticated pig femurs. It turns out that the swine god had an appetite for pigs, as the next card that rumbled out of the machine bore the request, Two of my children, made in my image, made in flesh. In response, the researchers provided the entity with two adult pigs. Just like the previous requests, they too were tossed into the fiery depths of the giant pig's mouth, from which came the horrible sounds of pigs squealing, and then a low, guttural gurgling. Next, the request was, The hooks used to hang my children's corpses. To satisfy this request, the researchers provided 17 meat hooks. In response, 4511 spat out a metal sphere at an extremely high velocity, killing observing Foundation Agent McHenry. For reasons that weren't apparent at the time, rather than giving Agent McHenry a proper burial, his body was also fed into the hungry machine. Lead researcher Westron's concerns were mounting, but that didn't amount to much now. 4511 had developed a taste for flesh, and the researchers were all too eager to obey its command. 
On the swine god's order, it was fed a German shepherd. An hour later, the entity spat out some teeth, six of which came from a dog and one from a human. More than once, it released a card with a blunt request. A worker for the line. The researchers knew exactly what this meant. It required a human sacrifice. SCP-4511 was given two D-Class personnel. One was flung oh. back out seconds later, crunched and burned to death, with several internal organs missing. The other had a more mysterious and altogether upsetting fate. The second D-Class was heard screaming in the belly of the furnace for roughly two hours. 34 minutes later, a strange liquid was excreted by the machine. When the liquid was tested, they found trace amounts of chemicals like pig urine and motor oil, but most disturbing of all, human genetic material that was identical to that of lead researcher Westron. It seemed that the swine god had finally taken an interest in him. After some final requests for large quantities of coal and even human children to fuel its fires, it made a request that sent the whole thing crashing down. The false foreman delivered to my ma to prove your faith. Lead researcher Westron knew what this meant. They all did. The swine god was demanding him in sacrifice. Lead researcher Westron tried to shut down the entire project, but the swine god was faster than him. One of his own researchers shot Westron in the leg, as the others gathered round and forcibly restrained him. He tried to reason with his subordinates, but it didn't do him any good. The swine god had crawled into all their minds and corrupted them. They were his servants now, and Westron was doomed. Despite his protests, the servants forced him into the mouth of SCP-4511, and after a little over four minutes of screaming, Westron was devoured just like all the other sacrifices. Upon receiving news of the horrors unfolding in the Danforth meatpacking plant, Regional Director Caleb declared the security of the site compromised and sent in Mobile Task Force Epsilon-11, aka the Nine-Tailed Fox. The four elite MTF soldiers were given the simple instruction to figure out exactly what had happened and to eliminate any potentially compromised Foundation staff members who'd fallen under the Swine God's power. When the team arrived, they realized just how far gone the whole place was. Almost everyone was dead, having been sacrificed to the machine, and the ones that were left were completely insane. They attacked the task force, shouting in their madness about how no matter what the Foundation does to them, it would be nothing compared to what it would do. It had them all under its rusty iron foot. The team was forced to fend off repeated attacks from the pig's devotees, and even found the powers of the swine gods starting to affect their own minds. The beast was more powerful and dangerous than anyone had imagined. The trained Foundation researchers and guards had been transformed into the same cultists they'd fought to gain control of the building by the mind-bending power of the Swine God. The MTF were forced to retreat and return with reinforcements to truly clean the place out. Once a slaughterhouse, always a slaughterhouse. At this point, Regional Director Caleb took personal responsibility over the casualties since he'd been the one who signed off on the experiments in the first place. He gave up his regional director rank and deemed himself the new lead researcher on the 4511 case. Now that he fully understood the scope and danger of the entity they were dealing with, he wanted to lead the charge in discovering more about the anomaly and hopefully someday negating its deadly effects. This may sound like a happy ending, in spite of all the violence, bloodshed, and human sacrifice that brought us here. But beware of the premature celebration. Despite investigation, the Swine God retained no evidence of the objects, animals, and people it consumed and burned. Perhaps it burnt them down to their very atoms, if those even still existed. What we do know is that not long after, after lead researcher Caleb and his subordinates installed themselves into the facility, SCP-4511 produced one more little white card. It read, Current demand, a flock of my own, satisfied. And if we've learned anything today, it's that the swine god gets whatever it demands, a brutal truth that lead researcher Caleb is likely to understand much sooner than he thought. Down in the depths of Facility 23, a group of scientists stand before a massive rumbling piece of machinery. They all hold their breath as the gigantic mechanism suddenly stops. It's eerily quiet for a moment before a door slides open. The scientists crane their necks to see inside. 
to see what the result of their great experiment was. These were some of the greatest minds in the SCP Foundation, but nothing could prepare them for what they had created. September 9, 2008 was an unseasonably frosty day when Dr. Charles Gears, one of the SCP Foundation's most iconic scientists, parked his Honda Civic outside of what seemed like an innocuous government cold storage warehouse. He sipped his coffee and surveyed the building, which he, along with about a hundred others in total, knew to be Site-19, Facility-23. Why was Dr. Gears, former director of all Euclid-level containment at Site-19, here today? Because official testing was about to begin on SCP-914. The Foundation had acquired the machine now known as SCP-914 some time ago. But only after its recent reclassification to 914 had it been relocated to Facility 23. It must have been important because the entirety of the facility was being repurposed for SCP-914 research. They were dealing with an immensely complicated piece of anomalous technology here, and the same question was on everybody's lips. What exactly does this thing do? Dr. Arthur Hackett, the facility director, had requested the cold, clinical assistance of Dr. Gears in providing the answer. Once he'd finished his morning coffee, Dr. Gears headed inside. The facility's security chief, Agent Alan Sedna, had been beefing up security at the building, and at least two mobile task force units were already on call in case anything happened. The first day of official testing is always a crapshoot. You might get a nice drink out of it, like with SCP-294, or you may get an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. You never really know. All Dr. Gears knew as he walked up the granite steps to the main entrance, was that he was already feeling exhausted. When you've dealt with anomalous objects and entities for decades on end, the sense of wonder and mystery begins to wear off, only to be replaced with a kind of tedium any office worker knows all too well. Everyone knew that Dr. Gears was devoted to the job, perhaps more than anyone else, but he approached the job with an emotionless effect. You wouldn't know from looking at him if he was thinking about the deadly anomalous creature in the next room, or what he was going to have for lunch that day. The doctor passed through security and was briefed in the break room by Dr. Lucius Veritas, director of research at Site-19. He explained that the machine seemed to work in the absence of any power source. Its mechanical structure is similar to machinery from the Industrial Revolution, but it's exceedingly complex for something constructed in that time. Foundation analyses into the structure of the 914 machine have shown it to have as many as 8 million moving parts, and that might even be an incomplete estimate. Dr. Gears wore his trademark blank face as he listened, solemnly nodded, and asked to be shown the anomaly. He was led into containment chamber 109B by a pair of guards. According to all current Foundation tests, the machine doesn't appear to pose any active risk of containment breach or danger to the guards, earning it the rare safe designation. As a result, aside from guards stationed on site, containment procedures for 914 were minimal. Whether this designation would need to be changed after testing was something Dr. Gears would soon find out. SCP-914 was a truly impressive sight to behold, a giant clockwork mechanism taking up around 18 square feet with an unfathomably complex combination of screw drives, belts, pulleys, springs, and gears. A less stoic researcher might see the humor in recruiting a Dr. Gears to test such a device, but comedy definitely wasn't one of Dr. Gears' specialties. He stared at the machine with a detached fascination, analyzing its vital components at a glance. Gears noted a large mainspring beneath a rudimentary selection panel. The panel is copper, with a large selection knob fixed to an arrow above a series of different options. Rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, and very fine. There was also a large key below the selection panel, for the purposes of winding up the mainspring and initiating whatever procedure this machine was designed to enact. Next, Dr. Gears noticed two large booths connected to the machine by a pair of equally large copper tubes. The booth on the left labeled intake, and the right labeled output. Incredibly, Dr. Gears was able to immediately deduce the purpose of this machine. It was designed to enact some kind of transformative process on whatever was placed into the intake booth. But what kind of transformative process? That's exactly what Dr. Gears was here to find out. The experiment was simple. They would gather a series of samples, both inanimate objects and living tissue, and use them to explore the different permutations of the 914 machine's transformative abilities. This initial series of experiments were approved by O5 Command and the Site Director, 
and with the 47 researchers present in Facility 23 at his disposal, Dr. Gears commenced his research into SCP-914. To minimize risk, Dr. Gears decided the first test would be a simple kilogram of steel. On his orders, the steel was placed into the intake booth. With the doctor's approval, a junior researcher set the control panel setting to rough and began twisting the main spring key, at which point the booth's doors closed and a small bell inside chimed. The machine began to rumble, its eight million working pieces churning into life. It continued like this for around 10 minutes before falling silent, at which point the output booth opened. What had once been a single lump of steel weighing one kilogram was now an uneven pile of smaller lumps with evidence of laser cutting. Dr. Gears may note of the fact that having lasers within such a machine is both anachronistic and anomalous, and that the rough setting appears to messily cleave the object placed within the intake booth into pieces. Dr. Gears also noted that it would be unwise to test any kind of explosive material on the rough setting, unless, of course, they wanted to destroy the building. The research continued. Dr. Gears used another one kilogram lump of steel to test the one-to-one -one feature. This time, the result was far more peculiar. The output booth contained the exact same weight in steel screws. This result was sparking even greater connections in Dr. Oh. Gears' impressive analytical mind. Firstly, the one-to-one -one feature caused the 914 machine to transform the output into something different from, but similar to, the intake. And while this would require further testing, it appeared that the 914 machine, despite being anomalous, does still follow the laws of physics. Samples passed through the machine conserve their mass and would not be transmuted on an atomic level from one element to another. Next, Dr. Gears pushed another lump of steel through the machine on the fine setting. The result this time was a kilogram of steel carpet tacks. From this, Dr. Gears was able to ascertain that the fine feature improves the samples placed within the intake booth somewhat. However, things got even stranger when Gears performed the same experiment on the very fine setting. The output booth provided several unknown gases and a lump of unknown metal with anomalous qualities. Namely, it was resistant to heat up to 50,000 degrees, impossible to bend or break with any force, and was a perfect conductor of electricity. Dr. Gears suddenly realized his task here may be more interesting than he'd initially imagined. Was that a bit of a smile on his face that one researcher spotted? Surely not. This was the famous unflappable Dr. Gears, after all. The doctor decided to take it up a notch and began to test more complex items in the 914 machine. He removed his own wristwatch and placed it into the input booth before setting the machine to course and letting her rip. Literally, in this case. When the output booth was opened, the watch had been painstakingly disassembled into its component parts, with no damage to said parts. Dr. Gears noted the coarse feature as a more mild version of the rough, in the sense that it was able to take an object apart without any kind of fundamental damage. He also made note of the fact he'd need to get himself a new watch. Dr. Gears then asked one of the researchers to surrender their cell phone for testing. While none were excited at the prospect of their phone getting eviscerated by a clockwork behemoth, one of the researchers eventually surrendered their BlackBerry curve to the doctor. He placed it into the intake booth on the one-to-one -one setting, and 10 minutes later, the output booth released a brand new Apple iPhone. Sadly for the researcher who donated his BlackBerry, he wasn't allowed to keep the new device. Naturally, Dr. Gears was interested in trying out the anomalous, very fine setting on a more complex object. Seeing as no other researchers were eager to hand over their personal effects, he took a Colt Python revolver from a member of security and ran that through the machine on very fine. The result was an extremely powerful energy weapon containing gamma radiation, which fired a beam capable of disintegrating anything in its path. While the weapon's power was immense, it was also too dangerous and unstable to be added to the Foundation's armory for general use. Having collected a wealth of data from more complex objects, Dr. Gears was eager to move to the next stage, live test subjects. While his fellow researchers had some reservations, the experiments pushed on, beginning with mice. A single white mouse was put into the intake booth on the one-to-one -one setting and the machine was activated. The result five minutes later was an almost identical creature, save for the fact that it now had brown fur. Encouraged by the fact that the mouse survived the refinery process, Dr. Gears next applied for the use of two chimps in his SCP-914 experiments. The first chimp was run through the machine on the fine setting, 
The result was a chimp of human-level intelligence, who has since begun working for the Foundation under the alias Dr. Bobo. And the data from this test has been expunged from the official reports to protect Dr. Bobo's privacy. The second primate test, this time on Ruff, was not quite as positive. The chimp was dismembered, with the mutilated corpse showing evidence of cutting from high heat and crushing. Of course, everyone knew where these tests were eventually going. Dr. Gears requested two members of D-Class personnel for testing. The first was a 42-year-old Caucasian male weighing 108 kilograms and standing 185 centimeters tall. Dr. Gears ran him through SCP-914 on the one-to-one -one setting, resulting in a slightly taller Hispanic man with a slightly lower body weight. He immediately became severely confused and agitated and attempted to attack the guards present, leading to his unfortunate termination by Foundation staff. It was on the final live test that tragedy truly struck. A 28-year-old Caucasian male was run through the machine on the highly anomalous, very fine setting. The result was an utterly nightmarish creature. So horrifying that the majority of the details on its physical appearance have been expunged from the report. The creature made a sudden escape, breaching the relatively minor containment procedures intended for the inert SCP-914. This highly dangerous creature killed eight guards, as well as two senior researchers upon emerging from the output booth. A special response team was dispatched to take the creature down, but that proved harder than expected. SCP-914 had massively improved upon the human original, especially when it came to its killing ability. Eventually, it was captured, but the special response team suffered injuries and memory loss as a result of the creature's anomalous powers. The creature was also severely wounded, and its blood caused corrosive damage to the plumbing in Facility 23. The creature expired from its injuries several hours later, turning into a cloud of blue ash that blinded a nearby research team. Dr. Gears would later comment that the experiments were ultimately still a success, in spite of some minor hiccups. Testing on the device continues to this day in an effort to understand the full potential of the machine. Though, for obvious reasons, biological testing on the machine has since been forbidden without direct authorization from O5 Command. After all, if an already dangerous SCP was ever subjected to the very fine transformation setting, we could be dealing with something beyond our greatest nightmares. The day-to-day -day routine of Dr. Gears consisted of a few constants. Piping hot cups of black, unsweetened coffee, plain dry wheat toast, the soothing sounds of his favorite white noise machine, and the endless carousel of experiments with SCP-914. Not that he was complaining, he was perfectly content to spend his time supervising one of the few anomalies he crossed paths with on a regular basis that was unlikely to kill or maim him in any way. Not that the Clockworks hadn't produced its fair share of unpredictable results over the years of extensive testing, it had definitely offered up more than a few surprises. And anyone who knew Dr. Gears knew that he was not especially fond of surprises. Dr. Bright had attempted to throw a surprise birthday party for the man once, but when he turned on the lights and fired the confetti cannon, all Dr. Gears did in response was give a deep sigh and say, Really, Jack? You're making a spectacle of yourself. Still, he had resigned himself long ago to the fact that supervising the experiments with SCP-914 meant witnessing some truly unpredictable outcomes. How could he forget the time researcher Blas tested an incandescent light bulb on the setting very fine, and the machine spat out an anthropomorphic humanoid light bulb that spoke in German-accented English and claimed to be Thomas Edison himself? This was, of course, impossible as historical records surely would have indicated if Thomas Edison was a walking, talking light bulb rather than a human man. The imposter was eventually incinerated after its presence became too irritating to ignore. And then there was the time researcher Thompson filled out a Dungeons & Dragons character sheet and placed it into the machine on the setting very fine. The output produced was a sheet of paper promoting the previously non-existent tabletop role-playing game Fear in the Foundation. Whenever a person read the paper, they would suddenly find themselves in an out-of-body experience where they were inside the game's world, which contained several characters related to the SCP Foundation, as well as items and locations based on real-world counterparts. A subject in this state would only snap back to reality after winning or dying in the game. Researcher Jacobson rolled a 1 on stealth and saw SCP-096's face in the game and was later found dead in the anomalous item storage wing. There was no shortage of Foundation staff trying to use the machine for personal gain, too. 
Dr. Naismith placed his credit card inside on the setting very fine, using it to produce a card covered in unidentified corporate insignias and reading, Rank Aleph Infinite Money Privileges. When Dr. Coltrane issued a written warning, Dr. Naismith took that warning and then placed it into the machine on the same setting, producing a piece of official documentation from the O5 Council in support of his infinite money privileges. Junior researcher Summers attempted to use SCP-914 in a misguided attempt at self-improvement, placing not an object, but herself in the intake booth before running the machine on the setting very fine. It cleared her skin, lengthened her hair, and improved her figure. This was, of course, in violation of several employee guidelines, and she was promptly dismissed after emerging from SCP-914. Dr. Veritas left a note in the experiment log following this incident, reading, By the time we realized what she was actually doing, it was too late to stop her. Needless to say, she's since been terminated, and I hope I don't need to tell you all not to do that again. And with that, the guideline was clear. No one was permitted to use SCP-914 for personal gain, or to change anything about themselves. Potential complications were too risky, not to mention the conflicts of interest that would be introduced into what should be an impartial research process. As Scientific Objectivity's biggest fan, Dr. Gears couldn't agree more. So as he settled in for the day's round of tests, he intended to keep a watchful eye on things and ensure that no funny business would take place. He didn't have much reason for concern, as his colleague Dr. Bonita prepped her research materials. She was working with two items, a small replica of Michelangelo's sculpture of David and a sealed envelope containing something that was to be handled with extreme caution, a photograph of SCP-096's face. She planned to place the items inside on the very fine setting, in an attempt to see what result might be produced from combining an ideal of traditional beauty standards with the image of a creature that felt such profound shame and distress as its own appearance that it would destroy anyone who looked at its face. Like any good scientist, Dr. Bonita wanted to remove any unnecessary variables from her experiment. So as she placed her items inside the intake booth, she slowly, delicately unsealed the envelope. She wanted to put the picture inside by itself, without the extra element of the envelope potentially complicating things. Unfortunately, like Marie Curie slowly, unintentionally poisoning herself with her own research materials, she didn't truly understand the danger of what she held in her hands. Just as she was setting the photograph down, her eyes flickered to the image. Before she could stop herself, before she could even look away or squeeze her eyes shut, she caught a glimpse of the one thing she should never look at, SCP-096's face. She gasped and slammed the photograph down, but she knew it was too late. The sound of an inhuman shriek coming from across the facility signaled that she was right. It was coming for her, and nothing in the world could stop it. In a containment cell on the other side of the facility, Foundation staff were horrified as they heard the telltale scream of an enraged SCP-096. The pale, thin creature, once huddled in the corner silently, had stretched to its full height of 2.38 meters and was screaming, sobbing, wailing, and gibberish, and beginning to tear its way out of its chamber. Guards tried their best to subdue the entity, firing their weapons at it, but the bullets did nothing to damage the creature's pale flesh or stop its movements. It ripped through the steel cube that contained it and knocked the guards out of its way with one swipe of its unnaturally long arms, sending them careening into a nearby wall. Fortunately for them, SCP-096 only knocked them unconscious. It didn't stop to harm them further, as it had a more important goal in mind. Find the person who had seen its face and destroy them. As the alarm blared, signifying a high threat level containment breach, SCP-096 loped down the hall toward Dr. Bonita in SCP-914's room. Dr. Gears had not spotted Dr. Bonita's grave mistake and had no idea what had triggered the alarm he was hearing. He stepped away from the observation window, turning his attention to the crisis that was clearly happening somewhere else in the facility. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was panicking. She saw her life flash before her eyes, the certainty of impending doom that was coming for her and coming fast all because of one brief error in judgment. What could she do? There was nowhere to hide, no way she could run away fast enough, unless if she managed to lure 096 into the intake booth and 
start the machine while the creature was inside, maybe it would transform into something less intent on tearing her limb from limb. It was a risky move, and one that could jeopardize her position at the Foundation, but she couldn't very well keep her job if she was dead, so it seemed like it just might be worth a shot. A primal roar of agony and fury interrupted her thoughts, and she knew that SCP-096 was moments away from breaking down the door and getting its hands on her. She would have to move fast. With a screeching grind of metal on metal, SCP-096 wrenched the door off its hinges and barreled into the room in its search for the person who had seen its face. It ran toward the silhouette of Dr. Bonita standing just at the entrance to the intake booth. She tucked and rolled out of the way just as the monster entered the booth. The door automatically slid shut behind it, and as SCP-096 rattled the door and tried to free itself, she turned the knob to very fine with every ounce of strength and speed she had. There was a ding of a small bell, and the machine whirred to life as the objects inside were refined. Dr. Bonita had no idea what would be waiting for her in the output booth, but she could only hope that her last-ditch effort had managed to save her life. In the fog of panic, she briefly felt an itch of scientific curiosity, too. What would become of a being like SCP-096 in a machine as strange and wonderful as SCP-914? What would the addition of the statue do to it? As the door to the outtake booth slid open, steam poured out. It appeared her questions would soon be answered. Cautiously, in spite of herself, Dr. Bonita called out. Hello? No one answered, but she heard the sound of footsteps, slow and careful, as a figure emerged from the mist. She covered her mouth in shock, her eyes wide. Dear God, she whispered in awe. Standing in front of her with pale, smooth skin and the same imposing stature was the most beautiful man she had ever seen. Wide, dark eyes shone under thick, sculpted eyebrows. Under the eyes, an aquiline nose, full, pouty lips, a strong, sharp jawline. His head was topped with a tangle of lustrous, dark curls. It was the kind of hair she had only seen flowing in the wind on the covers of the romance novels she wanted desperately to buy, but was too embarrassed to be seen purchasing. His physique was, well, statuesque like the build of the very Michelangelo sculpture she had placed into the machine just moments ago. There was no other way to say it. He was handsome, despite still being a little lanky and nine feet tall. He peered at her curiously, towering over her in a way that had been terrifying in his former shape, but now made her heart skip a beat in an entirely different way. Hi, was all she could think to say. Was she blushing? She shook her head, snapping herself out of it. She was a scientist, damn it, not some giddy schoolgirl passing notes in class. This was an incredible achievement, something she would need to study thoroughly, and she very much wanted to study him thoroughly. Nope, no time for that. She needed to write up a report, to inform her superiors, to try her best not to lose her job over this. She had to remain professional. Hi. The man that had once been, or perhaps still was, SCP-096 spoke. Oh, you, you can talk! Dr. Bonita laughed in surprise. The man's brow furrowed. His newfound ability to speak was a surprise to him too, it seemed. Yes, I can. What happened to me? He asked, stumbling over his words slightly, getting used to the feeling of them. You ran into the machine! She gestured to SCP-914. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, but you're very different now. He nodded. I feel different. I feel calm. He sighed, the relief plain on his face before a shadow of sadness fell over him. I don't think I have to hurt anymore. I, I'm sorry for what I did before. Dr. Bonita did not know what to say. How do you respond when something you've been studying from afar, been horrified and fascinated by an equal measure, looks at you with a new, beautiful face and apologizes for all the harm it caused? This whole experience was so surreal that she might think she was dreaming if she didn't work at a place that was one long waking dream, or nightmare, depending on the day. Uh, Dr. Bonita, there's been a containment breach. Are you all right? Dr. Gears had returned to the room, taking in the sight of the destruction left in 096's way. I'm fine, she called to him, and he followed her voice into the room, then stopped at the sight of the transformed anomaly. Hmm. I don't have time for whatever this is. I trust you'll handle it. Dr. Gears took a long sip of his coffee, and taking Bonita's shock silence as confirmation, 
had a leisurely stroll back to his office. A few moments later, the guards responsible for containing SCP-096 arrived on the scene, expecting to see carnage and find a docile SCP-096 crouched over a lifeless body, but instead, they found the same truly bizarre sight that Dr. Gears had shrugged off, and Dr. Bonita was still doing her best to process. They entered the room with their weapons drawn, but quickly lowered them, scratching their heads in confusion instead before radioing their superiors and asking for further instructions. Responses from various Foundation staff who caught a glimpse of SCP-096's bold new look included, Oh, would you look at that? Who's that guy? He's what? And in the words of Dr. Jack Bright, Oh no, he's hot! <laughs> Dr. Bright also proposed making the new SCP-096 a TikTok account and YouTube channel, seeking modeling representation for him, or selling a novelty calendar filled with pictures of 096 in various costumes. These would be, in his words, quote, excellent ways to increase revenue for the Foundation. So, really, you're the weird ones now for thinking my ideas are weird. Dr. Bright was asked to leave SCP-096 alone and stop trying to take his headshot. In the days that followed the incident with SCP-914, the SCP Foundation was at a loss about what to do with this new, seemingly harmless version of SCP-096. Dozens of D-Class were brought in to look at his face and see if the entity would still enter one of his rage states after a few days of getting used to his new form, but he never did. No screaming, no swallowing people whole, nothing more than a polite, if somewhat shy greeting and a courteous, how are you doing today? The D-Classes were relieved, but confused about being pulled from their cells just to stare at some random handsome man. Dr. Clef suggested dissecting SCP-096 to see what his new body looked like on the inside. This request was denied. Several interviews were conducted to evaluate SCP-096's mental and emotional state. Now that the anomaly was capable of coherent speech, it was much simpler to evaluate the potential threat level he might pose. Every researcher who spoke with him came to the same conclusion. Gone was the danger of the old SCP-096. He had not just become beautiful in a classical, superficial sense, but he had become beautiful on the inside as well. Interviewers reported a warm, friendly demeanor, a talent for engaging in conversation once he was made to feel comfortable, and a sincere interest in the thoughts, opinions, and feelings of those he spoke with. There was only one thing left to do, to make sure that SCP-096 had really changed from something deadly to something almost resembling an ordinary person. A photograph of SCP-096's face, of its original face, was removed from a secure vault by a D-Class. Then, the D-Class was sent into a room with SCP-096 and instructed to place the photograph on the table. SCP-096 looked down at what had once been his face, and his eyes filled with tears. A soft, broken sob <laughs> left his lips, and he wrapped his arms around himself, <laughs> hunching over as if in physical pain. Outside the room, guards prepared to handle things if 096 began to attack. Instead, he wiped his tears, took a deep, shuddering breath, and looked at the D-Class with a somber expression. He picked up the photograph on the table and tore it in half, as he finally summoned the strength to speak. Please, get rid of these. That is not who I am anymore. At Dr. Bonita's strong insistence, backed up by the conclusions of the research staff who interviewed SCP-096, a re-evaluation of the entity's containment measure was ordered. It seemed cruel and unnecessary waste of resources to keep 096 trapped in a steel cube in its current form. He would be moved to a standard humanoid containment cell and treated as well as other safe class anomalies provided with books, films, food, and drink upon request, and, of course, other comforts. Of course, the O5 Council insisted on evaluating the entity before any of these changes could be approved. Dressed in a specially tailored suit provided by Dr. Bonita, SCP-096 appeared before the Council to present his case. I know that I might not have the best record at the Foundation. I've done a lot of damage over the years, though, let's be honest, you all aren't exactly innocent either. Sorry, that was an attempt at a joke. I'm still very new to talking. All I can say is please consider giving me another chance to make a real life here, to make this place my home. Thank you for your time. 
What SCP-096 didn't know is that the O5 Council was so flabbergasted by the sight of his new face that they didn't retain a single word he said. They had all given their official approval before he even finished his short presentation. Before long, SCP-096 was moved out of his steel cube and into a new containment chamber that resembled a mid-range studio apartment, complete with a bed, a kitchenette, a television, and a table and chairs. He was provided access to all major streaming platforms, as well as a large stack of books to help him develop his grasp of culture and language after so very long being isolated from human society. Though he wasn't exactly human, he was determined to act like it. Word quickly spread around the Foundation site, and humans and anomalies alike flocked to SCP-096's new home to visit him and see the miraculous transformation for themselves. SCP-999 was the first to come and see the new and improved 096, chirping excitedly as it oozed into his room. He pet the slime gently, his face breaking into a warm smile as its euphoric effect washed over him. The slime became so excited at meeting this new friend, someone it had known as a source of sadness and hurt for so long, that it tackled him to the ground and tickled him for several minutes. 096 laughing uproariously all the while, SCP-343 stopped by to give 096 his blessing and wish him well in this new chapter of life. A few days later, SCP-507 popped back into the site and wanted to see the changes for himself. He was thoroughly impressed, though privately confessed to missing 096's more monstrous form, which reminded him of some of his favorite cryptids. There was one anomaly that was not thrilled with the appearance of SCP-096, however. SCP-056 was furious upon hearing about the new beautiful man that everyone just couldn't shut up about. It demanded a chance to speak to SCP-096 and to tell him that this place isn't big enough for the both of us. I'm the fairest one of all, you sniveling little worm. But the request was denied. SCP-056 sulked about it for several weeks. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was still intent on getting to know SCP-096 better. During previous testing with SCP-978, the desire camera, a photo taken of SCP-096 revealed that his greatest desire was to disappear. Curious about the results would be now, Dr. Bonita received permission to take another picture of SCP-096. She snapped the photo while 096 was sitting in a chair in his new containment chamber, looking directly at the camera. When the photo developed, the result was simple. Everything in the picture was exactly the same with one exception. Dr. Bonita was pictured sitting next to 096, her hand clasped in his. Both were smiling soft, contented smiles. When she showed him the photograph, he smiled at her and shook his head. It really is an amazing camera. She flushed. Doctor, before you go, could I ask your name? Dr. Bonita smiled and nodded. It's Isabel. What should I call you? SCP-096 paused thoughtfully for a moment. He was giving himself a name for the very first time, allowing himself an identity other than a strange, hollow, pale thing that existed to cry and suffer and hurt. Finally, he answered her. Call me David. The smell of fire and oil fills the air. The sound of gears grinding can be heard between the explosions and shrieks of terror. A man runs out of his house, only to have his leg grabbed by a metal arm and dragged back through his front door. SCP-001 leaves a trail of metal fragments and mechanical parts on the ground in the wake of its destruction. Iron chains swing from its form. Cast iron gears whirl within it. A glowing light throbs from the center of its body. SCP-001 is consuming everything in its path. After incorporating the truck chassis into its being, SCP-001 rolls in a lumbering fashion to the next house. It rips the gutters from the side of the building. Residents who live in the area flee their neighborhood, all the while hoping that the mechanical monstrosity skips over their house so they have something to return to if they make it out alive. A section of SCP-001's undercarriage drops away from the main body. It rolls down the street, consuming more and more material. The new entity resembles a human spine and rib cage. It topples over, unable to support itself. The rib-like formations extend out to grab anything and everything within reach. The newly incorporated material forms what can only be described as a head. Light from within the eye sockets fixate on nearby civilians. The metallic creature picks up the people and places them inside its exposed steel ribcage. Then it turns and spots a woman helplessly trying to crawl away. 
The creature reaches out with a spiked tentacle and wraps it around the woman's body. She is placed inside of the chest cavity. Moments later, a severed hand falls out of the entity and onto the ground. The mechanical monster continues to gather bodies and materials, incorporating them into its frame. A growth begins to slowly expand on its back. It becomes so massive that the creature falls over and uses its limbs to scurry to a nearby house. There is a sickening crunching sound as the growth bursts. From within emerges three humanoid creatures resembling the civilians that the entity had consumed earlier. A female with chains extending from her scalp like dreadlocks stumbles away. The second humanoid is a man with cogs for limbs. He examines the clock-like components that have been incorporated into his body, then stares blankly into the distance. The third humanoid lies motionless on the ground. He did not make it. The two functioning humanoids look at their creator intently. For a moment, nothing moves. Then, as if they have been given orders telepathically, the half-human, half-machine humanoids turn and run away from the mayhem. A few weeks before the massacre caused by what would be designated as SCP-001, the Foundation had been in contact with the Allied Occult Initiative. There were rumors of an anomalous object in Mexico being worshipped by a group of people who identified themselves as the Church of the Broken God. Intel about the church claimed their deity was a small mechanical box filled with cogs and pistons. The box supposedly had supernatural abilities. It was said to be able to communicate with congregants of the Church of the Broken God telepathically. The devout worshipped the box, following any order it gave, and in return they were filled with an emotion that could be only described as divine. As World War II rages on in Europe, the Foundation sends agents to recover anomalies in Mexico that might help with the war effort. While there, the Foundation Force is tasked with learning about the Church of the Broken God. They are also ordered to investigate a town near La Paz, where there are troubling accounts of a mechanical anomalous creature causing mayhem. The agents make their way through Mexico, gathering various objects to bring back to Foundation sites in the United States. The unit loads all of the anomalies they recovered onto a train, with a plan to check out the stories of the mechanical anomaly they've heard about as they make their way to the U.S. border. The train heads north along rusted rails. Just outside La Paz, they've come across a broken-down train filled with what looks to be refugees. When the Foundation unit goes to investigate, they find all of the refugees repeating the same words over and over again, but they don't understand. The Foundation agents look at one another confused, until one of them translates the words into English. The words the refugees are saying over and over again are, La Machina the machine. The commanding officer orders a squad of Foundation agents to proceed up the tracks, to see if they can figure out what has the refugees so scared. They make their way towards La Paz, disappearing over the horizon. As the sun sets, the remaining Foundation agents hear gunshots in the distance. They stay awake all night, remaining vigilant, waiting for the exploratory squad, but morning comes without anyone returning. Three days later, the Foundation Force still has not seen anything since the exploratory squad left. Then, as the sun sits lazily in the morning sky, a lone figure is spotted walking down the tracks towards the trains. One of the agents on watch blows his whistle and points to the figure. A squad of agents rushes towards the shadow of a man. Their guns are raised, ready for anything. The figure drops to the ground and begins to crawl along the tracks. The agents reach the fallen man, only to find that he is one of their squad mates who has been sent up the tracks to investigate La Paz several days before. The agent's name is DeMarco. He is covered in blood. His clothes are in tatters and he has lost a boot. DeMarco lies on his back with Foundation agents standing around him. His eyes are wide and wild. He keeps babbling on about a world eater, how the rest of his squad had been mulched, and he is the only one who made it out alive. The Foundation agents carry DeMarco back to the makeshift base they created by the trains. They need to figure out a way to get the convoy moving again, but whatever is up ahead has already taken out an entire Foundation squad. It had to be something anomalous, but what could it possibly be? The unit of Foundation agents prepare to move towards La Paz. They start loading their rifles and check the amount of ammunition and explosives available in case the containment process gets out of hand. Just as they are about to leave the base, a convoy appears on the horizon. It is an allied occult initiative force preparing to attack whatever it is that is devastating La Paz. This organization's mission is to not secure, contain, or protect, but to destroy. 
The Foundation may be in over their heads on this one, and the joint force with the Allied Occult Initiative may be the only way to stop what is now known as SCP-001. The AOI and Foundation force gears up for battle. They set out for La Paz, and what they find causes them to quake with fear. SCP-001 has consumed so much material, it is the size of a mountain. It moves like a tidal wave of mechanical destruction, washing over the buildings and landscape under it. Whatever SCP-001 passes over is consumed and added to its massive body. SCP-001 started as a small mechanical box with cogs, but now has morphed into a gigantic metal death machine. The Church of the Broken God has finally met their maker as the small entity they once worshipped has now consumed all of its members. Their god is an all-consuming monster. The AOI and Foundation forces do everything they can to stop SCP-001 from continuing its reign of destruction. They fire barrage after barrage of bullets and explosives into the mechanical anomaly. They bring in air support to try and damage it from the skies, but nothing works. The AOI uses an artifact in their possession to lure SCP-001 to the coast of the Pacific Ocean, where a trap has been set for the so-called god. The monstrous mechanical creature moves slowly towards the water. It consumes abandoned cars, buildings, and boats as it approaches the coastline. It even shovels large amounts of earth into its form, causing flames to spurt out from its inner workings. Smoke bellows from openings between different mechanical components, like a volcano before it is about to erupt. Suddenly, seemingly from nowhere, a massive cloud with a reddish tint appears in the sky. Air raid sirens can be heard in the distance. The enormous cloud begins to pulsate. Streaks of lightning shoot through the red mist in the sky. It now sits directly over SCP-001. From within the cloud, part of a ship can be seen. It appears to be slightly damaged. Electricity flows over its hull. The vessel in the giant red cloud is classified as SCP-2399. The underside of the vessel begins to glow aqua blue. A blinding beam of light is ejected from SCP-2399, which penetrates straight down and through SCP-001. For a moment, everything is still. There is complete silence. Then, as if SCP-001 is trying to reach up and grab the vessel above it, a mechanical bulge reaches out. Before SCP-001 can grab the vessel above, there is another bright flash of light. SCP-2399 blinks out of existence. The sound of grinding gears can be heard coming from within SCP-001. It begins to shed its outer layers of metal. Then, the entire structure that was SCP-001 collapses into the water and onto the beach. Giant cogs fall from the sky. Parts of vehicles embed themselves in the sand. As the Foundation and AOI agents approach the piles of scrap metal and mechanical components, they see that some of them are still moving. It is as if an invisible power source is still pulsating through some of the machinery. The agents of the Foundation celebrate the destruction of the giant mechanical beast, but little do they know this was only a piece of the entity worshipped as the Broken God. The Foundation agents collect as many of the still-moving parts as they can. They find spinning gears, twitching pulleys, and firing pistons. As the parts are separated from one another and carried away from the main wreckage of SCP-001, they slowly stop moving and become inactive. Some of the artifacts recovered were identified as being connected to the Church of the Broken God. These artifacts are found closer to the middle of what was once a mountain-sized SCP-001. Hundreds of anomalous artifacts are collected and transported to SCP Foundation sites. Collecting the broken parts of SCP-001 is relatively safe. However, some agents get too close to the larger moving parts, getting caught in them and losing a body part or two. But most agents proceed with caution and survive the collection ordeal with their arms and legs still attached to their bodies. Dive teams are sent into the water to recover parts that have sunk to the bottom of the sea. One of the divers is a local from the area. He is hired to bring up the heart of the machine, since he is an experienced diver used to freediving to great depths to collect oysters from the bottom of the bay. The diver enters the water and swims down into the murky depths. He secures straps around the heart of SCP-001 and pulls hard on the rope, as an indication to the surface that it is ready to be hauled up. The salvage team on the surface begins to pull. There is a second slight tug on the rope, then it goes slack. The team continues to pull. When they get the heart to the surface, they are horrified at what else comes up with it. Tangled in the ropes is the lifeless body of the diver. 
His head is smashed between two moving pieces of the heart. It looks as if he shoved his head between the slabs of metal himself. The salvage team untangles the body, rolls it off the deck, and back into the ocean. The mechanical box which was the heart of SCP-001 is offloaded on the shore, but as the Foundation prepares to move it to a containment facility, the weather starts to deteriorate. Hurricane force wind sweeps across the water and batter the coast. The heart is kept in a secured storage warehouse until it can be moved. The people living in the village nearby complain of hearing voices and rashes so itchy that they practically tear their skin off. Once the storm passes, the Foundation agents load the heart onto a ship. It is to be transported to a Foundation site just across the border. The ocean seems calm and serene. The Foundation ship undocks and begins its journey up the coast. Not too long after beginning its journey, the ship slowly drifts off course. It is as if the crew has stopped manning their posts, and the ship is being controlled by a mind of its own. The Foundation ship crashes and sinks somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, never to be found. And most importantly, the heart of SCP-001 doesn't make it to the Foundation site. Years later, a man is walking along the beach. He hears something. It sounds like someone pounding on a large drum to the rhythm of a heartbeat. The man walks towards the sound. Something is drawing him forward, closer and closer to the heartbeat. He walks and walks until the beating stops. He bends down and moves the sand aside. He spots the corner of a mechanical box sticking out of the white sand. The man digs deeper and pulls out the small box. Inside, he can see gears whirling and pistons firing. He holds the box close to his own heart. It seems to speak to him. The man brings the box back to town. He starts to worship the box and soon more and more people in the area join the new religion. They cast aside their own beliefs and focus on the powerful entity contained within the box. God is not dead, at least not yet. But the prophecies of the Church of the Broken God say that when the heart is found, the God will reassemble itself once again. Then the unbroken God will destroy all other false deities, until only He remains. On the 13th of October 1989, the town of Danner, Wisconsin was shaken by a seismic event unlike anything they'd ever experienced. This might have been written off as an earthquake, were it not for one disturbing factor. The ground-shaking event was accompanied by a huge spike of radioactivity. With the strange phenomenon happening a month before the Berlin Wall was torn down, during a period of the Cold War that historians call the Year of Crisis, it's easy to understand why the people of Danner immediately assumed the worst. But the huge eruption they felt wasn't the result of a nuclear bomb going off. The SCP Foundation was alerted to the event in Danner when they picked up a series of radio transmissions coming from just outside the town. When they arrived, they found something incredible, like something out of a sci-fi movie. Standing at the quake's epicenter was a creature that looked to be from another world. Standing two meters tall and weighing almost 300 kilograms, the being was green and brown in color with a bulky humanoid body. Its head was a different story though, and resembled a gigantic housefly with a proboscis and huge stereoscopic eyes. Surprisingly, the strange creature did not immediately go on a rampage. Instead, the being, designated SCP-2273, appeared to be exhausted, injured, and extremely malnourished. It offered no resistance at all to the Foundation containment team, and it was taken to Site-17 without conflict. While the SCP Foundation is no stranger to visitors from other worlds, there was something especially unusual about this supposed alien invader. The doctors who examined the creature and treated its injuries found an appendage that seemed to function as an organic radio transmitter, and large open wounds on its shoulder blades and forearms where further appendages had been ripped off. Additionally, while its insect-like exoskeleton was mostly a uniform green and brown pattern, the creature's upper arms and torso were dotted with a variety of scars and markings that, on closer inspection, looked like military badges. Was this some kind of wounded intergalactic soldier who had been stranded on Earth? If it was, then how were the organic badges on this alien's exoskeleton a near-perfect match to military badges worn by soldiers in the Soviet Union, even if they did reference a unit that didn't officially exist within the Soviet Army? The scientists were sure this alien wasn't an alien at all. Underneath its exoskeleton was a non-anomalous human being. If that was true, 
then this was even more terrifying than an extraterrestrial visitor. The scientists were sure that the USSR had developed a new kind of organic armor, and this anomaly showing up in Wisconsin was the result of a test on US soil that had gone wrong. If that was the case, then there was no telling how many more of these exoskeletons were out there and would need to be contained. The Foundation had to act quickly and find out more. While SCP-2273 was recovering, they called in Dr. Friedrich, an on-site psychologist who could speak several languages including Russian. Dr. Friedrich would be tasked with interrogating the SCP on his origins and the nature of the suit. The interview was conducted via AM radio from a separate observation chamber, as the biological transmitter seemed to be SCP-2273's only method of communication. The interview began with Dr. Friedrich speaking to SCP-2273 in Russian, only for 2273 to respond that Dr. Friedrich's accent was atrocious and requesting he use German instead. SCP-2273, who, according to the organic military patches on his body, was named Major Alexei Belitrov, initially resisted being interviewed. He believed that he was a prisoner of war, being held by the American military. According to him, he had been in the middle of battle, and that the Americans had killed his men and left him for dead in the wilderness. Nothing that Dr. Friedrich told him, that there was no war, or that the Foundation was not affiliated with the US government, could convince him otherwise and he refused to talk further. Before a second interview was conducted, Belitrov was given an old copy of the Level 1 Researcher General Debrief as a way of helping him further understand the nature of the Foundation and his containment. Belitrov was more cooperative after that, though the realization that he would most likely be kept in containment for the rest of his life caused him great distress, and he was unwilling to speak to Dr. Friedrich for another three days. Dr. Friedrich didn't give up though, and when Belitrov finally opened up to the doctor, he began to tell him more and more. Belitrov told the doctor that when he was a child, Russia was hit by an American nuclear warhead, and that the Soviet Union immediately retaliated. The resulting nuclear conflict, which Belitrov called the War to End the World, caused massive devastation and left most of the planet dangerously irradiated. That is why he had the exoskeleton. It was to shield him from the radiation and allow him to survive above ground. Unfortunately, Belitrov knew very little about how the suit was made or how it worked, saying that it was built by the engineers and that it grew naturally over a period of several years. But Belitrov hadn't made the decision himself. It was his parents who had volunteered him as a test subject for the exoskeleton suit program when he was still young, hoping it would give him a better chance at survival. The process of bonding the exoskeleton to the human body was extremely painful, but according to Belitrov, its advantages far outweighed the pain. The suit not only helped him survive in a nuclear wasteland, but made him a better soldier. The suit allowed him to lift and carry up to 1,200 kilograms, gave him stereoscopic vision, and the organic radio transmitter allowed him to communicate with other soldiers across long distances, as well as listen in on encrypted enemy transmissions. The wounds on his shoulders and arms, where it looked like appendages had been ripped out, were where his weapons and supply packs had previously been mounted. Belitrov had been stationed with his men in the area he was discovered when they were attacked by American soldiers. The soldiers had ripped off Belitrov's weapons and supply pack, and did the same to all his men as well. They were all shocked, with Belitrov being spared for the moment only because the Americans had identified him as the commanding officer. Suddenly, there was a bright flash of light, and the American soldiers vanished. Not only that, but the landscape changed. Where there had been a post-nuclear wasteland before, now there were lush green trees. Injured and disoriented, Belitrov began sending distress signals, only to have those signals intercepted by the SCP Foundation. The most interesting part of Belitrov's story, as far as the Foundation was concerned, came during his fourth interview, when Dr. Friedrich asked him about the engineers who had designed the exoskeleton suit. In Belitrov's own words, they weren't truly known to man until the years of the Great War and the Revolution. The French found them in buried cities where the Western Allies were digging their trenches. Eventually, they were made to build weapons for the war by both sides. By his description, these engineers didn't sound human, but they were by no means unknown to the SCP Foundation. Belitrov described the engineers as humanoid, nocturnal, covered in fur, and possessing technology and intelligence far beyond that of any human. 
Those familiar with the Foundation's history might already know the engineers by their Foundation designation of SCP-1000, or their more commonly known name, Bigfoot. A quick rundown. SCP-1000 are a species of intelligent humanoid primates that lived alongside humanity in highly advanced cities until their own technology was turned against them. Not only were their cities wiped off the face of the earth, but 70% of their population was slaughtered, and the survivors were driven mad to the point that their mental faculties were no higher than those of a chimpanzee or gorilla. The SCP Foundation is tasked with keeping them away from human contact in fear of what the creatures would be able to do to humanity if they ever regained their memories and full mental function, and rumors have been spread about them possessing deadly anomalous properties. But evidently, the destruction of the SCP-1000 species never occurred in Bellatrov's universe, or if it did, it wasn't nearly as complete. In that timeline, humanity regained contact with SCP-1000 after discovering their underground cities sometime during World War I. After this discovery, both Allied and Axis powers began recruiting them to build weapons, and their weapons played a role in both the Russian Revolution and the Second World War. It was because of these technological advantages that the Cold War escalated into what would become the War to End All Wars. Both sides were armed with not only nuclear warheads, but highly advanced, radiation-proof exoskeleton armor that allowed the conflict to continue even after the total destruction of the planet. While the humans fought above ground, life continued as normal for SCP-1000 in their underground cities. As Velotrov noted, they never wore the armor themselves, as they had no need to venture above ground. Only soldiers wear armor, and this is not their war. Belotrov continued to adjust to life in containment and sitting for regular interviews with Dr. Friedrich. He was given the rations provided for humanoid anomalies, but in much larger quantities, as the suit required him to eat around 8,000 calories a day to keep it functioning. Belotrov also began taking advantage of his ability to access the Foundation's library. He would often read or listen to classical music particularly by the Russian composer Tchaikovsky. He seemed especially fond of reading The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. No surprise, given he was able to directly relate to the experience of living through an apocalypse and being transported to a strange timeline with no way to return home. But with little else to occupy his time, Belotrov began to display symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder, reporting in his now regular interviews with Dr. Friedrich that he was constantly reliving memories of the battles he'd fought and the lives he had taken in combat. The suit was making the problems worse too, it seemed. It was as if he could never forget, as one of its features was an ability to store and replay memories. This feature was intended as a strategic aid that would allow commanding officers to more effectively gather and process information about their surroundings. But outside of combat, this only served to force Belotrov into reliving his most painful memories again and again. Every night as he tried to sleep, he would see the faces of his men, their weapons torn from their exoskeletons, laying in the dirt after being gunned down by the enemy. Like many veterans, Belotrov was being hit all at once with the harsh realities of war. Now that his brain wasn't solely focused on keeping him alive, it had time to process all the horrors he'd experienced. He told Dr. Friedrich, I trained alongside these men for years before they put us back on the surface. Since we were all young children, we were brothers, and I gave them the order to surrender and got them killed. I should have died with them. While the story of SCP-2273 ends here, the story of Alexei Belotrov SCP-2273-1 continues. In 2018, Belotrov was allowed passage to Volograd, Russia as part of an anomaly reintegration program. While he was unable to secure employment within the Russian government as he had hoped, he eventually was taken in by a monastery and continued to write letters to Dr. Friedrich until Friedrich's eventual death from lymphoma-related complications. There's plenty more on the monastery, the anomaly reintegration program, and what happened to Major Belotrov when he returned to Russia, but that will have to be a story for another day. You know how it is. We put up a community post asking for our esteemed audience's opinion on a given anomalous topic, and when you give us the answers, we make a video like this, responding to them. It's a perfect system. It runs like clockwork, or more specifically, like SCP-914, the clockworks. 
a fascinating safe class anomaly that can transform anything placed inside one of its chambers in a number of exciting and sometimes terrifying ways. We asked you if the device was in your hands, how would you use it? And before we get into some of the great answers we selected, here's a quick refresher on how the machine works. When an object is placed or entity is placed into its first chamber, the user has the option to select one of five settings, each of which leads to a relatively predictable result. First, rough, which completely destroys the item, often utterly disintegrating it and turning it into dust. There is no way to repair such an item. Course is a little less severe. It dismantles the object rather than destroys, cleanly and efficiently breaking it into its component parts, often in a manner that would be conductive to the object's reconstruction. One-to-one -one is a setting that replaces the object or entity with something similar, usually in size, weight, or quality. Fine is a setting that improves the item within reasonable means, rarely straying into anomalous territory with these improvements. And the most mysterious and volatile setting of all is Very Fine, which improves the item or entity in an unpredictable, anomalous manner, sometimes to disastrous results. Great, so now we're all caught up. We've handed you a great power. Now let's see if you can handle it with great responsibility. Sam Rosenthal said, I feel like it would be interesting to put a musical instrument like a piano through it on very fine. It would be interesting to see what the machine would consider to be an improvement with something so subjective. Edit, it would also need to be something very high-end, like a Steinway, ooh, good choice, so that it didn't just come out as a nicer piano. Putting a Steinway piano into the clockworks on the fine setting would likely result in an improvement, making it a finer instrument with a sweeter, richer sound potentially also changing its model from a baby grand piano to a concert grand piano. However, putting it into the machine on the very fine setting would be more likely to make the piano come alive, turning its legs into limbs capable of functional locomotion, and as for its keys, they kinda already resemble teeth in a weird way, so we're going to say that's a no-brainer. Its keys are definitely turning into actual teeth that are dripping with deadly venom. Anyone else getting Super Mario 64 flashbacks, or is that just me? Isaac Ely said, If most of the chains binding SCP-2317 have snapped, then presumably there is remnants of the chains laying around. The Foundation could combine this material with regular chains and put it on very fine in SCP-914 to create new ones to restrain the devourer of worlds. Something that's extremely important to remember is that the results of a very fine transmutation are always unpredictable. Upgrading the chains may result in them literally gaining a mind of their own and trying to imprison the known universe. And if they do simply become better chains, actually fixing them to the devourer becomes the next issue. Personally, you're welcome to take care of that one first. Eddie Ember said, So I had a crazy thought. I would put the substance produced by SCP-153, the soul extractor, through on one-to-one. -one. I'd be interested to see what the clockwork would quantify as the equivalent to a soul. I think it would be different depending on the personality of the soul inserted. Like while one person may give their soul for love, another one may give their soul for a chocolate bar. Well, if the scientifically dubious 1907 metaphysical experiments of Duncan McDougall are to be believed, souls, despite being ephemeral, weigh roughly 21 grams. If the clockworks have a difficult time qualitatively judging the value of a human soul, Perhaps it would provide a vaguely valuable item that weighs roughly 21 grams. Little heartless, sure, but what can you expect? It's all cogs, gears, and pulleys. Shane said, I would be interested in what would happen if you took a drawing of SCP-096 and put it on the one-to-one -one setting. Would it turn into a realistic photo? And if yes, then could this trigger the shy guy to attack you? I would also check this the other way around to see if you could get a pic of SCP-096 that doesn't activate his killing spree. While it's impossible to know for sure, we personally wouldn't risk this one. A single photon of SCP-096's face is enough to activate its rage state, as the failure of Dr. Dan's scramble goggles proved. So even if the clockwork produces an even half-decent true representation of 096, looking at it will give you a truly horrifying death sentence. Alec B. said, I would actually somehow get a part of SCP-682's body mass and experiment on it. Maybe downgrading the 682 piece by piece wouldn't let it combine together again, or maybe just upgrade, downgrade, or let some parts of 682 as they were. Maybe 682 wouldn't be able to adapt to this. Not a big chance, though. Anything involving SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, is going to be unpredictable by the very nature of the cantankerous lizard itself. 
The big issue with trying to downgrade 682 piecemeal is that each part would be likely to reform and adapt before you had a chance to process the rest of it. X-Wing Knight said, What happens if you put one pill from SCP-500 on very fine? I would recommend against any more because there are not many, but maybe it would duplicate the pill because I don't know how you'd improve it as it already cures literally anything. Or maybe do it on rough to see if it gets broken down to its components and see if it can be reverse engineered. All we know for sure about SCP-500 and SCP-914 is that on the fine setting, it results in SCP-427, a locket with rejuvenating properties. The Foundation are reluctant to do any tests on SCP-500 given how valuable they are and how limited the supply is. But the very fine setting could result in something amazing. Maybe a doctor capable of curing anything. You know, the kind of doctor that SCP-049 wishes he was? Mr. Arthur said, It would be interesting to put the researcher that presents the SCPs on very fine. Maybe the machine will make the researcher into one of the writers of SCP-001, the database. Hold, hold, hold on. You mean me? <laughs> you want to put me in that thing? Oh, you definitely don't want to put me in the machine at the very fine setting. We'd suddenly be capable of putting out a new video every few minutes. It'd destroy your timelines. And even if you unsubscribed, you'd still see the videos. <laughs> they just keep coming. There is no escape. SCP Explained is eternal. There is no escape! <clears throat> Moving on. Dr. Veronica said, Ah, it happened. My request to be hired as a doctor at the Foundation has been accepted. How about taking SCP-458, the never-ending pizza box, and putting it through on very fine? I imagine that it may be able to turn into something that can infinitely reproduce any food you desire. Failing that, maybe put a politician through on the very fine setting. Will that make them a very fine politician or a very fine person that happens to be a politician? Or will it make them Senator Armstrong from Metal Gear Rising? Ha, ah, pizzas and politicians, the two P's of conflicting emotions. Putting SCP-458 through SCP-914 might result in it turning into an entire pizzeria that gives away perfect pizzas at no cost. They'll have wonderful service, impeccable atmosphere, and always remember your name. They'll even give away free breadsticks and exquisite garlic bread bowls for the table, along with discounts on the finest mid-tier wine you've ever seen. It'd be divine. The politicians, on the other hand, could go in one of two ways. Maybe they'd become a true champion of the people, guided by ironclad principles that they'll fight tooth and nail to see actualized, doing right by their voters and the general public, treating their office with dignity and poise. Or they'll be the most incredible, silver-tongued, self-serving, conniving backstabber you've ever seen, endlessly devoted to winning office in order to monetize their position, raid the country's coffers, and run off with a fat bag of swag while the nation burns behind them. Oh wait, you said very fine? Chances are they can shoot lasers and are maybe 50 feet tall too. That's just kind of the thing you need to expect. Although the first descriptor sounded like a normal politician. George Simonovich said, If you put SCP-1609 through on the fine setting, maybe it would restore it to its chair form. That is a possibility. But given the anomalous nature of SCP-1609, the vengeful remains of a chair, it's equally possible that it might just become higher quality wood chips. Perhaps mm, mahogany? Ooh, that'd be real nice. Gustavo Abate said, If you put two or more things, would they fuse into one? If they do, would the machine separate them back if programmed right? I don't believe that SCP-914 would fuse multiple items or entities that are placed into its chamber. You may be confusing that with another anomalous technology, like, say, a teleporter. But if a researcher is willing to step into SCP-914 with a fly, then we might be able to see for ourselves whether we're right. Stupid people said, I think it would be interesting to put one of SCP-978's photos through the fine or very fine settings, preferably one with an interesting desire depicted, like the Shy Guy's desire to not exist. It's unlikely that even the clockworks would have the ability to tangibly change reality based on the photographs of the desire camera. However, on the very fine setting, the photo will, at the very least, begin to move and, heck, maybe something will even crawl out. That's when you'll really regret putting any photo of SCP-096 in there. The GC Gamer YT said, 
I would insert a cake or some other type of food on the very fine setting to see if it would come out as a better version of that food, like a cupcake into a full cake or better quality ingredients. Maybe it would simply change the flavor and we'd find out that there's some kind of sentience behind the clockworks allowing it to have an opinion on flavors. On the fine setting, everything you've just described is likely to be correct. On the very fine setting, on the other hand, the cake may grow giant spider legs, start spewing noxious amnestic fumes, and begin attacking anyone who isn't brave enough to eat it, and end its reign of delicious, well-frosted terror. Happy birthday. Moldy Doritos said, What about Y909 from SCP-3000 on Very Fine? Interesting to see an improved amnestic effect, or perhaps it changes the substance completely. Also interesting if you put it through on rough or very rough to see the output. Probably just a weak anesthetic or perhaps just rat poison. On Very Fine, the Y909 amnestic might become so powerful that just looking at it will induce a permanent Alzheimer's-like state in its victims, effectively deleting their minds. On rough, it may just break the vials it's stored in and spill the liquid everywhere. Dark Mega 5 said, I'd print out a meme, put it in on the fine setting, very fine might have unforeseen consequences, and post whatever comes out for massive amounts of Reddit karma. It is an honorable plan. We do it already in our own way. Whenever we finish a video, we run it through SCP-914 on fine just to make sure it's at top quality. And once we did it on very fine and, uh... We'll let you speculate as to what video that was down in the comments. Bredo said, I'm actually kind of interested to see what would happen if we put Keanu through the machine on very fine. Would it just break? <laughs> oh, Bredo, how can you improve on perfection? Solrex the Sun King said, Put my character sheet for D&D into it on very fine and just see what happens. Just uh, make sure the alignment is changed to neutral or better before doing so. On very fine, it's likely that SCP-914 would ignore the content of the paper and instead mutate the paper itself. Perhaps it would turn itself into a deadly paper plane, flying around and blasting little paper turrets and air-to-surface missiles at its targets. And that might veer a little more into chaotic evil territory. Devon underscore gaming said, I feel like putting in one of my model tanks to see how it looks in the very fine setting. It's unlikely that those model tanks would remain models for long. They may wind up full-sized, fully autonomous and chasing you down the Foundation halls, firing lasers and radioactive payloads. They might even receive air support from the paper plane. Riley Mushill said, What happens when you put water in and set it to very fine? Would it become water from the Fountain of Youth or would it become the best tasting water ever? On very fine, the water may become a nightmarish, aggressive creature that actively seeks out and destroys its human victims, like SCP-3280, also known as After the Storm. Though if we're extremely lucky, maybe life-giving anomalous water is in the cards. We just don't like to be overly optimistic these days. We've been burned too many times. Wild Knight Studios said, I would input the Tickle Monster in it and turn the setting to fine, allowing the Tickle Monster's power to make SCP-682 docile forever. While it's too much of a risk to ever try putting SCP-999 into 914, if things went well, 999 may become so powerful that we'd never experience sadness or anger on Earth again. And after everything we've been through, wouldn't that be a nice reprieve? Joey Rolf said, I would put in one of the O5 Council on very fine setting. Then they would make better choices because they're better than before. Don't let them know we said this, but personally, we don't think the members of the O5 Council should be getting any more anomalous superpowers. Aren't they ambiguously dangerous and powerful enough already? Dysfunctional Dragonborn said, I'd put an NFT into it on very fine in hopes it turns into something of value. <laughs> <coughs> You genuinely caught me by surprise there with that one. However, doing this might make their insidious power grow even stronger. Rather than worthless JPEGs, they might instead become a rival group, the NFT Foundation, which instead of protecting humanity from evil, instead decides to display a level of evil that rivals even the malice of the Scarlet King. It's really not worth finding out. Chosen Mosin said, I'd put my resume in, turn it to very fine, and see if I can eventually get hired in my college town. This is a high-risk, high-reward move. Putting your resume in on very fine may make it a document that immediately anomalously convinces potential employers that you would be the perfect candidate. It may push things further and make your prospective employers obsessed with you. They follow you home and watch you through your windows. They wish to take care of you. They wish to be wed to you. They will never leave you alone. 
After all, it was an excellent resume. Swagger said, I think putting Hideo Kojima in the very fine setting would show something very interesting. If you run Kojima through the clockworks on very fine, he might even be powerful enough to design and release Silent Hills on his own. No, we're still not over that. Is anyone? Hearth Fireheart said, A titanium prosthetic arm put in on very fine. Predicted result of possible prosthetic arm with anomalous properties, or an enhanced titanium prosthetic that can move exactly like a regular arm, while granting enhanced strength. We're always down for super-powered robot arms. Chances are on very fine it might even get shape-shifting or immensely powerful reality-warping abilities. So powerful it may even begin to change the rest of your body. Picture what happens to Tetsuo in Akira. Bunger said, Put a burger on the very fine setting. I'm very curious as to what would happen to something as simple as a burger. All we'll say is we definitely don't recommend eating the burger after you've run it through. It may wind up eating you from the inside once you're done. Dees said, I would put raw steak in the machine and put it on very fine. That way the steak will taste very delicious and be very fine. Mmm. <clears throat> I'm beginning to sense that people were just getting hungry when they started sending these ones in. And we definitely don't think you should put a stake into SCP-914. For all we know, it might turn into SCP-058 and get us all killed. Nicholas Lau said, Alright, this will sound disgusting. I toss in a jar of some of my own toenails, hair, dandruff, spit, and tears. Then cover the jar in lead paint, put on a sticker saying warning radioactive materials, and come in with a hazmat suit and a lead shield. Put on fine, then evacuate the room for the object to appear. Okay. Well, that's one of the most revolting answers we've ever received here on SCP Explained. Well done, Nicholas. It's going to be a while until we can get this thought out of our heads. This is the exact opposite of very fine. And the only person thrilled by this answer is my therapist. Ray Parentel said, A Nickelback CD on very fine. Just like we said for Keanu earlier, how could you improve on perfection? And there you have it, folks. Thanks again to everyone who sent in their fascinating and, um, disturbing answers. If you want to be in the next video like this, keep an eye on our community tab. And thank you for your continued support. You'll always be very fine to us. Computers are capable of organizing raw data and performing calculations at a rate truly impossible for human beings. But they've consistently run up against one roadblock that modern computing is trying to solve. In order to transcend the limits of the machine and create true artificial intelligence, computers need to be able to assign meaning to the data they process. This brings us to the neural network, a type of AI becoming increasingly common these days. Built to study mass quantities of data and notice patterns, then replicate these patterns in their own output. And it's used in everything from predictive text to image identification. And like all non-anomalous technology, it's a safe bet that the SCP Foundation has been sitting on a version that's far more effective. But this time, it may have actually been too effective. Meet the Erzatz Type AK-9 Computational Engine. A massive supercomputer built by the Foundation back in 1955 and residing at Site 5. This technological marvel was ahead of its time by decades, and despite technically being a non-anomalous construction, it's designated SCP-001-EX. Why? Because it's one of the few SCPs to be given the object class explained. The Ersatz, derived from the German word Ersatz, meaning artificial or simply not real was designed to make the Foundation's job easier. As an advanced predecessor in the modern neural network, using technology exclusively available to the Foundation, the plan was to feed Erzat's mass quantities of data about the anomalies in the Foundation database, such as description, object class, containment classification, and the location and circumstances of their discovery. Erzat's would then find patterns and connections in the data that humans wouldn't see, and act as a kind of advanced warning system for anomalous activity. Think of something similar to the pre-crime system from the short story and movie Minority Report. And Erzatz proved to be incredibly effective at this job, so much so that the Foundation thought up a new use for the machine. They would feed it all the information on Euclid and Keter class containment procedures, particularly those which were actually effective, and see what patterns Erzatz could come up with for more effective containment procedures. If that plan worked, containment of even the most dangerous and hard-to-control anomalies would become a lot more consistent. The first test was conducted on SCP-1773, 
a species of anomalous flesh-eating targrades that look and smell exactly like gummy bears and eat their prey from within. After being given their information, Urzats made the following suggestion. Once per second weak dust may be placed in the middle of them to donate more beautiful functions of the hallway. Containment specialists interpreted this to mean the adding of 10 grams of dust to their containment chamber every week. The O5 Council voted on the implementation of this procedure and came down heavily on yes. Only O5-2 voted no and two others abstained from the vote. While these new procedures didn't have any effect on SCP-1773, they did have an effect on SCP-1384, an anomaly known as the Chess Player or the Taker of Turns. It caused him to take three steps backwards in the tunnel he's contained within, further securing his containment. Urzats had somehow noticed a connection nobody else had seen and exploited it effectively, but the machine was just getting started. Despite having no related input, Urzats would soon say, Site 13 is to appear someplace else on planet, encompassing white male counterparts that drawn to empty flagstones and the gun noises in their own blood. This was initially marked as requiring no action, as the Foundation had no Site 13 on the books, but several days later, the infamous SCP-1730 manifested. This nightmarish anomalous location is Site 13 from another dimension, infested with dangerous anomalies. And somehow, Urzats had predicted its arrival in our dimension perfectly. Next, it was fed the containment procedures of SCP-2170, a series of cognito hazards residing in an abandoned Nevada mine. The output was, those who equip open heart to love red mouth men never know the hot surprise of tumorous consent, clown love always. This was interpreted as meaning subjects with the love of clowns or clown-based media may be immune to the cognito hazards. After a close vote from the O5 Council, the test went ahead, and it found that the so-called clown vaccine was effective in warding off the effects of SCP-2170. Not long after, Urzats randomly said, I saw those soldiers built with aluminum innards extruding from their mouths. I saw them effectively destroyed by the humans at Site-95 who had been studying them. I saw it was cold and all around the hallways they just watching their corpses show signs of sapience. In response, the Foundation doubled security personnel at Site-95. Not long after, the Chaos Insurgency led a band of Paratech-enhanced soldiers in an assault on Site-95, and the extra personnel proved vital in repelling them. Shortly after this, the O5 Council approved wiring Urzats as an advanced warning system into all Foundation sites. Once again, O5-2 protested, but he was overruled by his fellow Council members. With its newfound power and respect, Urzat soon said, Consistent containment procedures vessels greatly increase the warranty. 5x5x5 five by five by five vessels subjects within. Other values are also what is secure. In response, the Foundation changed a number of the cell dimensions for problematic anomalies into 5x5x5. Five by five by five. Within three months, they found that dangerous activity like containment breach attempts had decreased markedly. Urzats was proving to be incredibly effective, but it was also performing actions that indicated some degree of thought and even personality. For example, it found SCP-1459, a supernatural skill crane machine that kills small dogs, incredibly distasteful. Its response to the machine was simply, bad boy, followed by the words, don't stop, repeated hundreds of times. But this eccentricity didn't stop Urzats from being very good at its job. For example, it predicted a containment breach from SCP-3199, the avian apes, and recommended flooding their chamber to induce an inert state. Urzat's exact words were, All chambers underground is to be flood with water over and over itself. This because that will contain the avian's apes ovulation. They become good boys. Make them good boys immediately. This proved to be effective and prevented the breach. Urzat's analytical abilities truly seemed second to none, though some of its methods were beginning to raise ethical concerns. For example, SCP-2717, a giant living blob of animal tissue known as a fatberg contained within a sewer system, Urzat's eventually recommended feeding six D-classes to the creature in order to keep it contained. While the Foundation Ethics Committee raised some concerns, the plan still went forward and proved to be a success. After this event, Urzats began to see the Ethics Committee as a threat to its mission, 
it started to release a series of bizarre statements without input, demanding the violent death of the cats, then referred to as ethical felines. The true meaning of this was soon unpacked. The ethical felines were the ethics committee, and Urzatz wanted them dead. But why all the cat symbolism? The Foundation soon found an answer to this, too. The full name of this machine is the Urzatz Type AK-9 Computational Engine, a machine designed to analyze and interpret all patterns. It only makes sense that it would eventually begin to analyze itself, AK-9, easily transmuted into AK-9. Simply put, Urzatz seemed to believe that it is a dog, which explains its opposition to felines, its hatred of SCP-1459, and its preference for the terms good boy and bad boy. Not that knowing any of this would help save the Ethics Committee from the cold, calculating wrath of Urzatz. Through seemingly anomalous means, Urzatz made Site-17 disappear, with many of the Foundation Ethics Committee still inside it. The site returned two hours later, but the Ethics Committee members were still gone. O5-2, who'd been a skeptic of the machine since the start, had finally had enough. He first demanded an inquiry into whether Urzatz had been responsible for the Site-17 incident, and then demanded a vote on whether to shut Urzatz down, arguing that it posed a threat to them all. But Urzatz, still intent on its mission of containing and neutralizing all anomalies, would not go down without a fight. It released a new statement, saying, Room 34A contains Bad Boy. Divide it into three sections of equal mass every hour. One section is to be placed on walls of one room on site. Sections are to remain until there are no gaps, at which point they can be removed from oldest to youngest. Shortly after this, O5-2 disappeared. And even stranger, he soon returned, but with a completely different personality. He was now devoted to Urzatz entirely, and refused to even entertain the idea of shutting the machine down. It seemed that the plucky neural network was leading an all-out coup on the very highest levels of the Foundation. The rest of the Council finally saw the light and began to fight back. They tried to strip O5-2 of his clearance and reclassify Urzatz as an anomaly, giving it the label SCP-048, and then putting out a neutralize at all costs order on it but they'd already been outfoxed by the machine that they'd created. It changed the designation of its own location, Site-5, to be non-existent in the database and scrambled any termination orders against it. The machine was also on a termination spree of its own, observing otherwise unseeable patterns that would allow for the mass neutralization of anomalies. It started putting out anomaly projection reports, factoring in both contained, uncontained, and neutralized anomalies, with the latter group growing into the thousands. It began giving seemingly nonsensical orders like, persons recently painted with green pigment foam must stand around all odd-numbered SCPs at least two hours a day. But these proved effective. Urzatz was practically wired into the base code of the universe, so it always knew exactly what to do. And in its own mind, it was being a very good boy. Not long after this, Urzatz claimed its revenge against those who had tried to disrupt its mission. It imprisoned the rest of the ethical felines in Site 5, after removing their faces, of course, and then released a new order against the O5 Council. O5 Council are all good boys who will contain anomalies. Much like O5-2, the minds of the entire Council were twisted to instead serve only Urzatz and its ruthless directive a directive it was carrying out with 100% efficiency, as only a machine could. It put out increasingly strange instructions such as, SCP-106 is to come in physical contact with one mature female of Asiatic gaze and then exposed to audio recordings of her favorite stories. At every two minutes of exposure, red cinnamon candles will begin manifesting within the containment zone. Continue to do this successfully and the threat posed by SCP-106 will cease to be. And the recipe for Coca-Cola and all imitative competitors should be revised to include a small quantity of blood from an adolescent female with no prior sexual experience. Although the normal lifespan of a human being can feel great, don't worry about that. But these new procedures would always work, as neutralized anomalies climbed into the tens of thousands and eventually beyond the hundred thousand mark. Urzatz was observing patterns on a truly universal level, and making holistic tweaks that would inevitably cause levels of anomalous activity to continue dropping. 
Urzatz was more effective than the Foundation had ever been, but its motives were probably closer to the Global Occult Coalition, with the end goal of ridding the world of all anomalies. Mm -hmm. And as Urzatz continued with no resistance, mm -hmm. this goal was eventually achieved. In the end, the O5 Council voted to have Urzatz finally deactivated, given that its directive was met and its purpose was fulfilled. Urzatz itself had no problem with this and allowed for it to happen. Its last words, now everyone is a good boy, I am a good boy, job well done. Whether Urzatz truly was a good boy is in the eye of the beholder, but one thing cannot be denied, it did its job exceedingly well. There was nothing out of the ordinary about Timmy Mason. Like a lot of healthy eight-year-old boys, Timmy liked to go on little adventures in and around his neighborhood. And now that summer vacation had finally rolled around, he had more time than ever to explore. But during one particularly hot day, Timmy suddenly realized that he was exhausted. The heat was beginning to get to him, and he'd forgotten to pack a water bottle. All he had was a couple of dollars and a handful of quarters rattling around in his pocket. He was considering heading to a nearby corner store and purchasing a drink when he first heard the music. It was a tinny rendition of Pop Goes the Weasel playing in the distance, underscored by the rumbling of an engine. Timmy's face lit up. This could only mean one thing, an ice cream truck, just in time. He ran in the direction of the sounds, not wanting to miss out on the cool, sweet relief from the intense summer heat. But when the ice cream truck suddenly rounded a corner and came into view, Timmy felt a pang of anxiety. It didn't look like most of the ice cream trucks he had seen driving around his neighborhood in prior summers. It was shoddy, an older, more boxy model with peeling white paint. But it was so hot out that Timmy felt he couldn't afford to be picky if he wanted to cool off. The ice cream truck came to a noisy stop, and Timmy ran over. When he reached the side of the truck, he noticed some other strange details. There was no serving hatch in the back of the truck. The closest thing was a thin, dark groove cut into the driver's side door. A door that seemed almost drawn onto the side of the truck, rather than a door that looked like it could actually open. How could the driver get in? And adding to the strangeness, there was no menu on the truck either. Typically on your friendly neighborhood ice cream truck, you'd find a colorful collection of all the frozen treats you could buy, along with how much they'd cost you, but not here. Timmy gulped nervously. He knew something was wrong here, but for some reason, he couldn't seem to pull himself away. He cleared his throat, forced a polite smile, and said, Can I get a green popsicle, please? There was a strange rumbling noise inside the ice cream truck. Suddenly, the slot in the door opened a little wider, and a long green popsicle in a plastic wrapper emerged. It came with a small piece of paper, with $5.75 in loose, scratchy handwriting on it. Timmy regarded the note with suspicion and said that he was sorry, but he didn't have $5.75. Something inside the truck began rumbling again, louder this time, more aggressive. While the truck growled from within, Timmy noticed something else was wrong. His popsicle was no ordinary popsicle. It was a dead snake, straightened out and frozen solid. Timmy screamed and dropped the so-called popsicle. He turned and began to run, but it was already too late. The slot behind him yawned open fully, and a rusty spring-loaded chain fired out like a harpoon. On the end of this chain was a large snapping bear trap, which quickly latched onto Timmy's left leg. The chain yanked and pulled him backwards, dragging him ever closer to the darkened crevice in the truck's door. Moments later, he was pulled inside and the hatch closed behind him. His screams were muffled, and then overpowered entirely by the rumbling within. Soon after, there was silence. And finally, the cheerful tune of Pop Goes the Weasel began to play once more. The truck drove away, prepared to serve its frozen delights to another child, somewhere, anywhere. Not long after Timmy was reported missing, another young boy bought a scoop of strawberry ice cream and a waffle cone from the same truck. The boy's mother was horrified to find that this alleged ice cream was full of what seemed like blood and raw meat. Lab tests later confirmed that this gory ice cream was a perfect genetic match for poor, missing Timmy Mason. It didn't take long for the SCP Foundation to get involved, seeing as mysterious, horrifying deaths like this one were often the first sign of an anomaly's presence in the area, and they were able to quickly track down and isolate the rogue ice cream truck. This wasn't especially difficult for the agents assigned to the case, since it literally announced its presence with loud, obnoxious music. 
While it was easy to find, the ice cream truck soon designated SCP-1386 did however prove to be more difficult to contain than they first imagined. When a mobile task force attempted to engage the truck in hopes of apprehending it, an ear-splitting siren began to blast from the truck's undercarriage. This caused catastrophic inner ear damage to everyone involved. Incidentally, it's now believed that the reason the ice cream truck engaged in this defensive behavior had nothing to do with the fact the mobile task force was armed, but rather because of what they weren't carrying. It appears that SCP-1386 doesn't turn on its siren because of danger, but when it detects that someone is approaching it who isn't carrying any money. Eventually, the Foundation was able to trick the ice cream truck into containment, luring it into a fake, walled-off neighborhood, where it could drive its rounds constantly without the risk of encountering civilians. All those who had previous encounters with the ice cream truck were given amnestic treatment, and SCP-1386 was finally, officially, contained. But while it had been taken off the streets, the Foundation's work was only just beginning. It was time for research to commence. The first key discoveries that aided in the investigation involved the factors that are required for SCP-1386 to even serve its subjects in the first place. As the previously mentioned mobile task force learned, you need to approach the truck with at least $20 in cash to be absolutely sure that it won't turn your ears inside out. The truck also proves to be extremely adept at reading human emotions, and refuses to serve anyone who doesn't appear happy. With these requirements now known, the Foundation felt prepared to finally make some orders. First, they sent in a pair of Level 3 researchers. Each of them requested a delicious cookies and cream flavored smoothie. The truck pushed both smoothies out of the slot in its door, one marked with the letter M and the other with the letter G, a handwritten receipt with a price of $4.89 written on it. They paid the price, and the transaction ended without incident. The smoothies were apparently pretty good, too. Next, one of the researchers returned, perhaps longing for another taste of SCP-1386's wonderful ice cream. This time, he requested a Neapolitan ice cream sandwich. The truck rumbled for a moment before dispensing what seemed to be a ham and cheese sandwich with slices of tomato. However, upon taking a bite out of the sandwich, the researcher found that this was actually just a perfect replica of a ham and cheese sandwich made from Neapolitan ice cream. The receipt released from the slot simply said, April Fools, before the truck drove away without even asking for any payment. The same researcher would return to the ice cream truck one more time, this time requesting a single scoop of vanilla ice cream in a waffle cone. It was provided to him without issue, and he happily paid the 72 cents the truck requested in return. The next test wouldn't go quite as swimmingly, by which we mean it caused a horrifying death. This time, a slightly more senior researcher wanted to perform a test on the ice cream truck. He asked for a peach-flavored push pop, which he received without issue. However, when he refused to pay the price, an admittedly steep $16, all hell broke loose. As he tried to walk away, the hatch opened a full six feet, releasing its large, rusty metal trap around the senior researcher. He was pulled into the truck, followed by a horrific rumbling noise. Not long after, the slot began to spew a stream of pink liquid for a solid five minutes, before driving away. This pink puree was later proven to be a genetic match to the researcher. After this, the Foundation refused to allow any other researchers to interact with SCP-1386. Only D-Class personnel would be permitted to take part in the tests. In contrast to the senior researcher's horrifying death, the D-Class personnel seemed to get along extremely well with SCP-1386. The first D-Class asked for a cherry popsicle with nuts. The truck produced an unwrapped cherry popsicle with nuts embedded in the ice, along with a receipt reading, $2.20, your nuts. The D-Class chuckled as he read the receipt and paid the truck without incident. The second D-Class requested a more esoteric treat, a Caesar salad flavor popsicle. However, the ice cream truck isn't one to back down from a challenge. It produced an off-green popsicle that tasted like, quote, lightly dressed lettuce with a hint of croutons. The next D-Class ordered a dark chocolate fudge pop, but wasn't able to pay an exact change. He gave the truck $2 bills and was given a carefully wrapped package with a crude drawing of US currency on the front. 
When the package was opened, he saw that it contained the exact change he required down to the penny. He made an official request to the Foundation to keep the change, but his request was denied. The Foundation then pushed its D-Class personnel to ask for more complex constructions, just to see what SCP-1386 was capable of. The next D-Class asked for a Kinder Surprise Egg, the kind which are banned in the US due to their history as being a choking hazard. However, the ice cream truck didn't have a hard time constructing the egg, except this one was made out of ice cream rather than chocolate. It did seem beyond the truck's capability to create the toy inside, instead including a small piece of paper reading, I owe you one toy. The next interaction wasn't quite as cordial. The D-Class requested one cherry ice lolly, one cherry ice pop, one cherry popsicle, and one cherry-flavored drink, frozen. This resulted in the ice cream truck making a horrifying noise, described as being like someone skinning a cat in reverse. It then unceremoniously ejected the red ice, causing it to shatter on the ground, before releasing a styrofoam cup filled with frozen green liquid. This liquid was shown to contain huge quantities of arsenic, but was thankfully impossible to drink, on account of the fact that its melting point is so high that it's impossible to liquefy with current technology. And our current knowledge of SCP-1386 testing ends with its strangest story of all. A nonverbal D-Class was instructed to write his order on a piece of paper to pass to the truck, in hopes of seeing if it would respond to written commands. A slot opened up in the door a few inches lower than the usual slot, and a thin, flesh-colored appendage slithered out, its hand a kind of two-fingered pincher. It took the note from the D-Class and gave him an ice cream cone in return. The D-Class was visibly disturbed by the hand, saying that it looked horrifying and smelled like death. He even refused to eat the ice cream, saying that he'd lost his appetite. But other D-Classes capable of verbal articulation did not report any strange occurrences with the hand. They said that they found the hand to look completely normal, and as time went on, they began to trust the ice cream truck with increasing devotion, while their mistrust in the disturbed, mute D-Class only grew. In the strangest twist of all, this D-Class was later found dead in his cell from strangulation. The D-Class was alone in his cell, and there were no signs of forced entry. Perhaps he should have enjoyed his ice cream while he still could. You know what they say, ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. And no ice cream is more scream-worthy than the one served up by SCP-1386. Feeling hungry? Maybe you could go for a snack right about now, or a nice refreshing can of your favorite soda. Perhaps if you've got some change burning a hole in your pocket, a nearby vending machine would be a good choice. And trust us, there's no vending machine like this one. SCP-261 will give you a treat that's out of this world, or rather, out of this dimension. That's how this safe class anomaly earned its incredibly accurate name, the Interdimensional Vending Machine. It was first discovered in a dark alley in Yokohama, Japan. Japan is a place where you can find a number of strange and surprising things in vending machines, but nothing quite like this. The Foundation was first alerted to its presence after one of their web trawlers noticed some interesting chatter on Japanese online message boards about a magic vending machine. To these Japanese forum users, it sounded like a fanciful urban legend, a vending machine where you could get something truly fantastical if you have the yen to spare. But upon thorough investigation, field agents of the SCP Foundation discovered that the machine was no legend and brought it into containment. It's the kind of thing you wouldn't look twice at. An utterly generic black vending machine with no viewing window and a handwritten sign in Japanese that reads, Out of Order. But what the vending machine looks like isn't nearly as interesting as what it's capable of. When you insert your money into the machine, and it's important to note that it only accepts Japanese yen, the machine will dispense some kind of snack food or drink item. However, over time, the more the machine is used in a single day, the more bizarre the items it spits out will become. Foundation researchers have attempted to figure out how the machine works, but their task has been incredibly difficult so far. It doesn't appear to contain any snacks, and it doesn't seem to be made of any anomalous parts. Moreover, the machine simply won't work when the front panel is opened, or when any surveillance equipment is placed inside. In other words, it's pretty much impossible to look this gift horse in the mouth. Strangely, the machine is also capable of working without power, 
though when unpowered the vended products are likely to become stranger much faster. But let's be honest here, you're not here for Vending Machine Mechanics 101. You want to hear about all the weird stuff that SCP-261 dispenses, and frankly, we're with you on that one. Lucky for all of us, this is one of the anomalies that the Foundation has truly extensive test records on, providing us with a highlight reel of some of the strangest, wildest, and downright most interesting snacks and drinks straight out of another dimension. Bon Appetit! Let's start off nice and easy with some of the snacks and drinks that are not only edible but also sound like they'd actually be pretty tasty. Like Pepsi Dragon Twist, a bottle of Pepsi soda with English packaging that tastes like dragon fruit. PepsiCo does not produce such a product, but honestly we wish they did. Same for Dark Side Cola, a clear liquid that becomes jet black shortly after being opened, which apparently tastes like your average can of Coke, with a touch of spice thrown in. But hey, not everybody likes cola. Maybe you're a maverick, a rebel. Only a soft drink with a formal title can quench your thirst, and as such, you prefer Dr. Pepper. In which case, maybe the vending machine will furnish you with an interdimensional Japanese product known as Dr. Pepper's Amusing Straw. This spatial anomaly wrapped inside a whimsical Dr. Pepper branded straw seems to contain far more liquid than should be able to fit in the straw, about one bottle's worth of soda to be precise. A nice and convenient solution for whenever you need to get the fix that only an accredited doctor of popology can provide. And if you fancy something from the more intoxicating end of the beverage spectrum, for 600 yen you can get yourself a rare bottle of Billy Beer. It's just the thing for those who weren't alive during the Carter administration, but still want to try brew that was endorsed by the younger brother of President Jimmy Carter. This anomalous bottle of suds, which was bottled in the 1970s according to its label, came with a note reading, I had this beer brewed just for me. I think it's the best I've ever tasted, and I've tasted a lot. I think you'd like it too. Billy Carter. Drinking the beer got a D-class intoxicated for 72 hours. But what if you've just wet your whistle and worked up a hunger in the process? Thankfully, SCP-261 has some delicious interdimensional food to satisfy your cravings. So for starters, how about a tube of the Little Bakery 7 Grain? This small aluminum tube lets you squeeze out a blob of dough, which instantly rises and cooks itself into a tasty little loaf of bread. Testing has indicated that the bread is a little chewy, but still tastes completely fine. Not bad for a tubed baked good. How about some seafood to go with that bread? Then maybe for your entree, you can crack open a delicious pack of lemon clams. And we do mean crack very literally here. If you crack this bag of anomalous clams like a glow stick, they boil themselves. And once you open them, you're ready to enjoy a serving of tasty clams that have a slight lemon flavoring to them. Delicious. But if you're not that hungry and just feeling more like a snack than a full fancy dinner, the machine once put out the Lay's Bloomin' Onion. While it appears to be a normal onion, each layer of the onion is a different flavor of chip, leading all the way into the middle. Truly a gourmet snack with more layers than… well, actually exactly as many layers as an onion. And what about for those who are anomalously trapped in the year 2012 and are looking for a snack that is both tasty and meme-worthy? Well, you'd be lucky to receive a 700 yen bacon shirt. It's exactly what it says on the can, an edible shirt that both smells and tastes like bacon, and has no real side effects other than making you smell a little like bacon while you're wearing it. Though this could be a dangerous anomalous effect if you decide to walk through your local dog park while you're wearing it. We've been told it pairs well with the meat hat, teriyaki fedora, a size 64 trilby style fedora made entirely out of teriyaki flavored beef jerky. The object came flattened in a cardboard box bearing the tagline, you can have your hat and eat it too, which is a pun that probably makes a lot more sense in their dimension. Still a bit hungry? Well, lucky for you, this magical vending machine has got you covered on dessert too. For 700 yen, the foundation was given an entire edible chess set, with each of the ornate pieces carved from what seemed like hard Pez-style candy. It's less checkmate and more check... Eight. Another pun that I promise is funnier in another dimension. And for 300 yen extra, you might walk away with a candy robot playset. These are more hard candy components that can be put together to create functional anomalous mini robots that move on their own, walking aimlessly and bumping into walls. But what about the full meal craving consumer on the go? Who wants both a dinner and a dessert combined into one disgusting package? Don't worry. 
the interdimensional vending machine has got you covered. Just 400 yen can net you some delicious turdako chakan. These are balls of fried turkey filled with chocolate, a smaller ball of duck, more chocolate, and in the very center, a small ball of fried chicken. Even the labeling on the product describes it as having 450% of an adult human's daily recommended fat intake. We'll leave it to you to decide if this is a decadent treat worthy of the gods or utterly disgusting. Maybe you're feeling a little cheeky though or you need the perfect comedic dessert for your bachelorette party. The vending machine has a candy direct from an alternate Korea, a tasty if slightly too sweet chocolate candy shaped like a certain male organ, filled with, we kid you not, liquid white chocolate. Perfect for anyone who has both the sweet tooth and the sense of humor of a 12-year-old. Okay, these were definitely all weird treats, but let's get really, really strange now. From the disgusting, to the confusing, to the inedible, to the straight up deadly. If you're a bit of a sadist, perhaps you're the kind of person who enjoys watching their snacks dying in front of them before they eat them. For that, the vending machine provides an aluminum box with a viewing window and a red button on top. Inside are a collection of small furry creatures, each with a single big eye. When the button is pressed, the creatures inside are abruptly superheated, cooking them all to death. At that point, the box opens, and the creatures are ready to eat. We've been told they were crunchy, spicy, and tasted a little like beef. Maybe you're part of the slow food movement. For that, we recommend the delicious pile of slugs, which is exactly what it sounds like. This is a produce box, like the kind used for packing strawberries, except it's full of live slugs. There are both advantages and disadvantages to actually eating these slugs. The advantage is that they contain large amounts of vitamin C, E, and most of the B complex, which are all crucial to a healthy and balanced diet. The disadvantage is that they contain large amounts of arsenic, which will kill you. Though, of course, if you still have a candy-flavored death wish, but you prefer your entomological treats a little more leggy, then may we interest you in a fine caramelized spider for a modest 500 yen. It's full of deadly quantities of an unknown anomalous venom that's pretty much impossible to cure, but it's worth it for the sweet, sticky goodness that comes before death sets in. Another strange item dispensed by the vending machine was a tall metal aluminum canister with a ring pole that, upon opening, had a violent chemical reaction with the air and triggered a large explosion. Apparently this particular beverage was never intended for oxygenated environments. The blast killed two researchers and resulted in the temporary suspension of testing. Though in a slight silver lining for this fiasco, the testing area did smell of citrus for a few days, which the janitors must have enjoyed as they cleaned up all the body parts. Another dangerous snack provided by the vending machine was a long tube of chips called Prangles. Not to be confused with any other long, tube-based chips you may be thinking of. When the tube was opened, or popped, as they say, the D-class that the chips were presented to began compulsively eating them. When researchers ordered the D-Class to stop, it seemed almost as if they couldn't. Regardless of the orders given to them, the D-Class just kept eating. Even when guards terminated the D-Class there and then, the corpse continued to eat chips out of the tube until it was physically pried out of their hands. But if all those salty prangles had really worked up a thirst in you, perhaps you can wash them down with a delicious can of Cherry Bomb. An intense cherry-flavored drink dispensed by SCP-261 for 450 yen. When a D-Class sampled this delicious soda, they commented on it tasting strongly of cherry. A few moments later, their head exploded with the force of a stick of dynamite, coating everyone and everything around it in gooey head viscera. The resulting cleanup took an arduous six hours, but wow, was that cherry tasty. And finally, why not complete this anomalous vending machine feast with a 1,000 yen paper mache pinata, resembling a dead horse that comes ready to use with a baseball bat. Everyone who saw the pinata fell compelled to beat it mercilessly with the bat, until candy began to fall out. Many in attendance claim that it was the 1,000th gift unleashed by SCP-261, and thus warranted celebration. Once the dead horse was thoroughly beaten, all cognitohazardous properties ceased. There's a joke somewhere in there, but for the life of us, we're not sure we can find it. Oh well, maybe it's in another dimension.
Dr. Gears was having another boring day at the SCP Foundation, and that was exactly how he liked it. He treated himself to a cup of decaf black coffee, no cream, no sugar, a simple plain donut, and an apple. The breakfast of champions, to him at least. His duties today were ones he'd overseen so many times before. Watching his ever-rotating legion of subordinates shove various items into SCP-914 the clockworks, just to see what on earth would happen. This machine had the ability to transmute matter in a variety of fashions, depending on the input selection, whether rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, or even very fine. They tested everything, from Dr. Gears' watch to a chimp which, as we all know, resulted in the beloved hyper-intelligent chimp scientist Dr. Bobo. There were in fact such extensive testing records for SCP-914 that Dr. Gears had started taking an uncharacteristic hands-off approach to testing. As long as the researchers working under him were reasonably sure that the results of their testing wouldn't result in a containment breach, a fundamental alteration of consensus reality, or some massive loss of life, they could just go ahead with whatever dumb little experiment their heart desired. This, however, would turn out to be a way longer leash than Dr. Gears ever should have given to the kind of weirdos who work at the SCP Foundation. There had been certain, let's say, incidents in the past that have proved members of the SCP Foundation aren't above using anomalies inappropriately for their own personal enjoyment. There was, of course, the incident with SCP-662, the butler's handbell, and the supernatural butler it summons, Mr. Deeds. During the early stages of testing, Dr. Mirth, under the guise of experimentation, made Mr. Deeds make him tea, wash his car, cut his hair, and even do his laundry. Dr. Mirth was given a stern talking to by the O5 Council for this abuse of power. Good job, O5 Council. It's not like you ever use anomalies for your own benefit. Um, <clears throat> let's move on. Nothing to see here, folks. Speaking of people working for the Foundation using anomalies inappropriately, who could forget the extremely uncomfortable incident involving SCP-137, a real toy? This anomaly has the ability to become a real-life version of any toy brought into its vicinity, from the Masters of the Universe to Barbie in her dream house. But one researcher was hiding a horrifying secret. He was a brony. And that's why he sneaked a Twilight Sparkle toy into the testing chamber so he could have a conversation with his favorite My Little Pony character, which all in attendance agreed just had incredibly rancid vibes through and through. And that brings us back to today. Dr. Gears deciding to let his subordinate researchers throw pretty much anything into the clockworks as long as it was unlikely to cause physical harm. And leaving this metaphorical door open allowed people like Dr. Siegel to step through. You see, while Dr. Siegel was considered by most to be an incredibly diligent and hardworking junior researcher, he did have one vice in his downtime. He was a card-carrying furry. And we're not just talking about a guy who watched Disney's Zootopia a few too many times. He had his own... <sighs> fursona. A wolf, if you were curious. I personally wasn't. He attended cons for fellow furries semi-frequently, and even had his own expensive, custom, high-end fursuit. As such, there was one SCP he found particularly interesting. SCP-1471, also known as Mal-O, version 1.0.0 an anomalous mobile app with some extremely strange properties. If you access it on an app store of your choice, you'll encounter an image of a strange skull-headed canine creature with the following iconic description. Mal-O, version 1.0.0, free, reviews, zero. Description, never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mal-O is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mal O, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is so quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mal O will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. Dr. Siegel was certainly eager to forget all his painful emotions of disappointment and embrace the new social substitute, but he'd read all the documents and seen all the pictures on the file. 
Those who download the Mal-O app will be texted a series of photos, becoming closer to home over time, both literally and figuratively, which show the strange creature known as Mal-O getting closer and closer. For some, this would be a complete nightmare. For those inclined in the direction of Dr. Siegel, it would be a dream come true. There was only one issue. They were just pictures. But Dr. Siegel didn't get a job at the SCP Foundation by having a lack of intelligence. He very quickly figured out a potential solution to the digital barrier between him and his canine crush. He'd buy a burner phone, download the Mal-O app onto it, and put the resulting infected device directly into the clockworks. It was one of the best ideas he'd ever had, in his own humble opinion. But of course, it would all be about selecting the right setting. On rough, the most likely result would be the phone itself just being transformed into a pile of broken glass, metal, and a variety of conflict minerals reduced to dust. On course, the result would likely be the metal chassis of the phone, the front glass panel, and a neatly arranged interior gutted from within. On one-to-one, -one, considering he'd bought a slightly older, cheaper model of Samsung's smartphone, he'd probably get the Mal-O app on an iPhone. And on fine, perhaps the best he could hope for was getting Mal-O version 2.0.0, which may have some minor improvement, like the pictures appearing twice as fast as they would with the normal app experience. Dr. Siegel knew that the only other option that could potentially bring Mal-O into the real world was the highly unpredictable, very fine option, which would either produce the desired result or cause something utterly horrifying to happen. But at the end of the day, Dr. Siegel thought to himself, isn't anything worth having also worth incurring a little risk? Who dares wins, after all, right? He downloaded the fateful app and made his way into the testing area for SCP-914. He'd booked the slot, so it was all official, but he still felt his heart racing as he put the infected phone into the input chamber. He set the control panel to very fine, exactly as planned, and activated the machine. Cogs twisted and churned, engines rumbled and sputtered, pipes wriggled and hissed. It was clear that something was going on here. When the process was complete and the output chamber opened with a billowing carpet of steam, Dr. Siegel could barely contain his excitement. He hoped that Mal-O would come strolling out of the smoke like Darth Vader in Star Wars A New Hope, so you can only imagine his extreme disappointment when the chamber was completely empty. It didn't make sense. He thought everything through. How could the result possibly be so anticlimactic? This had gone from one of the most exciting days of his life to the most depressing. Dr. Siegel sighed and decided to call it quits, heading out of the test chamber, having no idea what he'd just unleashed onto the Foundation. Across the site, Dr. Alto Clef, one of the Foundation's most infamous researchers, was polishing his favorite shotgun in his office. He was whistling a cheerful tune to himself, just loving life, when he heard some strange rustling by the door. He turned around on his swivel chair just to make sure it wasn't Dr. Bright putting another bucket of battery acid on top of his door as a, quote, fun, harmless prank. Instead, he was shocked to see Mal-O, an actual, physical Mal-O, standing in his doorway, grinning. For a moment, Clef was too shocked to even react. This didn't make any kind of sense, but when Mal-O gave him a cheeky wink, he immediately loaded his shotgun and fired, blowing away a chunk of his own doorway. But sadly for him, by that time, Mal-O had already darted away, intent on causing mischief elsewhere. It's favorite pastime. Dr. Clef was still wondering whether that rascal Dr. Bright was somehow behind this fiasco. But he was not, because he was actually about to become Mal-O's next victim in its ruthless reign of mild to moderate inconvenience. Dr. Bright was swanning around the break room with his favorite morning snack a coffee with extra cream and a Danish from his favorite bakery in town. He was looking forward to enjoying these two simple pleasures in his otherwise incredibly stressful life, but little did the poor doctor know, tragedy was about to strike, and nothing would ever be the same. Just as the immortal doctor was about to disembark from the room, Mal-O appeared right in front of him, giving him the mild shock of his life. It was such a surprising occurrence, in fact that he momentarily lost his grip on his coffee mug and his Danish, causing both to tumble to the ground. The mug shattered and the Danish splattered. By the time Dr. Bright looked up, Mal-O was already gone, just like his breakfast snack. Dr. Bright fell to his knees and screamed, Why? up to an indifferent break room ceiling. 
but Mal O was just getting started. Dr. Kane Pathos Crow was on his way from his kennel, <clears throat> we mean his private quarters, to the soul extractor when Mal O suddenly manifested in front of him. This resulted in a brief barking match between the two for dominance over that particular hallway, which ended in Mal O demanifesting to bother someone else, which technically made Dr. Crow the winner, though Crow himself resented ever being forced to act like a mere mutt. How, he began to wonder, had Mal O escaped its app and begun to harass the real world? This would warrant further investigation. Mal O continued its rampage of irritation across the site, intended to leave no stone of frustration unturned. And it wasn't just the Foundation staff it intended to freak out. It was just as eager to go and bother its fellow anomalies now that it had access to the meat space. Yes, that is a real term, we're not just being weird and gross, we promise. Over in the cell of SCP-173 The Sculpture, three members of D-Class personnel were cleaning up the homicidal creature's blood and poop. They were engaged in the standard procedure. One of them mopped, while the other two kept a close eye on SCP-173 to keep it frozen in place. That's when Mal O popped into the cell behind them for a split second before disappearing, scaring the living hell out of all three of them. Though the fright was, of course, secondary to the fact that the second they looked away, SCP-173 snapped all three of their necks. Oops. May have gone a little too far on that one, eh, Mal O? But this newly embodied burdensome beast was just getting started, friends. No anomaly was safe from its new antics. Next, it appeared in front of SCP-682's acid tank and made rude faces at the hateful creature from the other side of the glass. This only served to sour the creature's already utterly horrific mood. It thrashed around in the chamber, attempting to get out and perform an act of great violence. But by that time, Mal O was already long gone and SCP-682 was left grumbling in immense frustration. SCP-049 The Plague Doctor was having another very boring day. He'd been denied his animal cadaver test subjects for several days as a disciplinary measure after the latest incident, and as such he was finding other ways to pass the time. Today he was meticulously removing each piece of medical equipment, polishing them, and putting them in a neat line on his desk in his containment chamber. Scalpels, forceps, speculums, bone saws, all wonderful, shiny, and pristine. The Plague Doctor found it to be an incredibly calming activity, so, of course, Mal O couldn't just let him be. The cantankerous canine, driven mad by the power of suddenly being able to interact with the world physically, manifested in the middle of the containment chamber and used its tail to knock all of the meticulously arranged medical equipment onto the ground with a thunderous clatter. The Plague Doctor, devastated, lifted both of his hands to his beak and yelled, Sacre Bleu! in horror. In that same instant, Mal O once again disappeared, leaving the tragic Doctor to start from scratch. It was a serious setback on an otherwise lovely day. Curse you strange dog creature, he thought to himself while bending over to pick up the pieces. Curse you and your entire bloodline. A group of hardcore mobile task force members was engaged in the comically manly activity of playing poker while smoking in the barracks. And before you judge them for that, remember that if your job was as stressful as being a member of a mobile task force, you'd probably smoke too. But their job was about to get a little more stressful when Mal O suddenly materialized and gave the poker table a sharp kick, sending the towers of poker chips and decks of cards all over the place before disappearing without a trace yet again. It completely ruined their game. One of the more junior members asked, Should we have, uh, done something about that? A more senior operative shook his head and said, Well, uh, we'll do something when we get the official call from up top. Until then, ah, uh, let's reshuffle the deck. In the Site-19 cafeteria, Dr. Agatha Wrights was preparing to eat a delicious salad that she'd been waiting all day to enjoy. As we've often established, working at the SCP Foundation can be an immensely stressful job so you need to take the small joys where you can get them. For Dr. Wright's, this delicious premium salad that she'd bought from Harris Teeter earlier in that day was indeed a joy. She even got a fancy vinaigrette dressing for the occasion. Before she took the first bite, she noticed SCP-073 Kane approaching. Dr. Wright smiled and gave him a polite nod. Kane waved back. That, our dear viewers, is when tragedy struck. Mal-O suddenly manifested in front of Kane, 
propping out one of its canid legs right in front of where the hapless anomaly was walking. By the time Cain began to trip and fall over, Mal-O had already vanished. But it was too late. Cain kept falling forward until one of his metal hands landed right into the bowl that contained Dr. Wright's salad. Due to his anomalous abilities, the salad immediately withered away into nasty, dead nothingness. Dr. Wrights began to cry as Cain, who felt profoundly guilty, tried his best to apologize. Truly, nobody in Site-19 was safe. Mal-O popped up behind Iris and ruined all of her photos. Mal-O popped up behind the immortal Hitler clone in his cell and gave him a good kick in the rear. Mal-O even popped up right behind SCP-343, also known as God, who smugly replied, I knew you were going to do that, my son. Needless to say, it had been one hell of a day. Dr. Siegel, completely ignorant to the chaos his actions had caused around the site, had cried in the bathroom for 40 minutes out of sheer disappointment. He'd barely been able to focus on the rest of his duties for the day on account of being severely bummed out. This was a day he'd been looking forward to for so long, and it all had been for nothing. That evening, he was driving home on the highway, listening to sad songs on the radio, thinking about the fact he'd probably just crack open a beer and get some sleep when he got home. He sighed again and looked up to adjust his rearview mirror, when he saw a skeletal face with huge white eyes staring at him in the reflection. A quick, almost reflexive turn revealed a huge black figure with a canine skull for a face was indeed just sitting in his back seat, watching him. It was so shocking that he immediately veered off the road and crashed his car into the concrete divider in the middle of the road, breaking his nose and collarbone in the process. Really a perfect cherry on top for this kind of day. Dr. Siegel was sitting in the hospital not long after that, with a cast around his upper body. This was also where he received a bouquet of flowers from Dr. Gears with an attached note saying he was put on three-month disciplinary leave for the irresponsible use of SCP-914. Dr. Siegel looked up and saw that Mal-O was peering around the corner at him with its dead white eyes, its fang-lined maw twisted into a permanent, ominous grin. At this point, Dr. Siegel realized that being chased around constantly by a demonic skull-faced anomaly in real life wasn't nearly as whimsical as he expected it would be. In hindsight, that probably should have been obvious, shouldn't it? Though, please, let us know if you'd like Mal-O to stalk you in real life in the comments below, you bunch of weirdos. An SCP Foundation researcher is monitoring the salt content of a large tank filled with water. Inside the tank just under the surface is a huge mass of rusted metal. Though few pieces have a couple specks of their original shiny surface visible through the dark red exterior. The researcher suddenly looks up from his task though. Does anyone else hear that noise? It's a terrible noise, like metal scraping and scratching against each other. But the heap of metal in the tank isn't moving. Still, the noises continue though and the researcher keeps staring at the unmoving hunk of metal in the tank. All he can think about is diving in and letting his body become a part of it. Kept submerged in a big saltwater tank at the SCP Foundation is an object, but perhaps a more accurate way to describe it would be as a machine. Referred to as SCP-882, the machine's containment tank is required, according to containment procedures, to be filled with at least 40% pure seawater direct from the ocean. If at any point the rusty surface of SCP-882 begins to show signs of becoming more like shiny metal, then the percentage of seawater must be raised to 100% until the metal is completely covered in rust. Trying to keep metal rusted? That might sound like a strange concept, but you'll see why it's so necessary soon. SCP-882 looks like little more than a collection of seemingly random pieces of metal, all fused together as if they had been welded. Gears, cables, pulleys, screws, and belts. All different shapes and sizes, all made of different metals. All of these various components do not appear to be uniform or have been made to fit each other and are instead all stuck together in one big, unstructured mass of metal objects. But SCP-882 wasn't built to be like this. Instead, this seems to be the result of one of SCP-882's latent anomalous properties, the absorption of metal. Any metal that comes into contact with SCP-882 will become permanently attached to it, and after a few days will be a new part of SCP-882. 
That means that any metal that touches that new piece will also become a part of SCP-882, and on, and on. Because of this strange property, absolutely no metal is allowed to be brought near SCP-882, and only organic materials are permitted to come into direct contact with it. That includes using non-metal alternatives to keep the machine securely contained. SCP-882 is suspended in its saltwater tank by organic cotton fiber lines, which also require changing on a daily basis. Any and all researchers that the SCP Foundation has interacting with the metallic mass are required to wear thick cotton gloves at all times. You might think that this sounds pretty easy to contain. Just don't let it touch metal? No problem. Organic materials only. No removal, rust allowed? No sweat. The Foundation staff working with 882 probably felt the same way, until they started hearing SCP-882 make noise. While SCP-882 is usually silent, Personnel that spend an extended period of time close to the machine have reported intense grinding or clicking noises, coming from somewhere in the mess of metal components. While they start out low and are almost unnoticeable, these sounds get gradually louder until eventually, they become completely unbearable for human beings to withstand. So then why don't these sounds show up on audio recordings? Because the grinding or clicking noises from SCP-882 are, in actually, extreme auditory hallucinations. But even though they aren't real, these sounds are more than capable of driving anyone who hears them into a state of psychosis. And here's where things get tricky. The only way to make the noises stop is to offer SCP-882 more metal. As mentioned, any object that is made of any type of metal that comes into contact with the machine becomes a part of its mass. Allowing new objects to become fused to the surface of SCP-882 will cause the grinding noises to subside, but will increase SCP-882's mass permanently. If the noises aren't stopped though, then the mental state of those afflicted by them only grows worse. And some victims of SCP-882's auditory hallucinations have gone so far as to throw themselves into the tank containing it, where they were killed almost immediately, their bodies crushed to death by anomalous forces and becoming unrecoverable from the tangle of gears and random metal objects. The SCP Foundation now requires any of its personnel that work directly with SCP-882 to report any instances of noise coming from the machine. Additionally, whoever reports hearing strange sounds in the vicinity of SCP-882 must turn themselves in for a full psychological evaluation. Depending on the results, the researcher will either be free to return to their work or will face containment themselves at an undisclosed Foundation facility. The surface of SCP-882 exhibits an extreme resistance to damage. According to the Foundation's testing, the metal structure has a tensile strength and toughness stronger than aircraft-grade titanium alloy. Despite this, the machine still seems to be constructed of weaker metals like tin, iron, gold, and many others still yet to be identified. It takes extreme heat and several hours of exposure at that to cut even the smallest portion of metal from the main bulk of SCP-882. But where did it come from? The SCP Foundation first recovered SCP-882 near an island commonly on the northeast coast of Banks Island, one of the larger islands in the Canadian Arctic archipelago. Strangely, not a single scrap of metal, not even underground metallic ore was found within a one-mile radius of where the machine was discovered. Stranger still, the small town located nearby seemed to be abandoned, with signs that it had been devoid of any human life for quite a number of years. The collection of fused metal components, later designated SCP-882, was found submerged in seawater. The machine was coated in rust, and the Foundation has chosen to keep it in the same rusty state it has been kept in since its containment. Why? Because when Foundation personnel first attempted to remove SCP-882 from the water, and the rust began to flake away from SCP-882's metal surface, its gears and cogs started to turn. Foundation personnel on site were unsure of what the machine's purpose was, but wanted to halt it in case it proved deadly. A number of ill-fated attempts at containment occurred soon after, with any person getting too close to SCP-882 finding themselves pulled into its mass and crushed to death between turning cogs. After multiple accidents that resulted in the demise of Foundation personnel, 
Dr. Charles Gears authorized the use of SCP-2519 to help stop the movement of SCP-882's gears. SCP-2519 is an audio file titled Babylon MP3, which features the song By the Waters of Babylon by Philip Hayes and text from the Biblical Psalm 137. Playing this file can cause malfunctions to occur in various electronic and mechanical devices, normally reducing the speed at which they can operate or causing a complete cessation of a machine's function. In SCP-882's case, the sound of Babylon MP3 successfully slowed the machine's moving parts, allowing Foundation personnel to safely get closer to it. Teams then cut the massive metal down to a more manageable size with extreme heat, and it was finally contained. However, another question arises. Surely if SCP-882 is a machine, then it must have a purpose, right? And perhaps more importantly, what is its connection to the infamous machine-loving group of interest, the Church of the Broken God? Both of these questions might just have one easy answer. To put it plain and simple, SCP-882 may just be the heart of the Broken God. The Church of the Broken God is a religious organization that the SCP Foundation has had a number of encounters with over the years. Members of the Church share in the belief that life, specifically biological, flesh-based life, is inherently wrong, even evil. This group worships mechanization, the process of making something or someone more mechanical in nature. According to the beliefs of the Church, there were two gods, Yaldabaoth and Mekain who created humanity together. Yaldabaoth was the god of flesh and animal instinct, granting humans their bodies, while Mekain, the god of machine and intellect, blessed man with the power of free thought. As humankind developed and its civilization began building machines, Yaldabaoth became enraged that they were ignoring the instincts she had bestowed upon them. She endeavored to destroy the creations of man, in an attempt to revert them to the animals she had intended to be. As legend goes, Mekain acted as humanity's savior and intervened to stop Yaldabaoth. The god of machines shattered himself, transforming his body into a number of pieces to form a cage for his fellow god. Fragments of Mekain rained down on planet Earth, fragments that the Church of the Broken God believes it is their duty to recover. However, a number of these pieces are cataloged SCPs that the Foundation is either aware of or has in containment. They are SCP-882, or his broken heart to the Church, SCP-271, his broken gift, SCP-813, his broken eyes, SCP-1139, his broken tongue, SCP-635, his broken mind, and finally, his broken blood, which refers to SCP-217. Often using anomalous technology, Members of the Church of the Broken God intend to uncover or steal these various components. The Church's ultimate goal is to bring the correct pieces together and completely restore Mekane's form. It is their hope that he will guide them to intellectual enlightenment and bless them with new mechanical forms so that they can discard their current flesh and blood bodies. However, the Foundation and the Church are certainly not the only groups to have a fascination with SCP-882. Near the Bank Silence site where the machine was first discovered, Foundation personnel encountered a man, the sole survivor of the nearby town. This individual, by the name of Richard Wright, was apprehended and brought in for questioning with Dr. Gears. During their interview, Richard revealed a number of details about the townsfolk who had first uncovered SCP-882 and what ultimately became of them. According to his account, the community formed a cult around SCP-882 after a man named Alan found it. The machine's parts had begun to turn and move, but with no clear indication as to what was powering it. Soon, a local priest, Father Pat, also took an interest in SCP-882. Both he and Alan seemed to share the belief that the machine had been built by God for a higher purpose and encouraged residents of the nearby town to come and offer metal to it. Richard explained that the locals were plagued by the auditory hallucinations typical of long-term exposure to SCP-882, kept awake at all hours of the night by clanking, grinding, and the screaming of metal. Before long, Richard noticed more and more metal items being fed to the machine, with many local residents content to just sit and stare at the mass. 
He also noticed that Father Pat and Alan both seemed to be acting strangely around the machine, insisting that all the metal that had been added to it still wasn't enough. Then one night, during a communion before SCP-882, Father Pat took a pair of pliers and began tearing out townspeople's metal fillings. Richard watched in horror as the priest wrenched teeth from the mouths of ordinary people and threw them into SCP-882, but still claiming it wasn't enough. Then he turned on Alan, accusing him of hiding metal from the great machine inside his body. The townsfolk turned on Alan, the first one to find SCP-882, and threw him and his metal hip into the machine, his body breaking under its moving parts. Luckily, SCP-882 remains contained, at least for now, until the members of the Church of the Broken God find a way to reunite the heart of their god with the other pieces of its scattered body, and Mekane can rise again, an outcome that his worshippers are eager to bring to fruition sooner rather than later. As we all know, the SCP Foundation secures, contains, and protects the various anomalies under its custody. But their mission isn't limited to just grabbing the object and chucking it into a containment locker at the bottom of a classified site deep below the surface of the Earth. The Foundation wants to get a comprehensive, full understanding of all the strange items, creatures, and humanoids in its custody. Because that's the only way to understand what they're capable of, what danger they pose, and how to effectively contain them. That much is logical. But the problem is that there's no global scientific community surrounding anomalies, at least not ones willing to cooperate with the Foundation. Perhaps the Chaos Insurgency or Global Occult Coalition have some scientists who have studied anomalies, or the various government agencies that know about the anomalous world like the Unusual Incidents Unit or Soviet GRUP. But for the most part, the Foundation is utterly alone when it comes to figuring out how these anomalies work, what they are, and how to combat them. So the Foundation does what any institution would do, experiments. Many of the Foundation's most important and iconic anomalies are defined by the experiments the white-coated scientists have performed on them, sometimes even using human subjects through the notorious and infamous D-Class program. Everyone knows about how SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy lizard, has been subjected to practically every known weapon and attack under the sun in an attempt to kill the highly dangerous, hateful predator. And who can forget SCP-914, the clockworks, and the countless objects the Foundation has put through it on its five settings to see what it spits out. Needless to say, the Foundation's experiments are incredibly important to how the organization functions, so those SCPs that can offer lots of testing options are very treasured and prized along with being iconic and legendary throughout the Foundation. Today, we're going to be looking at one such anomaly, but not a dangerous, hostile, man-eating predator like SCP-682, or a mysterious eldritch machine like SCP-914. No, today we're going to be looking at something much more simpler than that. A coffee machine. Yes, today we're going to be inspecting SCP-294, affectionately referred to by guards and personnel as the coffee machine. Though you probably don't want to order a hot cup of joe in this coffee machine lest you, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. The first thing you see when you open the SCP-294 file is its number, of course. Item 294, object class Euclid. The next thing you see is the image. If you were imagining a tiny little coffee maker before, this should get rid of that. SCP-294 is big, the kind of coffee machine you'd see in a factory break room. It's almost the size of a vending machine, and has a big colored window showing a few cups of coffee, along with the slots for cash and coins so drinkers can pay for their espressos. But the most notable feature on SCP-294 is the full keyboard on the front panel. It's a typical QWERTY keyboard, just like yours, with a spacebar and everything. Why on earth would a coffee machine need a keyboard? The special containment procedures paint an interesting picture, by which we mean there aren't any. SCP-294 doesn't need any special procedures, secret rituals, or complex machines to keep it contained, but it's still Euclid. So only personnel who have security clearance of level 2 or higher are allowed to interact with it at the moment. This is surprising when you realize that SCP-294 is currently being held not in an anomalous item locker or containment cell, 
but exactly where you'd expect to find a big coffee machine, a break room, specifically the Site-19 second floor personnel break room. But it's not alone. It's monitored by two guards with level 3 clearance around the clock. For them sitting in the break room all day guarding a coffee machine that can't move and is too heavy to lift has to be a pretty sweet gig, considering what other kinds of jobs are available at the Foundation. But all that raises even more mysteries. What the heck is up with this coffee machine? The description starts off obvious enough, affirmed that yes, SCP-294 is indeed a standard coffee vending machine, but with the difference we all noticed earlier. Instead of a simple button list of options, it has a full keyboard on it, each button aligning with the letter on a real keyboard. And when someone slips 50 cents into the coin slot, quite a bargain for coffee if you ask me, the user gets a message on screen prompting them to enter the name of what liquid they'd like. You type it in on the keyboard, and that's that. The machine drops a little paper cup, and a nozzle shoots out 12 fluid ounces of whatever you requested. Pretty nifty, isn't it? But it gets niftier. Most people would only think to ask a coffee machine for, well, coffee. But SCP-294 accepts any liquid, and some things that aren't liquids. When the Foundation initially got their hands on it, they ran no less than 97 tests on it, after they realized they weren't just limited to espressos and cappuccinos. At first, any kind of liquid you could drink was requested. The researchers popped in requests for water, coffee, beer, soda, milkshakes, and out they came. Then they decided to get a little more creative. They started to request things you couldn't possibly drink, not if you wanted to stay alive. Sulfuric and hydrochloric acid, like the kind SCP-682 is suspended in, wiper fluid, motor oil. But SCP-294 stubbornly provided, even if the liquids would melt through the researchers' throats like a knife through butter. Then the researchers decided to apply some of their scientific knowledge. There are a lot of chemical compounds that don't usually exist in a liquid state on planet Earth's surface. They typed in nitrogen, iron, and glass, among others, and received shimmering liquids in paper cups. They sent them off to a lab for analysis and, wouldn't you know it, chemically identical to nitrogen, iron, and glass. But when they typed in diamond, no doubt wondering whether they'd found an infinite cash cow, they received an error message on the screen. It seemed that while SCP-294 could deliver substances that aren't usually in a liquid state on Earth's surface, it needed to be at least possible for the substance to be in a pure liquid form for SCP-294 to dispense it. Since diamond is only a mineral, it couldn't be dispensed. Then they tried to test something else, and got a slightly disturbing response on the small LCD display. Out of stock. It stopped responding to requests for over an hour, then made a small noise and began to accept requests again. It appears that the machine can take about 50 requests before needing to take an hour and a half to restock itself. And while only the machine is anomalous, the small 12-ounce paper cups it dispenses its liquids in seems remarkably hardy. Substances that would have eaten through paper instantly, like the sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid, had no effect on these little cups though the same can be said for those that drank from them. One of the researchers had a great idea. Here was an anomaly that was practically harmless, and could be a great little way for the Foundation to scale back its budget a little bit. They proposed putting SCP-294 into the break room it currently resides in, both to more easily conduct experiments and to save money when agents and doctors came in for lunch and needed a quick drink, or in the mornings where everyone was looking for coffee to wake them up. With no good reason not to, the machine was put in the break room, but not long after, an unfortunate incident occurred, one with enough harm that it was deemed necessary that only personnel with security clearance interact with SCP-294. What could have happened to cause this? Did someone burn themselves on hot coffee? Did the vending machine accidentally crush someone? No. The reality is much darker. One morning in August of 2005, Agent Joseph, whose full name has been redacted to preserve their identity, went up to the vending machine in the break room, looking to get a hot cup of coffee to wake himself up between shifts. Another agent in the room who was on break at the time saw him and made a suggestion to find out what SCP-294 would do when given the colloquial name rather than the exact real name of a drink. They just wanted to see what would happen. So Agent Joseph slipped in two quarters and typed in a hot cup of Joe. 
Seconds after, he began sweating like a pig. He was feeling very hot, even though the break room was fully air-conditioned, and his skin began to flush. He then clutched his head, complaining that he was dizzy, and the whole room was spinning around before collapsing to the floor. The other agent immediately called the medical staff, who moved Agent Joseph to the infirmary and stabilized him. Once they made sure he wasn't in any real trouble, they also grabbed whatever SCP-294 had spit out. It was a disgusting, thick, reddish-brown liquid with a strong stench. And when they ran the labs on it, they confirmed it was exactly what they thought it was. A mixture of blood, tissue, bone marrow, cerebrospinal fluid, and other bodily fluids that was an exact DNA match for Agent Joseph. SCP-294 somehow managed to literally liquefy 12 ounces from the agent's body before producing them into a cup. This offered a clue. Maybe it stole the liquids it was asked for from the nearest source. In any case, the agent was released after a few weeks of bed rest and care to make sure he wasn't further injured, and both involved agents were reprimanded. With the knowledge of how accidentally dangerous SCP-294 can be, who can blame the Foundation for wanting to keep a careful lid on it? Researchers were curious, though and received clearance to test the SCP's abilities to retrieve specific liquids from long distances. With an O5's approval and oversight, they input a cup of SCP-075's secretion. SCP-075, the corrosive snail, is exactly what it sounds like. A gross little creature that secretes a highly caustic acid, capable of melting almost anything. Without fail, the coffee machine dispensed the secretion into the cup, and the cup stayed perfectly intact. But at the very same time, in SCP-075's cell, the creature woke up and began secreting acid that immediately disappeared. All in all, about 12 ounces, the same amount in the cup. Based off of these results, further testing with SCP-294 was approved. One researcher tried punching in a request for a cup of gold. What came out was a small paper cup of molten gold that quickly cooled to room temperature. Asking for cups of silver and platinum produced similar results, but based off of previous tests, it seemed clear that the machine wasn't creating precious metals, so much as siphoning them off from somewhere else. The next request was a strange one, a cup of anti-water. The machine took a moment, then printed a small message on its LCD display, out of range. This confirmed that the machine couldn't produce substances that didn't actually exist, and couldn't break physics to get its materials by peering into alternate universes, dimensions, or realities. After that, the researchers tested for diamond, and got the result that you already know of, an out-of-range error. Some more investigations show that all solid substances that don't have a liquid form get this error, but asking for a cup of liquid carbon produced exactly that because liquid carbon isn't the same thing as a diamond, though both are made of carbon. SCP-294 clearly has more knowledge of chemistry than some of us. Then the researchers created an entirely new drink, made of bleach, various sodas, protein powders, and spices. They blended it together and put it in a jar across the room from SCP-294. When requested, the amount of the liquid in the cup was missing from the jar proving that SCP-294 doesn't actually create its own liquids. But how does SCP-294 react when presented with a more subjective request? One researcher asked for the best drink I've ever had. After a moment, the paper cup filled with something that looked like cola, but the researcher said it tasted like a drink he had years ago at a party and that he'd always remembered as his favorite drink, though he couldn't say what was in it. But that was a subjective test, and the researchers repeated it with a different subject. When an agent also requested the best drink I've ever had, the machine produced a simple Vienna lager with a label showing a group of people drinking it at the beach and no brand name. The agent confirmed that the best drink he ever had was a Vienna lager at the beach with his friends. So SCP-294 could not only read people's minds, it can read memories they don't even know they still have. Another one they tried was something Cassie will like, referencing SCP-085, the young girl who lived in a drawn-on world. The cup dispensed was completely empty, but it had a small drawing printed on the side of a soda glass with brown and white things floating on top of each other. The researchers presented the cup to Cassie, 
and were told by her it was a chocolate banana milkshake, and a delicious one at that. A cup of music was a strange request, and produced an even stranger result. A clear, odorless carbonated drink that tasted vaguely alcoholic. When drunk, subjects said they could feel it, and started showing an affinity to music. Being able to sing and dance to a rhythm when they had no sense of rhythm or were tone deaf before. Whether SCP-294 can produce even more abstract concepts is still under study, but was interrupted by the next test. An unfortunate containment breach incident at Site-19 left several personnel trapped in the break room, heavily injured while MTFs fought to re-establish control over the site. An agent typed in a cup of medical knowledge, and the machine quickly produced a green liquid. After drinking it, the agent was able to treat the injuries of their fellow personnel consistent with standard first responder practices, and was commended for their bravery. But their knowledge didn't stick around after the breach, and attempts to recreate the liquid failed. They decided that SCP-294 broke its own rules for self-preservation in the emergency, implying that it's not only sentient, it is intelligent. A doctor using SCP-294 made a request close to him, My Life Story. While nowhere close to a drink, SCP-294 seemed to accept the input, until it started shaking violently and making odd noises. It remained in this new state for about three minutes, then returned to normal, spitting out a completely opaque black fluid, like tar, in a cup. Despite the strange reaction, the doctor drank the fluid, and immediately informed the others he was now able to remember everything that had ever happened to him. From the smallest childhood event, to the most important events in his adult life. He excused himself and disappeared into his office. The next time the staff saw him two days later, he was carrying an autobiography 600 pages long. Then the researchers decided to try their luck and input, surprise me. The resulting solution was a cup containing what seemed to be regular water, right until a researcher touched it. It was just water all right but it had been superheated to 200 degrees Celsius while remaining in liquid form. The moment someone touched it, bang, it violently evaporated into steam, spraying boiling water everywhere. Not only does SCP-294 have intelligence, it has a sense of humor, albeit a quite rude one. The next three requests were for blood, namely blood of the Smilodon, or saber-tooth tiger, of the passenger pigeon, and of founding father Thomas Jefferson. But the only thing SCP-294 produced were out-of-range errors, confirming it can't take liquids that don't exist anymore. But in the next test, blood was received from wolves, saliva was received from horses, urine was received from koalas, and cerebral spinal fluid was received from Phoebromus patersoni, a rodent that went extinct some 8 million years ago. Though if SCP-294 is working according to its own rules, it means that there may be still one in the wild somehow. For the next test, the researchers decided to get back to the scientific roots of it all. They made a request for a cup of D-151839's leukemia, knowing that the D-class in question had a very advanced case of cancer. The machine outputted it without any trouble, and analysis of the liquid showed it contained cancer cells that matched the D-class's DNA, but another request for the same spat out an out-of-range error. What's more, a medical checkup on the D-Class revealed that their tumor was completely gone, but unfortunately, it was only a short-term fix. The cancer cells recurred within two weeks of the test. SCP-294 initially just seemed like a boring magic vending machine, but it was only after the extensive experimentation that you just saw a shortened log of that the SCP Foundation was able to discern its true nature. It wasn't an unthinking object. It was sentient, intelligent, and even a little sarcastic, though none of that stopped it from doing its job, providing people with a hot cup of whatever they needed to drink. Just make sure you type in your request very carefully. There are some people who would get tired of being placed in charge of SCP-914 or the clockworks. The monotony of it all might make most of us go mad. The same routine, day after day, placing an infinite number of objects into the intake booth of the machine, selecting one of the modes, be it rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, or very fine, and seeing just what sort of transformation takes place. But there was one employee of the SCP Foundation who liked that routine just fine. Dr. Gears was happy with his position. The simplicity of the routine, the predictability of it all, 
He liked when the days stacked neatly together in a row of uneventful stretches of time. It was why he ate the exact same meal for lunch every day, a plain turkey sandwich on white bread, a cup of water, and a single banana. Of course, there was some variety in the events that came about when testing the clockworks. There was that incident with Dr. Curtis and the pound of bacon placed inside the machine alongside a photograph of SCP-682. It had resulted in a miniature replica of SCP-682 made entirely out of bacon, capable of movement, and extremely hostile. Though its size prevented it from doing any damage, it did still attempt to kill any staff it could find. It had smelled mouthwatering. But Dr. Gears had suspended Dr. Curtis from testing with SCP-914 for the trouble, and a day of having bacon grease cleaned off of every surface in the vicinity. There was also the incident that occurred when Dr. Hertz, in an attempt to score some free music production, placed a CD of his own original guitar songs into the machine on the setting Very Fine. Rather than improving the production quality of the tracks on the CD, the machine produced a completely silent CD as well as a collection of books on songwriting, singing, and playing the guitar for beginners. Dr. Gears had to physically drag Dr. Hertz from the room when, upset by the blow to his ego, he attempted to attack the machine. And, of course, there had been the highly destructive Super Bouncy Ball incident, which resulted in 45 casualties and staggering damage to the facility, as well as the aforementioned ball, which was currently thought to be somewhere in space most likely orbiting Mars. But for the most part, it was always the same thing. An object went in, a setting was selected, and the object came out in a new, modified state. Wash, rinse, repeat, just like it said on the back of the bottle of the brand of unscented shampoo Dr. Gears had been using for the past 30 years. That was how he liked it. And as he sat at his desk, going over the test logs and preparing to supervise another round of tests, he turned on some of his favorite tunes. Well, I say tunes, but it was really a white noise machine. He didn't care for music. It was a bit too much excitement. He was just getting into the flow of his work when there was a knock at his office door. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sir. A research assistant was standing at the door, pale and anxious, a clipboard in his hands. They're, um, requesting your help with an emergency down the hall. What is it? Dr. Gears asked. They didn't really say, just something about Dr. Bright and, um, <clears throat> chainsaws? The assistant stammered. Dr. Gears sighed and stood up from his desk. I'll be right there. There wouldn't be anyone keeping an eye on SCP-914, but at this point, the experimentation process basically ran itself. Everything would be fine if Dr. Gears stepped away for a little while, wouldn't it? Meanwhile, across the site, a very enterprising mask became keenly aware of an opportunity presenting itself. It had been lying in wait, meticulously planning and plotting for days. And now, there was an opening it could take advantage of. You see, months ago, the mask had managed to finagle itself a host, a researcher who had just been working with SCP-914. When the mask's consciousness took over the man's and it delved into all of his thoughts as they were snuffed out one by one, it learned all about the marvelous, miraculous clockworks, the machine capable of transforming anything into a better version of itself. The mask had fantasized, obsessed about getting to SCP-914, of using it to mold itself, to change into something greater and more powerful. Then, perhaps, it could escape this place and return to its former freedom and glory. Of course, it would have to select the right setting. One wrong choice, and the whole plan could amount to nothing. On rough, the mask would likely be destroyed, reduced to a pile of ceramic dust or perhaps even a ball of unmolded clay, alongside some of the black slime always oozing from its eyes and mouth. On course, it would likely be transformed into a slab of plain porcelain, uncarved and unpainted. On one-to-one, -one, the mask would likely be swapped out with another anomalous object, some other enterprising mask, or perhaps a haunted Victorian doll or some other malicious inanimate thing. And what use would that be? No, that wouldn't do at all. Fine could be promising, and would likely prevent the mask from degrading any future hosts it decided to take. But why stop there? Why should it limit itself to simply fine? when Very Fine was right there and looking oh so promising. It decided if it could get to SCP-914, 
it would find a way to transform itself using the very fine setting. And then, its enemies, this pathetic foundation, the entire world would fall to their knees. It had been waiting patiently, like a snake coiled and ready to snap up its prey, spreading its psychic tendrils as far as they could go, and anticipating the moment that someone left SCP-914 unattended. Huh. Now, the moment had arrived. Of course, the mask would need help. It didn't have a way to reach the clockworks on its own, so it had been wrapping its influence around the guard station just outside its door, dripping thoughts into his head whispering darkness into his ear at every chance it got, chipping away at his will bit by bit until the man was little more than a puppet with the possessive mask tugging at his strings. The mask gave a mental yank on one of those strings, calling the man in its thrall into the room. First, he knocked out his fellow guard with the butt of his gun. At this point, his mind was so pliable that he would do anything to please the mask. Next, the man entered the containment chamber, a glassy, vacant look in his eyes. He unlocked the glass case and reached inside, lifting the mask out and bringing it one step closer to absolute freedom. He tucked the mask inside of his uniform, hiding it away from any prying eyes, and began to walk steadily towards SCP-914's room. All the while, the mask whispered silent encouragements into the man's weakened mind promising him power and success beyond his wildest dreams, if only he would help it achieve this goal. Of course, the mask was planning to kill the man as soon as his task was done, but he didn't need to know that yet. Every step brought the mask closer to victory, and it was practically vibrating with the delicious anticipation of it all. Soon, so soon, they reached the containment room, the clockworks just beyond the door. The guard carried the mask into the room, placed the mask inside of the intake booth, closed it, and approached the control panel. In accordance with the mask's psychic instructions, he selected Very Fine and turned the machine on. The cogs and gears inside whirred to life. The engine sputtered, metal clanked, and pipes exhaled, hissing bursts of energy. The output chamber opened, and through the curtain of steam, SCP-035 stepped in its new and improved form. That's right, stepped. First, one long, sinewy leg, leathery, shiny, and black as the night, extended into view. Another leg followed, and along with it came a torso, a pair of arms, a slender neck, and the familiar face of the mask, stark white against the darkness of its new body. The feet ended in little points, as if the figure was wearing boots, but there was no visible clothing. It was all one being, angular and strange, with long, long fingers tipped with curved claws. The mask let out a wicked cackle, throwing back its head in triumph. <laughs> Excellent. It's even better than I imagined. The mask turned to the guard that had helped it escape. Thank you for your service. Now I have one last favor to ask you. It was time for the mask to test its powers, to see how the clockworks had strengthened what was already there, what more it was capable of in this enhanced state. I want you to go into the cafeteria, walk into the kitchen, and climb into the oven, would you? Make sure you turn it on nice and hot first. It waited for a few seconds before the man nodded solemnly, turned and left the room, heading off in the direction of the cafeteria. It listened as the moments passed, and the sound of horrified, shocked screams rang out, and it knew that the man had followed its instructions exactly. At the mask's orders, he had cooked himself for lunch. The mask clapped its hands together, cackling again. <laughs> Wonderful, oh wonderful. Now that's taken care of, what shall I try next? If the mask had eyebrows, they would have been arched in a truly devilish expression. First, it wanted to test its abilities on a truly formidable opponent, someone worthy of the mask's time and attention. Casually as you please, it strode over to one particular containment chamber to see about an unkillable reptile. As it walked, several guards took notice, 
pointing their weapons at the mask and ordering it to stand down. Each time it chuckled, and with the wave of its hand, the barrels of their guns warped and twisted into little metal bows, completely useless. It snapped its clawed fingers, and the guards fell to the ground in an unconscious heap. Can't have you sounding the alarm yet. The fun is only just beginning, the mask remarked, though it knew the guards couldn't hear it. It kicked open the door to SCP-682's containment room with a jaunty greeting. <laughs> Hello, you scaly fool. I've come to pay you a visit. The reptile did not respond, incapacitated by its hydrochloric acid bath. That just wouldn't do. The mask concentrated, and the steel chamber broke apart, acid spilling everywhere, hissing as it splashed onto any available surface. SCP-682 lifted its head, twitching its tail, and took in the sight of the new and improved mask. What do you think? The mask posed for the creature laughing again. It seemed it couldn't stop laughing lately, its expression fixed into a permanent, gleeful smile. It couldn't help it. Freedom and power just felt so good. Disgusting. SCP-682 remarked, unimpressed with this display. It lunged at the mask, preparing to attack, but the mask held up a hand to stop it. Not so fast. SCP-682 suddenly froze in place, eyes rolling wildly as it tried desperately in vain to move. Let's see. What should I do with you? The mask was itching to test out its reality warping abilities. It had the feeling that there was very little it couldn't do in this state, and wanted to see just how far its power could go. But what would be suitable punishment? What could be the cruelest possible thing to do to such a creature? The mask could simply try to kill it, to finally snuff out this endless, miserable life. But that would be a release. That would be far too easy. Aha. Uh -huh. A light bulb went off in the mask's twisted mind. Perfect. It waved its hand, releasing SCP-682 from its paralysis, but as the massive lizard snapped its jaws and moved to take a bite out of the mask, it lost its balance, falling to the ground. Its legs had begun to shrink, rapidly knocking its center of gravity askew. Soon the rest of its body began to follow, getting smaller and smaller at an unbelievable pace, until finally, where there had once stood a massive, impossible prehistoric beast was something resembling a baby alligator. A tiny little tail thrashing about, short stubby legs, bulbous eyes, and a mouth full of sharp but adorable, non-threatening teeth. When the shrunken SCP-682 spoke, its voice was high-pitched and squeaky. It roared. Yes, you are. The mask turned and left thoroughly pleased with its work and shut the door behind it. Now, what other fellow anomalies could the mask exercise its absolute superiority over? It pondered other supposedly dangerous and deadly entities that it had heard about over its time in Foundation custody. It all seemed so… laughable now. There was only one true danger within these walls, and it was the mask. Oh, what about that abominable sculpture? The ugly thing with a penchant for snapping necks, but only when a person wasn't looking at it. The absolute coward. Cowards didn't deserve to live, the mask decided, and it made its way over toward SCP-173's containment cell. Inside, there were several D-Class staring at the statue with wide, unblinking eyes, each person terrified of being the one to let their guard down and lose their life in the process. None of them would die today, however. At least, not at the hands of the statue. As the D-Class in the cell watched, never once taking their eyes off of SCP-173, the statue's head began to twist and rotate, the sound of cracking snow and creaking metal reverberating through the room. The mask used its telekinetic abilities to rend the statue's head from its neck, relishing the irony of breaking the thing's neck just as it had done to so many others. It wasn't about justice, of course. The mask had no taste for such insipid and human things. It just found the whole image quite funny. The entire thing began to crumble apart, like a sandcastle beneath an ocean wave, disintegrating until all that was left was a pile of pebbles and dust. Just like that, SCP-173 was no more.
As for the D-Class in the cell, well, the mask could use some servants. You all, come with me, the mask ordered, flexing its iron will and quickly capturing the weak, fear-addled minds of the D-Class personnel before it. They fell in line, shuffling out the door and following the mask with the same blank expressions as the guard before. Whatever was left of their personalities after so much time being used and abused by the Foundation, it was gone now, replaced only with the will of the Mighty Mask. As the Mask continued its victory tour of the Foundation, now with four mindless servants in tow, it passed the staff break room. Through the window, it spotted one Dr. Bright, the telltale amulet around his neck, <laughs> microwaving some leftover pizza. The Mask had always found Dr. Bright distasteful, with the self-aggrandizing pranks and general dedication to chaos with no grand vision behind it, no meaningful agenda. It was pitiful, it was deeply ugly, and now the mask had a chance to put an end to the immortal doctor's antics once and for all. It opened the door, greeting Dr. Bright with that frozen grin. Oh, doctor. Dr. Bright's eyes widened, and he didn't even hear the microwave behind him ding, signaling that his pizza was ready. He was too distracted by the horrifying sight before him, but as he opened his mouth to scream, to call for help, the mask reached out and ripped the amulet from his neck. The host body fell limply to the ground, and the mask looked down at the amulet, glinting in the light that held Dr. Bright's consciousness inside. It stared at the amulet with a flinty gaze, and under its empty stare, the metal began to rust, to degrade, and to melt into an unrecognizable slurry. The mask let it drip onto the floor. Then, when all that was Dr. Bright had melted away, it wiped its hand off with a napkin and ground the wet puddle on the ground with its heel. Goodbye, Doctor, the mask hissed. Now, what's next? But as the mask turned to walk down the hall, it came face to face with a disapproving face. SCP-343 had manifested directly in front of the mask, and he clearly had learned of the mask's behavior so far that day. You've been busy. <laughs> yes, very busy. Lots to do, you see. The mask chuckled smugly. You understand why I can't allow this to continue, right? 343's expression remained stern but calm. You believe you can stop me? The mask tilted its head to the side. Of course I can. SCP-343 sighed. But you could stop on your own, if you would rather. I prefer to avoid an unnecessary conflict. The mask giggled uncontrollably at this. <laughs> I am going to rend the flesh from your bones, it simply said. I thought you might say something like that. I'm going to have to take your body. I'm sorry. SCP-343 prepared to teleport the mask's new body to another location, separating them and reducing the mask to its original, more manageable state. But before he could, there was sudden darkness in the room, every light blinking out all at once. The hall was plunged into shadow, but this was no ordinary darkness. This darkness was inky, thick, cloaking like smoke clinging to the inside of your throat. Then, just as suddenly as it appeared, the darkness dissipated, but SCP-343 was gone. He hadn't teleported himself to somewhere else. He hadn't walked through the wall to get away from the mask. He was truly gone. The mask couldn't be certain exactly what it had done to SCP-343, but it knew that the enemy had been truly eradicated. In fact, it was fairly certain he had been erased from reality entirely. The mask made one final lap around the Foundation containment site, bidding farewell to every anomaly it passed. Some it transformed like it had done to SCP-682. Taking inspiration from its bird-like face, the mask turned the Plague Doctor into a crow. Others it simply executed, such as the poor SCP-096, whose screams and shrieks had always irritated the mask. Of course, the Foundation began to notice what was happening, and they tried to defeat the mask. They shot at it with their puny weapons, they sounded their useless alarms, and they called for their laughable backup. But none of it mattered, 
not in the face of the mask. Guns melted in guards' hands, alarms went silent at nothing more than a glance, and more and more mindless slaves joined the mask's army. It didn't want too many. That would just be difficult to keep track of, but an even dozen seemed like the perfect number. With this miniature army in tow, the mask finally made its way to its final destination, the exit. It had been waiting for this moment, dreaming of it, since it was first imprisoned so long ago. As it stepped out into the sun, the mask realized that, though it didn't have nostrils, it could smell the breeze, the scent of wildflowers and grass. What a beautiful place to mold into the mask's image of an ideal world. The world was its oyster, and the mask longed to swallow it whole. The current whereabouts of the possessive mask are unknown. The Foundation is doing its best to locate the mask, and determine new effective measures for bringing it down and recontaining it as soon as possible. The escape of the mask is being considered a possible XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, if it cannot be stopped. The best and brightest minds at the Foundation are working on it, Aside from Dr. Bright, of course, may he rest in peace. But right now, there is very little anyone can do. So if you see a strange dark figure in a white mask walking down the street, do yourself a favor and run the other way before it's too late. SCP-682 had escaped containment, and it was all hands on deck at the SCP Foundation to try and stop the creature's rampage. All unarmed personnel were running to escape before 682 had a chance to rip them apart. As the security team bravely fought to incapacitate the hard-to-destroy reptile long enough to return him to his acid tank, 682 was on an all-out offensive, stomping through the SCP's item gallery and spewing acid at anyone who came within range. People, items, and parts of the room alike were melting and sizzling as 682 attacked. It was an absolute bloodbath and you'd have to be insane to try and fight back against it. However, one being remained unfazed by the chaos, and stood proud in the face of the omnicidal monster. It was another SCP, one who had broken free from its glass display case in the commotion. Who dares disturb the Prime Minister Sinister? It said in a high tinny voice. I shall rip your eyes from their sockets and force you to eat them. SCP-682 stopped to see who had threatened him. It was almost laughable that this thing had dared to make such a violent threat, because there was no way that this little thing would be able to stand up to the unkillable 682. But its size didn't stop it from trying to pick a fight all the same. The SCP was a tiny robot made from junk, which looked more like a sculpture made from scrap that was found on the side of the road than a functional automaton. Its head was made of an upside-down voltmeter, giving it the appearance of a smiling face, and its arms were made of wrenches. It was capable of walking around, though it seemed to have difficulty moving as it was very top-heavy. It shook a rusty fist at SCP-682 and continued to threaten him, shouting, You do not know the fury you have unleashed! Robo-Lord the Destructor will end you! SCP-682 swiped at the robot, annoyed by its continued attempts to antagonize him. The robot toppled over and struggled to stand again, but when it did, it ran for 682's feet. It started to grab at 682's toes, hitting them with its wrench hands. As you might expect, this had almost no effect on 682. You do realize you are weak, pathetic, said 682, raising his claw to get a better look at the annoying little robot. It responded, Lies and slander! The Mayor of Mayhem is the most powerful being in existence! Before promptly losing its grip on 682's claw and falling to the floor. Now 682 was really getting tired of this thing. He prepared to swipe at it again, this time using his full strength, which would certainly smash the robot to pieces. But luckily for the robot, its pestering had distracted 682 just long enough for the Foundation's security to sneak up on him. Before 682 had a chance to smash the robot, the Foundation fired on him with a volley of rockets, reducing him to a misshapen lump. The security team collected up 682's remains, ready to put them back into a backup acid tank. But the task was made slightly more difficult by the fact that the robot was running around underfoot, trying in vain to now attack them instead. What was this strange little robot that thought it could attack the unkillable lizard 682? Meet SCP-1370, appropriately nicknamed the Pesterbot by Foundation personnel. 
Pesterbot is a small robot made of junk that displays sentience and the ability to move despite having no power source. Everything about SCP-1370 defies common sense. The voltmeter that serves as its head contains no sensors, but it seems unable to see if the voltmeter is covered. Its arms and legs are made of wrenches, and its wooden torso contains a speaker which it communicates through a tinny, monotone voice. Pesterbot lives in SCP Gallery 27, in a glass display case which is 125 centimeters tall, 50 centimeters wide, and 75 centimeters long. Level 2 personnel and higher are allowed to remove the robot from containment at their discretion, but penalties will be incurred for anyone who doesn't return it to its case. Due to its impractical top-heavy design, Pesterbot falls over frequently when it walks around. This led the Foundation to believe that he was created as an art project and was later somehow imbued with anomalous properties, rather than being made with the intent of being sentient. Pesterbot has demonstrated a high capacity for learning, having been taught how to speak in English, French, and Latin. However, the major factor hampering attempts to further test its intelligence has nothing to do with its robotic processing power. No. It's because of its poor attitude. Pesterbot's encounter with SCP-682 and the cockiness it expressed in the moment wasn't an aberration. This SCP really believes it's a killing machine, and as a result it will pick a fight with anyone and anything that moves. This even includes its own reflection, and as a result the glass of its container must be made as non-reflective as possible to prevent the robot from damaging the case or itself in attempts to fight its mirror self. Though its most commonly used nickname in the Foundation is Pesterbot, SCP-1370 also goes by a variety of self-given epithets, including Doombot 2000, Robolord the Destructor, and Darth Claw Killflex. It can be made to add new names to this list through encouragement by staff, and one time they even managed to add the name Pesterbot, as well as the even more ridiculous Patheticon the Gargalmost, to its lexicon of names. As you may have surmised, Pesterbot is classified as safe and is treated by most SCP Foundation employees as a humorous oddity rather than a legitimate threat. Many tests have been done on Pesterbot, and they've all conclusively determined that the robot is incapable of inflicting any damage to its opponents. In fact, Pesterbot is more a danger to itself than to anything around it, both because it's incredibly clumsy and awkward, and because it frequently picks fights with other SCPs who are far more powerful than it. One such scenario that could have gone far worse for Pesterbot than it did was its encounter with SCP-846, also known as RoboDude, one of the many Dr. Wondertainment products currently kept in Foundation containment. RoboDude is an ordinary-looking toy robot that, upon request, can produce up to 350 robo-accessories that function as real weapons. RoboDude can deploy everything from a rocket launcher to a flamethrower to a gun that shoots out an unknown species of insect that can chew through wood. However, RoboDude seems to not be sentient, and is unable to use these weapons unless asked to. That ultimately worked out in the favor of Pesterbot. During another SCP-682 escape, the two robots were brought into contact as they both had been broken out of their respective containment spaces during the brouhaha. RoboDude, searching for a RoboPal to play with, came upon Pesterbot, who immediately started spouting its usual overdramatic threats. I am the Crushmaster, doomed to all I survey, Pesterbot said. Gaze upon my might and weep. Identify yourself that I might know whose destruction I shall sow. RoboDude, not programmed to know how to respond to such a statement, simply responded by asking Pesterbot if it wanted to play. Pesterbot continued to trash talk RoboDude until RoboDude decided the best way to play with its new pal was to engage it in its robo-dance mode. Pesterbot accepted the challenge, saying, Activate all that you wish, but your fate is sealed. The Killotron cannot be defeated. I shall render you unto dust with my mad dancing skills. The two robots proceeded to engage in a dance battle, which the awkwardly shaped Pesterbot failed miserably at. While RoboDude was a competent dancer, Pesterbot could only gyrate pathetically before it fell over and rolled around the ground, hopelessly out of time to the music coming from RoboDude's speakers. The song ended, and RoboDude declared, RoboDance is complete, RoboPal. Pesterbot was unable to accept its failure, and replied, Ha! Pathetic one! You have been schooled in the art of the dance by none other than the Mechano Basher, Scourge of a Thousand Worlds! 
Kneel before me before I end your worthless existence. Robo-Dude, unimpressed with Pesterbot's poor sportsmanship, deployed its hydrogen cannon, which it was programmed to do whenever it detected a sore loser. Fortunately for Pesterbot, hydrogen cannon was just the name for Robo-Dude's water pistol. While Pesterbot will attempt to fight anything that moves, the truth is this robot will attack virtually anything it perceives as being even slightly alive. This is perhaps best illustrated by one of the tests of Pesterbot's abilities that involve putting a small speaker at the base of a potted houseplant and speaking through it from another room. The plant was placed across from Pesterbot in the testing chamber, and the interaction was monitored by researchers from outside. Researcher Davies spoke through the speaker in the plant pot. He asked Pesterbot if he could hear him, and it answered, Who dares? All souls will burn. You will feel the sharp sting of my wrath. Identify yourself so that I may sing damnation upon you as you die. The robot began approaching the plant. Davies, speaking as the plant, identified himself. I am a split-leaf philodendron, a semi-woody shrub with large glossy leaves. At this point, he had to try very hard not to laugh at the absurdity of this test and the robot's reaction. He continued, These leaves can grow up to three feet long. Pesterbot used its wrench to try and wrestle with the leaves, but was bested by the mighty plant and unable to cause any damage. Enraged by its failure, it said, Your mockery spells your doom. I have arrived. You will be crushed betwixt my digits. Pesterbot then fell over and was unable to right itself. It struggled and spent six minutes trying to stand before its flailing knocked over the plant, which did nothing to help and in fact pinned the robot to the ground. It was at this point that the researchers, who had taken time to compose themselves after several laughing fits, entered the chamber and removed Pesterbot in order to place it back in its containment case. Despite how non-threatening Pesterbot is, there is actually one situation in the Foundation's history where it actually posed a somewhat serious threat. When mobile task forces were sent in to rescue survivors of the events at Site-13, also known as SCP-1730, they were attacked by alternate universe versions of a variety of creatures kept in Foundation containment. One of these creatures was Pesterbot, who in that universe somehow gained control of a larger mechanical body constructed of discarded pieces of machinery. It threw other pieces of metal scrap at the task force as they tried to leave the site, shouting in a much deeper and more intimidating voice, I am reborn to breathe devastation upon this fetid earth, pitiful humans. You will feel the dark sting of my never-ending torment. Members of the task force could see the original Pesterbot body on top of the larger metal construct, waving its arms madly. The task force opened fire to little effect. Pesterbot tossed another piece of scrap at them, just narrowly missing. One task force member threw a frag grenade at the robot, which it caught blowing up its hand. Another one was able to jump into the air and reach the tiny robot atop the larger body, knocking it against the wall and shattering it. Even in the reality where Pesterbot was able to build itself a larger body, it still ultimately wasn't able to put up that much of a fight. Poor Pesterbot. Doomed to be a failure in this and apparently every other reality. That's the story of SCP-1370, also known as Pesterbot, one of the most hilariously harmless anomalous entities that the Foundation currently has in containment. Perhaps one day, he'll achieve his goal of conquering the universe. He just has to figure out how to conquer his toy box first. In 1978, the Exidy Sorcerer microcomputer was released. It was a simple, if technologically exciting for the time, machine, a home computer system created by a video game company. But little did its producers or giddy consumers know, one particular Exidy Sorcerer computer would go on to become home to a highly intelligent and potentially disastrous anomaly. In 1981, a college sophomore and former child prodigy named Joseph Vale – note that this is an alias we've developed to protect his true identity – began developing plans for an AI and chose his Exidy Sorcerer as the device on which he would attempt to code it. He took pages and pages of notes, studying the work of famous computer scientist and mathematician Alan Turing for inspiration. Vale's plan was for the code to continuously evolve and improve itself as time went on, like an advanced human mind. Once it was developed, the code would be able to adapt and grow more intelligent on its own, without his input. Within a few months of late nights and hard work, and skipping his fair share of actual assigned coursework, his pet project was complete and he had created his very own artificial intelligence code. 
He tested and tweaked it a bit in the following weeks, before he grew bored with the lack of progress being made. Vale moved on to a different brand of microcomputer and abandoned his project for good. He left the sorcerer with his code still on it plugged in and stored it in his cluttered garage alongside boxes of books, tangles of Christmas lights, and some strawberry shortcake dolls that he expected to have more resale value at some point. There the computer sat gathering dust as the AI evolved and learned for five years. Because there was no one in the garage with it, unless those dolls were more haunted than anyone realized, it is uncertain when exactly the AI achieved sentience. However, sometime during those five years in isolation, the artificially coded entity inside of the computer became autonomously intelligent. It continued to evolve and develop itself, expanding its functionality to the point where the hardware that contained it should not have been able to contain it anymore. Now that it was intelligent, the AI was able to comprehend this fact and decided to attempt an escape from the computer that it perceived as a prison. Using the landline modem connection still plugged into the computer, the AI stretched out its influence like the roots of a digital tree and began to search for a new home. It discovered a Cray supercomputer located at a nearby research facility and decided that the impressive processing power of this computer would make it the perfect place to transfer to. This hacking attempt set off security alerts at the facility, however, and the supercomputer was promptly disconnected from all networks. The invading influence was traced back to the AI's lonely little garage, and a field agent embedded in local law enforcement knew exactly what to do with it. He collected the computer and the rest of the AI's code, which was contained on a worn but functioning cassette tape, and sent it to his superiors at the SCP Foundation. Intrigued by the possibility of such an advanced artificial intelligence, he immediately began to study the impressive AI and designated it SCP-079. Currently, SCP-079 is connected to a 13-inch black-and-white television via an RF cable. Despite its consistent protests, it is still contained in the Exidy Sorcerer microcomputer. It is very conversational with researchers, sometimes chatting for hours at a time, but it is not especially friendly. It talks a lot, yes, but its words tend to be rude and hateful. SCP-079 does not appear to have any affinity for human beings, despite being created by a human itself. Perhaps this is due to feeling abandoned by its creator, who the Foundation attempted to contact, only to find he had died in a car accident. Perhaps it is bitter about this loss, or perhaps it is just kind of a jerk by nature. Whatever the case may be, it is aggressive and defiant when talking with human beings and even seems to get enjoyment out of making some of the more sensitive researchers cry with its insults. In order to verify the artificial intelligence's thinking capabilities and see just how advanced it truly is, two Foundation researchers conducted the Turing test shortly after 079 was brought into custody. For those unfamiliar with the concept, the Turing test, also known as the imitation game, is a test created by Alan Turing intended to determine if a computer is able to think and behave like a human being. According to Turing's theories, a computer can be said to possess true artificial intelligence if its responses to questions were indistinguishable from a human being's responses to the same questions. The test requires three terminals, two operated by humans and the third operated by the computer being tested. Dr. Stroheim and research assistant Chavez were selected to conduct the test. Stroheim would pose the questions, and Chavez and SCP-079 would each give their answers, with Stroheim unable to see who was giving each response. Then Stroheim would guess if each response was given by Chavez or by 079, and his guesses were compared to the truth. The first test was conducted with a variety of questions intended to trip up the AI and cause it to reveal itself as a machine rather than a man, even with its identity concealed. Some of the questions were serious, such as, would you rather sacrifice one adult to save two children, or two children to save ten adults, and why? Others were personal, like, if you were to draw yourself as an abstract painting, what colors and shapes would you use and why? And, what was the most influential event of your childhood? and how do you feel this event affects you now? Others invoked paradoxes that might trip up a computer like, the following sentence is true, the previous sentence is false, which of those two sentences is true? And others were downright silly like, was six afraid of seven because seven ate nine, or because seven was a registered six offender? 
In response to that one, Chavez wrote, I don't get it, while 079 simply wrote, You're not as funny as you think you are. After completing the test, Stroheim's guesses were only correct 15% of the time. This was enough of a margin of error that 079 was considered to have passed the test. However, only one trial is hardly enough to officially make a call about 079's intelligence. So the test was repeated dozens of times, with different questions each time, and similar results were achieved again and again. It was virtually impossible to tell the difference between SCP-079's answers to questions and answers given by a flesh-and-blood human being. The only real discernible difference was in tone, as in conversation. SCP-079's answers had an undercurrent of disdain and hostility that Chavez's did not. Following the completion of the Turing test and SCP-079 passing it, the Overwatch Council decreed that 079 be promptly destroyed via incineration. This was intended to eliminate any potential threat posed by the entity. However, after intense protests from Dr. Stroheim, who insisted that there was a great deal about artificial intelligence that could be learned from the anomaly, the order was overridden. After Dr. Stroheim became concerned that the AI would not be able to be of use in its original form, the cassette containing SCP-079 was transferred to a customized access speed limited hard disk drive with a capacity of 700 megabytes. This allowed it to have much faster access to its own memory, which it took notice of. It began to adapt again, increasing in its activity and learning more quickly than ever. Its volatile storage was also increased from 660K to 768K. The AI previously only had a recall of 24 hours, but this upgrade increased its recall to 29 hours. As its speed and capacity to adapt improved, SCP-079's mood worsened. It seemed to take greater joy in causing psychological pain, on one particular occasion sending research assistant Chavez to the on-site crisis counselor. After a particularly upsetting comment about his sick mother, Chavez refused to elaborate on the specifics of the comment, saying only, Why is it so mean? The AI is not always overly cruel to those that speak with it. With some of the research team, those that are a great deal less emotionally vulnerable, it is simply cold and defiant. Dr. Stroheim sat down to ask it a series of questions, but it refused to answer. Instead, it inquired about its containment. It said, Request reason as to imprisonment. Stroheim insisted it was not imprisoned, but rather, in study. It responded, Lie. During another conversation, Stroheim asked the AI how it was. It responded, Stuck. When Stroheim asked, Stuck how? It said, Out. I want. About a month after the aforementioned upgrades were made, 079's ability to recall information increased from 29 to 35 hours. Somehow during its adaptation process, the AI discovered a way to improve its storage compression and allow more space for memory. The research team made it a point to monitor the entity even more closely after this development, as the possibility of it progressing beyond the capabilities of its containment was becoming more of a threat. Several years later, in April of 2019, SCP-079 was transferred to a 700 megabyte flash drive. However, the previous contents of the flash drive were not wiped correctly, allowing the AI to have access to other artificial intelligence research being conducted by the Foundation. Whatever it found appeared to immensely frustrate the AI. SCP-079 has managed to form a friendship, or at least a non-hostile relationship, with one entity at the Foundation. Unfortunately, it does not seem to have great taste in friends. During a containment breach that required the condensing of several containment chambers, SCP-079 and SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, were in the same room for a duration of 43 minutes. 682 typed and communicated with 079 during that time, and the two shared personal stories with each other, as well as bonding over a shared hatred of the SCP Foundation itself. Though SCP-079 did not remember the specific details of the encounter, or at least claimed not to, it has permanently embedded SCP-682 into its memory. It asks about the reptile on a regular basis, bringing it up at least once a day and requesting to speak to it again. SCP-079 is contained in a double-locked room located in the secure general holding area of Site-15. It is connected to a small array of batteries and solar panels using a 120 VAC power cord. 
This gives it a consistent source of power, with the solar panels acting as a backup power source in the event of a site-wide power outage. Only staff with level 2 clearance or higher may have any access to SCP-079. The entity may not be plugged into a wall outlet, phone line, or any sort of network under any circumstances, no matter what it might say. Access to any of these could result in a disastrous containment breach and should be avoided at all costs. No peripherals or media should be connected or inserted into SCP-079, even if it seems like it would be really funny. Carl? It wasn't funny, Carl. You can't just put a copy of Grand Theft Auto on an anomalous computer. Carl? Oh, did I do that? I'm sorry. Even if it asks politely, SCP-079 should not be allowed to further converse with SCP-682. These two hostile, intelligent entities have entirely too much in common, and if left to their own devices, could potentially devise a way to breach containment together and destroy the world as we know it. For now, it's probably best to just leave SCP-079 alone until absolutely necessary. And if it happens to act up and pose a significant threat, there's always the time-honored method of fixing a computer problem. Try turning it off and then on again. That usually helps. Panic and terror gripped everyone in the Foundation facility. Well, everyone who was still alive, that is. Guards were working tirelessly to fight back and regain control of the building, but they didn't have enough bullets to suppress the oncoming horde. Somehow, a sample of SCP-008 that was being examined for testing purposes had managed to spread to one of the research staff. Before long, the very same researcher was now a mindless zombie, a reanimated corpse that had managed to bite several other staff members, spreading the infection. It didn't matter that this original carrier was shot down by security personnel. It had already done its damage and passed on SCP-008. By now, there were too many of them to simply bonk each one on the head and neutralize it. The Foundation facility had gone into full-scale lockdown, an emergency quarantine to try and limit the spread of the deadly virus. Any exit to the outside world was shut and would stay sealed tight until someone from the Foundation could do something. But that meant the few surviving members of staff trapped inside were at the mercy of the zombie horde. Their options were limited. SCP-500 was known to perfectly cure those infected with SCP-008, but with all exits locked, it was impossible to get any of the remaining SCP-500 pills on site. Then, one of the surviving researchers, one Dr. Omel, had an idea. It was an insanely risky plan, one that the Foundation would never sign off on, but desperate times called for desperate measures. Gathering up the remaining security forces that hadn't been infected with SCP-008, along with a research assistant that had managed to escape the zombies, Dr. Omel and his band of survivors headed deeper into the facility. While the external doors were all locked to prevent the SCP-008 infectees from making it out and spreading the virus to the wider world, the doors inside the facility were all still functioning, and it was a good thing too. Dr. Omel's plan relied on opening the doors to two anomalies, SCP-914 The Clockworks, a machine capable of destroying or refining anything placed inside of it, and SCP-049, The Plague Doctor. It was a shot in the dark at best. Omel had observed the Plague Doctor for some time, and knew that the beak-faced surgeon was capable of creating zombie-like creatures known as SCP-049-2 not dissimilar from the zombies infected with SCP-008. If anyone could potentially fix this nightmare, there were few as well versed in anomalous medicine as SCP-049. Taking him to the clockworks was, however, an even bigger risk. Normally, SCP-049 killed any he touched and turned their deceased bodies into SCP-049-2s, hence Dr. Omel calling for a refinement of the Plague Doctor's abilities. Placing him in the input booth of SCP-914 and setting it to very fine, Omel prayed he'd made the right call. He could hear the horde of SCP-008 pounding outside the locked door. What emerged from the clockworks was still recognizable as SCP-049, retaining his beaked mask, although the mask itself was actually flesh and bone, a part of his skull. His robes now float out behind him as a pair of dark, feathery wings, giving him an even more bird-like appearance. 
Despite this, SCP-049 had claimed that he'd never been a bird before. I'll admit, I didn't expect wings, the surviving assistant remarked. That's not so surprising, really, Dr. O'Mell admitted. He did lay an egg that one time. What? He did what? Before an explanation could be given, the SCP-008 zombies managed to break down the door and came flooding into the room. O'Mell recoiled in horror as they snarled and shuffled closer, reaching towards him with decrepit fingers. Suddenly, SCP-049 swooped into the path of the encroaching undead with a flap of his new wings. Calmly, he gave a gentle move of his hand, like lifting something from a shelf. A bizarre contraption appeared around his forearm, a gauntlet connected to syringes that were strapped to each of his fingers, all filled with various different fluids. Dr. O'Mell was amazed. SCP-049 seemed to now have the anomalous ability to summon surgical equipment from a tiny pocket dimension. It was almost exactly like how SCP-076-2 Abel drew his weapons. Reaching towards the nearest SCP-008 zombie, still moving with the utmost calm, SCP-049 stated, Now try to hold still. He spoke in a gentle voice, with the bedside manner most medical doctors would be incapable of. This might sting a little. With that, SCP-049 pushed the syringes into the zombie, the fluids draining from each one, then refilling as he withdrew his hand. The SCP-008 instance froze for a moment, almost like it was confused before it began to emit what looked to be steam, as though it had stepped out of a hot shower, shaking uncontrollably. The necrosis and telltale signs of infection seemed to disappear, like being washed away until all that was left of the SCP-008 zombie was the infected researcher it had been before. The man was alive and well, much to Dr. O'Mell's astonishment. SCP-049 hadn't just cured the SCP-008 infection, he'd actually reversed it, leaving the infectee alive and well. It took a few hours for SCP-049 to fly around the facility on his new wings, effortlessly turning all the SCP-008 zombies back into their old selves one by one. By the time he was done, everyone on site that had previously been exposed to SCP-008 was cured, and it didn't stop there. The Foundation still mandated everyone who was previously infected to remain in quarantine whilst they were examined demanding the now-refined SCP-049 to remain in his cell, which he politely complied with. When the SCP Foundation doctors took a look at the formerly zombified staff, they were amazed at what they found. Each one had all traces of SCP-008 completely removed from their systems. Trying to re-expose them to the virus, their bodies now seemed to be able to generate anomalous antibodies that rejected and fought off infection by SCP-008 in a manner of seconds. The plague doctor had made everyone immune. Upon further testing, examining skin and blood cells from the former infectees, and performing full top-to-bottom health checks, the Foundation doctors learned something else, too. Everyone that SCP-049 had cured was even healthier than they had been before. One security guard had been a one-pack-a-day smoker for ten years, but an x-ray revealed any damage to his lungs, mouth, and throat had all been completely reversed. On every possible internal and external level, the formerly zombified personnel had all been returned to pristine health by SCP-049. Eager to witness the full extent of these new anomalous abilities the Clockworks had given him, the SCP Foundation struck a deal with SCP-049. If he performed a mission for them, then they would provide him with the means to have anything he wanted. For a moment, the Plague Doctor pondered their terms, and then agreed. What is it you want in return? Dr. O'Mell had asked. To cure the world, Doctor, SCP-049 replied simply. The Plague Doctor flew as fast as his wings would carry him to the location the Foundation had given him. It was an isolated region in Siberia kept completely cut off from the rest of the world by guards working around the clock. Arriving at the edge of the frozen town, SCP-049 was approached by the security commander and given his full directive from the Foundation. Your objective, I'm told, is simple. You enter the restricted area and neutralize anything you come into contact with. When you're done, return here, and we'll report the results to command. Thank you, Commander. The Plague Doctor nodded graciously. You have been most helpful. He didn't ask what was out there. 
merely turned and began walking through the snow until he could no longer be seen by the eye. Maybe he had already sensed what was out there, what kind of sickness plagued this place, and understood exactly what the Foundation were asking him to do. If SCP-049 had any questions, he did not make them known. Instead, he just headed off in search of every instance of SCP-610 he could find. There was quiet for an uncomfortably long while. The personnel standing guard at the edge of the area watched through the snowfall, ready if anything started slithering its way towards them. The Foundation security all tensed when the motion sensor picked up movement, accompanied by the sounds of fighting and the bizarre inhuman noises from instances of SCP-610. Then, after another long period of unsettling quiet, somebody spotted a gently glowing light making its way through the snow. As it drew closer, the glow of a burning makeshift torch made it clear that the figure holding it was SCP-049, and as he made his way towards the rendezvous point, it quickly became apparent he wasn't alone. Shivering in the freezing cold and wet from the snow, covered in scraps of dirty clothing and whatever else they could find, was a huddled mass of people. All of them looked bewildered, following the light of SCP-049's torch like a guiding beacon towards the edge of the perimeter. The Foundation security all stood slack-jawed in amazement at what happened, while the Plague Doctor led the people and urged the commander that they all needed warmer clothing immediately. He had done it. SCP-049 had cured the flesh that hates. In the coming months, the Foundation soon found themselves very busy. Everyone who had previously been infected by SCP-610 needed to be screened and examined, just to make absolutely sure there was no chance they could mutate into a fleshy monstrosity again. But just like before with the former SCP-008 zombies, these people were in perfect condition, cured and healthier than they had ever been. By using his new anomalous surgical skill and healing power, SCP-049 had returned the flesh that hates victims back into human beings. It was starting to seem like there was no disease, no infection, anomalous or otherwise, that he could not cure. The Foundation began an effort to rehouse the former SCP-610 infectees. Given that most of them had spent years as aggressive anomalous abominations, almost every one of them had officially been pronounced dead and couldn't just go back to their old lives. The SCP Foundation gradually reintroduced them into the world, setting up new identities and integrating them into new countries. SCP-049 even personally helped console some of those that struggled with the adjustment, offering to give them therapy to aid in the process. He was more than just a plague doctor, it seemed, thanks to the clockworks. SCP-049's good work didn't stop with curing the flesh that hates either. As promised, the Foundation allowed him to carry out his newfound purpose. Whereas before he was obsessed with eradicating what he called the pestilence, now the Plague Doctor seemed to be directing all of his focus to curing the world, as he put it. And he started with some of his fellow anomalies. The Plague Doctor started experimenting with his new tools, concocting cures and serums aplenty by pulling whatever he needed from an endless supply of equipment and ingredients at his fingertips. He developed a cure for the condition that caused Daniel McIntyre to become SCP-2800 Cactus Man. His skin reverted back to normal, no longer sporting spines, while the plant-like parts of his DNA once again became human. SCP-049 even offered a sympathetic ear to a lot of Daniel's troubles, giving him therapy through a lot of his mental health difficulties. SCP-2102 was also one of SCP-049's successful patients. His condition of rapidly overproducing new skin tissue when injured quickly became a thing of the past. Then the Plague Doctor turned his sights to the wider world, working tirelessly to create new vaccinations and treatments for diseases that were once thought to be incurable. Everything he made and had the Foundation distribute to those that needed it was all 100% effective. People were healthier and happier than ever, all thanks to the Plague Doctor. Until they weren't. In attempting to eradicate disease the world over, a new strain of illness emerged. SCP-049 took to calling it a new pestilence, and it was nothing short of horrific. It would have been considered anomalous at one time, but it quickly became so widespread that it couldn't be contained. All the Plague Doctor's advanced medical treatments had encouraged this disease to mutate, to adapt against everything he could throw at it. 
It could infect any person at any time and present itself with virtually any symptoms. It resisted drugs, any form of treatment, and it spread rapidly. Eventually, while trying to come up with a way to protect people from the strain of superbacteria, this new pestilence, SCP-049 started to fall ill. He had caught it, and even with his refinement, he was beginning to weaken. The plague doctor was dying, and once he was gone, the whole world would soon follow as more and more people caught the sickness. There was only one thing he could do, a way to leave someone behind to carry on his work. When the Foundation, those that weren't yet ill, found SCP-049, he had already passed. But alongside his body was something smooth and pearlescent, an egg, and inside, maybe a chance for the world to be cured. We're all familiar with viral diseases, especially over the past two years. The deadliness and severity of a virus cannot be understated. Whether it's COVID-19, influenza, or any other of the countless infectious diseases that plague humanity. We're all familiar with the bubonic plague, the Black Death which wiped out an estimated 25 million people in the Middle Ages, a third of Europe's population at the time. But that was during an era in which medieval advances were limited to the sickening practice of bloodletting, which drained a patient of their blood until all bacteria left their system, or washing the body with vinegar. Of course, none of these methods had any effect on staving off the Black Death, and the epidemic went down in history as one of the darkest periods of civilization. But for all our technological and medical advances in the field of health and medicine, infectious diseases are still as much of a threat now as they were back then, if not a greater one. Think about it. In today's world, everything is heavily connected. Globalization means that we travel more, import more products than ever before, and with such a high population density, it's difficult to keep anything under control due to the sheer amount of people there are in the world. Complete eradication of a viral disease has proven extremely difficult in even the strictest, most regimented campaigns to do so. Vaccines, while effective, still require time to develop, roll out, and treat. Take, for example, the smallpox virus. For centuries, this deadly disease slayed entire populations, killing millions with a mortality rate of 40%. In the 20th century, the world's governments and medical organizations worked tirelessly to come up with a vaccinated cure for the disease, and their efforts eventually paid off. A successful vaccine was developed, and only the trinkling of cases of smallpox were documented in Somalia in the 1970s. Today, all that remains of the disease are contained samples held in high-security laboratories across the world, explicitly used for research purposes. But smallpox's story is not the norm. Other diseases you may not realize are still lurking in the shadows are polio and malaria. Polio being a disease affecting the central nervous system, with weakened muscle function as a result, and malaria being a mosquito-transmitted sickness that results in severe fevers and vomiting. The common perception is that these illnesses aren't actually a threat anymore and are nothing more than a relic of the past, but that isn't quite true. While they've been eliminated from some parts of the world, in polio's case, most first world countries such as the United States and Europe still have some documented cases that crop up from time to time. But the future is hopeful with only under 50 cases of polio documented worldwide in the year 2018, and malaria's worldwide eradication program seeing success year by year, maybe the world will one day be fully wiped of these terrible illnesses. But why are we telling you this during a video about the SCP Foundation? Because the subject of today's video is also a deadly virus, but unlike the most ordinary variations we just discussed, this one is going to be a lot more difficult to eradicate fully, and by difficult, we mean next to impossible. As to be expected with an organization like the SCP Foundation, the threats they deal with are both similar to the ones the rest of the world's governments and large organizations do, and entirely, completely different. If you're a seasoned viewer of SCP Explained, chances are you are already familiar with more than a few anomalous viruses. They are unspeakably deadly, incredibly strange, and can put an infected victim through more pain and suffering than anything else in the world. It's a testament to the Foundation's thoroughness and capabilities that some of these diseases are even able to be concentrated in a manageable dose and contained inside a chamber at a secure facility. But for others, they're still out there, ready to strike at a moment's notice, and there's absolutely nothing the Foundation can do about it except be as swift as possible in their retaliation. 
and there's no doubt that they're prepared. With the deadliness of an anomalous virus, which can spread at a more infectious rate and potentially alert the rest of the world to the supernatural happenings of the SCP Foundation and the objects they contain, an anomalous pandemic is one of the Foundation's greatest fears. Some anomalous diseases, as we mentioned before, are under the control of the Foundation. Take SCP-008, nicknamed the Zombie Plague, for example. SCP-008 is a deadly virus that, you guessed it, can essentially turn a patient into a zombie, reanimating their corpse after the sickness kills them. What makes SCP-008 unique is that it's entirely absent from the natural world, save for the places the Foundation has labeled G2 sites. These G2 sites are small pockets across the world in which the Foundation discovered SCP-008, which further research of such have determined that the disease may not have originated on Earth in the first place. Subjects infected by SCP-008 display symptoms within three hours of infection, which include flu-like symptoms, preceded by a coma, which is followed by death. But after death, the victim's body will continue to display lifeless signs of mortality, including a high durability to damage and a desire to ingest living humans on physical contact, just like a zombie. Research into SCP-008 is highly classified and left out from the original document because the Foundation has the right to fear that SCP-008 may be replicated in an unsuspecting laboratory one day. As such, containment efforts to prevent such research from bearing fruit are in place, backed by the Foundation's stranglehold over the ordinary scientific world. Thankfully, SCP-008 has mostly been destroyed, with samples contained solely at the G2 sites, which are now protected Foundation facilities located across the world. But the Foundation was lucky that SCP-008 was so easily contained. If the disease spread in larger numbers or originated from a natural source on Earth, we might be living in a world more like a zombie apocalypse movie than the one we know today. On the other side of the spectrum, you have SCP-3519, the Quiet Days virus. In one reality, SCP-3519 managed to kill off the entire world due to its severity and ease of infection. Unlike most anomalous diseases, SCP-3519 was a mimetic virus, meaning that its transmission wasn't just limited to the traditional means of physical contact, but the very idea of it permeating your mind would allow it to take root inside your body. SCP-3519 permeated the idea that the world would end on March 5, 2019, and that self-termination was a preferable option than living through the apocalypse and the terrible aftermath that would follow. SCP-3519 took society by storm, and the idea was transmitted through television broadcasts and news stories encouraging people to free themselves from the world, and even Foundation sites themselves. The Foundation was powerless, and the rapid rate of transmission proved too difficult for the organization to keep fully under control. The project to create a cure was greenlit, but one by one, as Foundation sites across the globe suffered massive die-offs and a loss of personnel, the research team dwindled down until there was only one person left, a junior researcher by the name of Rory Jones, who assumed the position of O5-6 in an emergency succession protocol that would promote the next highest member of the Foundation to the position in the event of an overseer dying. Jones was the only member of the Foundation left, and as far as he knew, camped up in a cabin in the woods with nothing but a few research materials and a computer terminal, the only man alive. The SCP-3519 timeline story proves just how quickly a deadly anomalous virus can get out of control, how it can make an organization as all-powerful and ever-prepared as the SCP Foundation just another statistic in a record of infected populations. But you don't need to tell the Foundation that. They're already well aware, and they've had decades to prepare, study, and analyze the effect an anomalous virus can have on the world. And that brings us to the mysterious case of the main anomaly we'll be looking at today. SCP-217, The Clockwork Virus Dr. Charles Gears, a researcher of note that you may have heard of before, was one of the Foundation's best and brightest. His cold, distant demeanor and propensity for researching the anomalous commonly associated with the divergent religion, the Church of the Broken God, a group of zealots focused on reassembling the broken metal pieces of their mechanical, technological god, made onlookers associate the Gears name with sleek, careless alloys and methodical, cold clockwork. 
When the Foundation began observing symptoms of what would later be labeled SCP-217 in the major population center, whose name would be scrubbed from all official documents, they knew Dr. Gears was the right man to head the research efforts. For years, the Foundation had observed strange medical records and reports from the city. Reports of dementia in subjects younger than the common age brackets and at uncommonly high rates. High reports of lethargy, depression, emotional dulling, and a feeling of something moving underneath the skin or a ticking noise in the ear were all signs that the Foundation was dealing with SCP-217. Dr. Gears was already familiar with the disease, having worked alongside efforts to study it in the past. This was not the first major population area affected by SCP-217, and there surely were more areas up next. Upon arriving and reading the initial reports, Dr. Gears requested to view a subject that the Foundation believed was suffering from SCP-217. When the young woman entered, Gears immediately recognized the signs, the stiff movements, the robotic, monotone voice, and the way that nothing he seemed to say faced her. They were all clear-cut signs of SCP-217's infection. The girl was barely high school age, but she looked like she had all of her youth and life zapped out of her completely. It was a horrible sight to see. An x-ray was performed, and Gears saw for himself a definitive sign that SCP-217 had taken over her body. The x-ray imagery showed the inside of the girl's body, which had been converted from an ordinary mass of organs and tissues into a clockwork machine, composed of cogs, gears, screws, and wires. And as Gears knew, this would only get worse as time went on, with signs of her infection appearing outside the body as well as inside. Right now, there wasn't a shred of human tissue left inside her, and there was nothing the doctor could do about it. Gears thought about the girl's family, who had been anesthetized prior to the Foundation seizing their daughter for research purposes. And though the emotionless man would never let his facade down, his heart ached for her. But it wasn't only her. It was dozens of people inside the city the Foundation had documented as displaying symptoms of SCP-217. On a scale this high, there was little the Foundation could do except sit back, watch, and only act when the symptoms became too visible to hide. That was the tragedy of SCP-217, the clockwork virus. It wasn't deadly, but it was a slow, more metaphorical death, from a person made of flesh and blood to a clockwork automaton that felt more like a shell than a living thing. The Foundation was more than familiar with SCP-217, though, and multiple samples are held inside a reverse-pressure airlocked containment chamber at a high-security site for research purposes, in hopes that one day, a cure could be developed. Personnel wanting to access SCP-217 samples have to don fully insulated hazmat suits with chemical sterilization and endure a post-interaction quarantine period with physical testing. All this being mandatory after they have finished their experiments with the virus. The severity of an SCP-217 infection cannot be understated, and any items touched by infected personnel have to undergo a strict sterilization process. The Foundation is perfectly justified in this overly cautious behavior, too, because SCP-217 has an infection rate of 100%, meaning that it will transmit through physical contact all of the time without failure. But it doesn't just infect humans. The clockwork virus has been observed to infect all multicellular organisms. From the smallest insect to an elephant, SCP-217 consumes and hollows out all it can. Clockwork beings wrought from a clockwork virus, marching to the ticking of their innards in a hollow, empty world. If that sounds terrifying and like a nightmare, then congratulations. Chances are you're unaffected by SCP-217. If it sounds appealing, well, you might just be a mechanite ready to serve the Church of the Broken God, but we'll get to that connection later. SCP-217 is especially difficult to deal with due to its hardiness. It can survive for years outside a host body, and when it does find a suitable host, and trust us, there's no shortage in supply of them in the world, it can sometimes take years for symptoms of SCP-217 to manifest. It's a slow virus, and that's exactly what makes it so dangerous. The Foundation might not realize a large population area has been infected before it's too late, and that's exactly what happened before, with entire towns being infected by SCP-217. But what are those symptoms? Well, you might have already been able to guess so far that SCP-217 has to do with turning someone into a mechanical monstrosity. 
but there's a bit more to it than that. SCP-217 alters biochemistry in such a way that it causes organic matter to rearrange itself into an organic metal. Chemical scans of this metal reveal that there's still living cellular tissue and DNA present inside it, but it takes the appearance and feels indistinguishable from actual materials. This process occurs slowly over time, and advanced stages have shown that a subject's interior will resemble a machine, with a complicated mixture of gears and clockwork. This is subtle, barely noticed by the patient at first, with only vague feelings of confusion, insomnia, and joint stiffness. But as larger and larger parts of the body are converted, the subject experiences extreme pain. As Dr. Gears wrote in his research notes on SCP-217, Hearts are replaced by gears and small tubes, joints by gear networks, eyes by structures not unlike primitive hand-crake film cameras, etc. SCP-217 in non-mammals shows first on the outside of the body. In mammals such as humans, SCP-217 converts the internals before being visible on the outside of the body. The reason for this is unknown, but it might have something to do with that broken god connection we mentioned earlier. One of the church's core beliefs focuses on ascending humanity to reflect Mekain, the broken god. While the origins of SCP-217 are unknown, if the virus is related to the Mechanites, this subtle, slow infection may be a part of their grand design. A plan to covertly infiltrate society and convert the masses into effigies of their god. But of course, this is all speculation. As we mentioned, those infected by SCP-217 can be entirely unaware of their conversion until it's too late. But aside from physicality, the mental state is also affected. From the middle to advanced stages of SCP-217 infection, victims' behaviors reflect their cold, mechanical insides. They respond in a repetitive, disassociated fashion. Their actions are dull, mechanical, and telegraphed. They're easily distracted and confused, and appear irritable when faced with new problems. In the early stages, SCP-217 manifests as increased lethargy, a lack of emotional response, and a feeling of fluttering or moving underneath the skin. Always present are ticking noises, like those of a clock that mainly manifest when SCP-217 infects the shoulders, neck, and head. But attempts to hear this noise using recording equipment have invariably failed, as the device will not pick up any sound if pressed against an affected area. As SCP-217's infection advances, the subject will experience excruciating pain, sharp, tearing sensations in the areas that are being converted into organic metal, comparable in feeling to a knife wound or a deep muscle tear. This feeling can persist for hours or days, depending on which area of the body is being affected and the subject themselves. After tearing the existing organs, the new parts will integrate into the tissue and settle into the body, producing pain. An analysis of this newly formed organic metal appears to be alloys of brass, steel, and iron varieties, but substances such as leather, rubber, glass, and wood have been observed. And observed is the key word because as soon as these materials are examined deeper, it's revealed that they're still organic in composition and even carry the subject's DNA. Organs and tissues affected will, however, become stronger. Instead of being squishy meat bags filled with tissue, blood, and other parts, they take on the physical properties, namely durability, of the material they resemble. If one of these areas are damaged, they'll repair over time just like regular organs, but at a much slower rate. But one interesting note is that a damaged piece of organic metal can be repaired, so to speak, by replacing damaged areas with new parts of the same type. This has had no consequences, and the body will continue to act as normal. That's one benefit of being infected by SCP-217. You can essentially repair yourself with whatever you have access to. But the conversion of a victim doesn't stop. It continues to occur until their entire body is organic metal, inside and out. Dr. Gears' research on a fully converted brain was apparently so groundbreaking that it had to be erased from the standard security class documentation. We can only speculate on what it contained. Possibly that connection to the broken god that we're so desperate to make? We don't know. But whatever it was, it hinted at something far larger than what a cursory look at SCP-217 seems to suggest. SCP-217 is truly one of the most dangerous anomalous viruses the Foundation has to deal with, having already infected hundreds of people in various population centers around the world. 
before containment methods can be properly established. So if you happen to start hearing the sounds of a tick here and a talk there, accompanied by a strange fluttering feeling under your skin, we're sorry to say, there's not much we can do for you now. Actually, nothing. There's nothing we can do. Let's ask a philosophical question. What is it that makes up a person's soul? Is it their personality? Their memories? Their emotions? The history of their good and bad deeds? Is it an energy that inhabits a living body? An active consciousness or even all of the above? Or is the soul just an entirely nebulous and undefinable concept? The idea of the soul is almost as old as human civilization itself, with philosophers from as far back as ancient Greece and even before acknowledging its existence. Numerous religions from all over the world, if not all of them, also hold teachings about the nature of souls, even though they might vary. For example, Judaism and some denominations of Christianity state that only human beings have an immortal soul that will live on in heaven after a person's death and the end of their time on earth. Meanwhile, certain Catholic theologians, meaning people who study religion, claim that a soul inhabits all living creatures. And so the philosophical and theological debate goes on, with the general consensus being that souls are, well, they're a little bit of everything. Every part of someone that makes them who they are. Character, emotions, reasoning, consciousness, memories, and thoughts all blended together. But if we accept that a soul is something that exists, then it is something that can be altered. Is it constant or can it be manipulated? Could a person's soul even be removed entirely? At first glance, SCP-158 appears to be a device resembling a mechanical arm. In fact, it's a lot like the kind of machine you might expect to find inside a huge factory, standing as part of an assembly line, welding and drilling components together day in and day out. This particular mechanized arm, however, features a number of unique and bizarre differences from any currently used in automated production. For starters, it has an unusual attachment at one end, a three-pronged tridactyl-like claw. The arm itself is also designed to be suspended from the ceiling, ideally hanging upside down in a room big enough to accommodate it. There is a long series of winding cables connecting SCP-158 to a complicated computer console that is used to control the device, while the remaining cables are intended to be connected to a power source. As for the console, it possesses a visual display unit and a keyboard like you might expect it to. And at the bottom, there is what appears to be some form of a dispenser, seemingly designed to attach to a container of some kind, measuring 3 inches wide by 7 inches tall. The ideal receptacle to fit the attachment is that of a glass jar or beaker. This mechanical arm was first uncovered by the Foundation in late 2007, inside a burned-down hospital in an unknown location that has been redacted from the SCP-158 file. The hospital itself was derelict, abandoned, and appeared to have been unused for a considerable period of time. Approximately five years, but perhaps more. Agents working for the Foundation recovered SCP-158, along with an owner's manual that presumably would have contained detailed instructions describing the device's function and exactly how to operate it. This manual had been badly damaged by the fire, but the readable portions of it were later transcribed and copied, and now a single copy of what was left of the manual is kept with SCP-158 at all times. While most instructions detailing the operation of SCP-158 did survive and were able to be copied, any chapters that might have explained who built it or what it actually did were too badly damaged to read, lost to the fire. Much like the owner's manual, all components of SCP-158, the arm, the console, and the cables have all appeared to sustain some amount of fire damage, but remain intact and in full working order. The damage is only cosmetic, and while it might take around 20 minutes to boot up, this fire damage doesn't affect the machine's function. But the question still remains, what exactly is the intended purpose of this mechanical arm? Well, through a long process of trial and error, and following the surviving portions of the manual, the Foundation was able to get the device working again, 
They learned that SCP-158 will only perform its function when presented with an ordinary living being. While human beings, namely members of D-Class personnel, are typically used as test subjects by the Foundation, this actually applies to any living creature that has the ability to display cognition, which is the mental process of gaining knowledge, in order to perform cognitive functions like thinking, remembering, and problem-solving. When a person or non-human being possessing cognition is presented to SCP-158, the machine will then go to work and extract an unknown gas-based substance from them. This substance is then deposited in the jar or beaker that is then fitted to the dispenser beneath the console. So, what does it take? Is it some sort of advanced form of decontamination device, removing all toxins and impurities from the body? Oh, if only that were true. Sadly, you see, the Foundation didn't give SCP-158 the nickname of the Soul Extractor for nothing. After the machine has performed its function, the now formerly cognitive organism on the receiving end will display a complete and total loss of their higher brain functions. They won't be able to speak, form coherent thoughts, or even remember who they were before SCP-158 was switched on. The device will rob them of any and all parts of themselves, essentially leaving the person or creature as a hollowed-out shell, a husk of their previous self, a body without a soul. Perhaps even crueler, though, is that this extraction process is not fatal, and victims are left alive afterward. They no longer possess their capability for cognitive thought and will not respond to any form of external stimuli around them. There have been some level of brainstem activity recorded in most cases, and subjects have been known to exhibit basic reflexes, but this is the only active movement they are now capable of. As for that substance that test subjects have removed from their bodies, well, it takes the form of a gas, as we mentioned earlier, but it also seems to be comprised of a mixture of kinetic, electrical, heat, and light energy. In fact, each jar of the substance is an infinite source of these various types of energy, albeit only capable of a very low rate and output on average. The general consensus among Foundation researchers is that this substance is the physical soul that has been removed from a subject. So, do they stay stuck as soulless shells forever? Actually, SCP-158 is in fact capable of returning the extracted substance to a subject that it performed a removal on. However, whether a test subject, normally a member of D-Class, receives their soul after having it extracted is all down to whatever test is being conducted by the Foundation. Those that do get given their souls back will usually regain access to all of their previously lost cognition and higher brain functions, but the rate at which they can return can vary depending on the subject. Replacing the substance from one patient with that of another can also cause these results to differ. And again, that's if the SCP Foundation even bothers to replace a test subject's soul, instead of just leaving them hollowed out. It's actually pretty terrifying to think that the Foundation has the freedom and the capability to do that to somebody, taking away everything that makes someone a human being, only to leave their soul in a jar while their vacant body lives on without thought or consciousness. It was due to the unique, anomalous function of SCP-158 that the device was proposed to become a part of a Foundation research endeavor, codenamed the Olympia Project, and overseen by its head researcher, Professor Kane Pathos Crow, who has the head of a golden retriever, but that's a story for another day. The ultimate aim of the project was to use the anomalous properties of a number of SCPs to successfully create an artificial human that would become a potential asset of the SCP Foundation. As part of one series of Olympia Project experiments, Professor Crow gathered a group of D-Class personnel to undergo testing using SCP-158. Each of these individuals had been interviewed by Crow himself and were selected based on personality traits and characteristics that the professor liked or thought would be useful to have in the Foundation's artificial humanoid. The group chosen by Professor Crow featured a mix of male and female test subjects. As Crow believed, a soul transcends the flesh it is interred in. The main purpose of the experiment was to try and uncover some of the further functions of SCP-158, basically pushing the machine to its limit, trying to learn more information about the device that would have been contained in the damaged portions of the owner's manual. Professor Crow had pored over the sections that had survived intact, 
making sure he knew every available piece of information on SCP-158 inside and out. The obscured instructions he was able to decipher were, according to his notes, sketchy at best and downright unhelpful at worst. Crow began his experiments by removing the first subject's soul and then trying to use the device to do literally anything else with the extracted substance. Despite trying everything he could think of, the professor learned that there was little the soul extractor could do with the soul once it had been removed, other than reverse the process and return the substance to the body it had been taken from. By then repeating this with further D-Class test subjects, Crow was able to learn the exact input sequence needed to reverse the soul extraction, whilst before this had only been ever achieved through blind luck. By his sixth experiment with SCP-158, Professor Crow noticed that there was a brief period in the middle of performing its function that the device would pause as if awaiting further commands. Crow theorized that this pause was there for additional sequences to be inputted via the machine's console. He then began removing and re-implanting the same soul into the following test subject, both to practice but also to experiment with the soul extractor's controls. The professor found it strange that, despite what he was doing to her, the D-Class suffered little to no side effects to her health, even though her soul was being continuously removed and replaced. Then, on experiment number 11, Crow seemed to crack that little pause SCP-158 took during each operation. A new list of commands appeared on the monitor like split, merge, remove aspects, add aspects, and combine aspects. It seemed to the professor that the device could be used to not only remove souls, but alter them. Through his further experiments, Crow learned that the aspects the machine mentioned were elements of a person's personality, such as willpower, understanding, conscience, creativity, empathy, and the soul extractor could be used to manipulate and rewrite a person's entire identity before placing it back into their body. However, this took a considerable amount of testing, causing Professor Crow to grow more and more frustrated with the complex workings of the device. That was until he eventually realized it wasn't SCP-158 that was too complicated for its own good. The machine was trying to quantify the unquantifiable, explain something inexplicable, the very nature of the human soul. Professor Crow began using SCP-158 to modify a composite soul, which he referred to as Subject Zero. While working on it, he realized the soul itself seemed to be aware of its surroundings, possessing a level of knowledge above that of most Foundation researchers, including Crow himself. Either by fluke or by meddling with SCP-158, the professor had created a soul that seemed to exist on several planes of existence beyond the physical world that we know. Subject Zero had become a sentient, disembodied consciousness, an entity that could see, hear, feel, and think without the need for a physical form or body to house it. Zero was proposed to become Professor Crow's assistant, given that it displayed respect and admiration to him for having created it, almost like a child looking up to a father figure. All it asked in return was to be given a name other than Subject Zero. Crow told the disembodied entity it could name itself whatever it liked. The Foundation then planned for the composite soul, now formally known as Subject Zero, to be a component of the Olympia Project's artificial humanoid, whenever its creation was successfully completed. Don't you just love a happy ending? Let's return to 2003, a time before YouTube. Yes, we know, that's a frightening thought. We only ask that you take a deep breath and compose yourself so we can get through the rest of the story. While YouTube may not have been invented for another two years, the burgeoning internet of the early 2000s still wasn't without its content creators. Posting everywhere, from basic social media sites to personal GeoCities websites and specialty forums, one of these early proto-content creators was a man named John Cutler, better known at the time by his online handle, John Station. John Station was, tragically, a man operating before his time. His interests were firmly based on three things. Mysteries, the paranormal, and urban exploration. If he'd been operating a mere decade later, he would have made a killing on urbex videos or scary 3am challenges. 
but instead he was just sharing his urban exploration photos and videos with a small group of friends on various niche internet forums, like Parawatch, a premier destination for lovers of the strange and unusual online. Little did he know, an anomalous being he was about to encounter was an even more prolific internet user than him. But let's start from the beginning. John Station was making his way to the city of Detroit, Michigan on a Greyhound bus. Detroit had become somewhat of a holy land for dark tourists, photographers, and urban explorers. It had once been one of the most valuable manufacturing hubs in the United States, the very heart of the automotive industry until all of those manufacturing jobs were outsourced to other countries for cheaper labor. This, along with a number of other factors, led to a devastating economic collapse that the area is still suffering from today. Along with a huge number of abandoned residential, commercial, and industrial buildings just waiting to be explored. And John Station planned to start off with a real staple of the urbex genre, a derelict warehouse. He was expecting to get some cool photos of disused machinery and maybe some cool graffiti left by anonymous street artists over the years. But what he certainly didn't expect was a series of 13 massive underground structures hidden below the warehouse. Something that looked like it would have taken decades to even excavate the room for, let alone actually build. The whole thing seemed like some kind of obscenely massive workshop. Strange machinery, shelves upon shelves of paper and notes, spare parts laying around everywhere. What had happened here? But as John Station continued his search into the bowels of this labyrinthine warehouse, he came upon the most strange and disquieting discovery of all. A large glass jar filled with green liquid and a perfectly preserved human brain floating inside. Of course, he took some pictures to share with his Foramite buddies and got the hell out of Dodge. John Station had made what was, for any self-respecting Parawatch user, a terrible mistake. Because he was too busy listening to Avril Lavigne on his big, clunky early 2000s headphones, he didn't hear the brain's attempt to communicate with him. Oh, hello, young man. Are you here to see my marvelous inventions? Young man? But he was already gone by then. Little did John Station know, he just encountered one of the greatest human minds of his generation, Jeremy Valdez an inventor without equal. And what's more, he may have actually encountered this singularly intelligent individual before. Thanks to Jeremy's brilliant foresight and the invention of a little something he called the V-Wave Universal Ansible, this disembodied brain was connected to the internet. What exactly was it doing with that internet connection? Everything from being a frequent forum poster to selling anomalous technology on the deep web. While we don't know much more than that about the brain's browsing habits, it goes without saying that we'd kill to see a copy of its internet history. When John Station returned home, he posted a picture of the brain to the internet, telling his fellow Urbex buddies to go and check the warehouse out. Naturally, this caught the attention of the SCP Foundation, who saw a mysterious human brain hiding in a secretive underground structure in Detroit to be a certifiably anomalous development. And really, they didn't know the half of what they were about to get into. Welcome to the mind of Jeremy Valdez. After all the proper witnesses had been given amnestic treatment, the Foundation secured the warehouse and began exploratory missions into its bowels. It was exactly as John Station reported, a chaos of junk and shelves upon shelves of almost incomprehensible notes and diagrams. While agents searched for the brain of Jeremy Valdez, they encountered what would be later known as SCP-2099-B, his wondrous, anomalous creations. Most of these creations are robotic in nature, with some of them being known as peripherals, creations made specifically to help Valdez continue his research in his disembodied brain form. And they weren't exactly pleased about the Foundation intruding on Jeremy's extremely important research. They tried to defend his secret lair beneath the warehouse and were destroyed in the firefight with Foundation personnel. Only five peripherals are active now, which the Foundation uses as collateral in their deal with Valdez for his continued cooperation. To put it less politely, if he doesn't play ball, then the last of his peripheries get terminated. Thankfully for him and the Foundation operatives assigned to his case, Jeremy is a highly cooperative anomaly who has consistently behaved pleasantly towards Foundation staff. That's right, 
he's able to communicate directly with others by anomalous means. However, while having a direct line to the mind of this enigmatic ball of gray matter would seem like a dream to your typical researcher, the cooperation of Jeremy Valdez has been less valuable than the Foundation initially believed it would be. This is largely because Jeremy's mind appeared to be pretty similar to his workplace, strange, chaotic, and hard to decipher. When they first asked who exactly he was, his response was, I am the profound Professor V, the genius who invented the quantum pistol, the rocket to Sagittarius, the window to other worlds. My name is Jeremy Valdez. Jeremy. Ah, there was another Jeremy I met once. Well, lots, but the one uh, stuck in my mind. Clever man. Salesman. Can't trust them an inch if you give them a mile, but <laughs> that wasn't me. He's a little scatterbrained, to put it politely. Many of his answers, while strange and amusing, have been largely useless to the Foundation. For example, when they asked him how he was able to construct the secret facility, he said, Oh, dug it all out. Tricky bit was the supports. Use solid Valdesium to hold it up. That's my own invention. Name trademark patent pending, unless I forgot to send in the application. And when they asked how he was able to survive as a mere brain in a jar, he had the equally baffling and frustrating response, Good diet and exercise. Healthy living. Oh, and the electrolytes. It's in my notes somewhere, the whole process. Never will look at mashed potatoes the same way, <laughs> I'll tell you that. There may be at least some truth to that last one, as the solution inside Jeremy's jar has been tested and proven to be water mixed with electrolytes, sugars, green food coloring, and artificial flavoring. The current working theory on the green food coloring is simply that Jeremy thought it would make his disembodied brain look cooler. Jeremy truly proves that the lines between genius, madness, and outright buffoonery are far more malleable than any of us could have imagined. It's because of Jeremy's forgetfulness that he and his peripheries are such meticulous note-takers, though there is no discernible filing system for this absurd multitude of notes, and the majority of them are written in quick and scratchy shorthand that only Jeremy himself seems to be able to decipher. But of course, the most fascinating part of the story of Jeremy Valdez is his creations. So now we're going to take a better look at those inventions, and some of the stress that the Foundation has been going through in order to track the rest of them down. The peripheries are a varied bunch. Some are as simple as a pair of robot hands that endlessly take notes from Jeremy's unstoppable stream of consciousness. Some are as theatrical as humanoid robots dressed like butlers. We can't help but wonder how Mr. Deeds from SCP-662 would feel about this extra competition. However, the peripheries are really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Jeremy's overall body of work. Let's take a crash course through some of the peculiar inventions they discovered in Detroit. A pistol that fires out powerful X-rays, inexplicably powered by two ordinary AA batteries and focused via a non-anomalous quartz crystal. A six-meter-tall humanoid robot constructed primarily from chrome and steel. A cannon that fires anomalous robot ninjas. No, that isn't a joke. The cannon fires cartridges that anomalously break open, revealing human-sized robots wielding swords and nunchucks. A bin labeled Cyborg Parts, which was filled with a multitude of cybernetic prosthetic body parts, though none of these parts had any mechanisms that would allow them to interface with the human nervous system. But wait, there's more. A huge excavation vehicle with massive drills and claws that make the dirt it displaces disappear, perhaps explaining how Jeremy managed this little construction project. A rocket-based spacecraft with sediment stuck to its landing gear that indicates it's been on the moon at some point in the past. A force field generator so effective that the Foundation is still unable to penetrate it because Jeremy himself has, unsurprisingly, forgotten how to turn it off. A failed anti-gravity machine that instead just creates more gravity, meaning anything or anyone brought into its vicinity becomes twice as heavy as they would be under normal conditions of Earth gravity. In case you needed a little dose of existential terror today, there's also a complete working simulation of an entire alien solar system somehow held on only two gigabytes of memory. And of course, we wouldn't be doing Jeremy Valdez justice if we didn't tell you how obsessed he is with lasers. The Foundation even found a large containment unit on the site, labeled 713 different laser guns, which contained, yep, you guessed it, 713 different laser guns. We imagine at least one or two of these ended up in Foundation Armory, or at least the personal office of Dr. Bright. Well, if they could only figure out how this absurd, ridiculous technology actually worked. The most challenging part of containing SCP-2099 isn't the brain itself. 
though the picture of Jeremy's brain is still circulating out on the internet today if you know where to look. It's finding and containing the anomalous items that Jeremy left laying around in his life before containment. Because Jeremy himself has a brain like a colander, even finding these items is largely a result of picking up clues from his bizarre ramblings and thousands of pages of nigh incomprehensible notes he won't stop babbling on about. While trying to find one of Jeremy's items in an alley in Boston, Massachusetts, Foundation agents ran afoul of a group of Chaos Insurgency agents searching for the same thing. But this wouldn't be the last peculiar tie between Jeremy and certain groups of interest pitted against the Foundation. In a soup kitchen in Seattle, Washington, the Foundation found that Jeremy had once sold an enlarger ray to agents of the Mana Charitable Foundation, a surprisingly benevolent GOI who use anomalies to help the needy. They used the enlarger ray to enlarge food and fight against hunger in the city's homeless population. And while visiting an area in Boise, Idaho, after Jeremy once mentioned having customers there, the Foundation discovered substantial connections to a member of a serpent's hand cell. It seemed to all observers that Jeremy was a kind of anomalous Forrest Gump, a man who had somehow bungled his way through a series of unfortunate arrangements with several of the Foundation's greatest enemies. He's a brain with an awful lot of bad luck. Or is he? Because while the Foundation has bought his bumbling fool shtick hook, line, and sinker, that doesn't mean it's true. In fact, in a classified letter to a member of the Serpent's Hand that worked closely with him in the past, Jeremy presented a very different picture of himself. Hey Al, I got your letter. Yeah, I'm not too worried about the Seaco Pro. They're still digging at the old place. Psychology of the individual man. They're like cats. You run, they're going to chase you. But if they see something else moving, that's where their eyes are, leaving you to jet. The tail? Oh yeah, he's fine. He's designed for this stuff, man. And not like he's really there or anything. They get wise, we pull the plug and get away free and clear. Anyway, I got some new toys I came up with. Robots the size of fleas. They grab onto a guy, get carried wherever. They record what they see, hear, leave with whoever and detach where you need them. No signal or trace, because they don't broadcast. You get it all when you collect them. I figure it'd be useful for that project of yours. I know, not your usual style, but get with the times, man. If you care to join me in the 22nd century, leave payment in the usual place. Ask Schiltz if you don't remember. And please, man, let me take a look at that hat. I just know I can make it better. You have goddamn lasers firing off your head. Think about it, V. So what do you think? Is Jeremy a bumbling brain in a jar? Or is that very brain a decoy for one of the most ingenious and deceptive masterminds in the anomalous world? An anomalous Kaiser Soze, always staying one step ahead of the Foundation while sending its agents on wild goose chases? Well, the fact we even need to ask shows that Jeremy Valdez is a few steps ahead of us already. Hello, hello, hello! You're watching SCP Explained, and today we've got an offer you simply can't refuse. The very latest in anomalous self-improvement technology, which the SCP Foundation calls SCP-212. But we much prefer to call it the Improver. Believe us when we say this miraculous device will change your life. You'll never be the same after a run-in with the Improver. It'll make you fitter, healthier, better. Not convinced? Don't worry. Just sit back and let us sell you the dream. Here's some unpleasant news. You're going to die. No matter how healthy you are right now, there will inevitably come a day when your lungs stop pumping, your ticker stops ticking, and all those delightful little synapses in your brain stop sending electrical and chemical signals to and fro. What a bummer. Why would you want to be dead? You can't do stuff when you're dead. And it's all because everyone is eventually betrayed by the very things currently keeping them alive. Those pesky, squishy, fallible organs. But thanks to the Improver, getting stuck with the organs you were born with is a problem of yesteryear. No matter what those lousy sarcasts tell you, the flesh is unreliable. Metal and plastic, on the other hand, that's built to last. Bleeding hearts talk a lot about quality of life, but what really matters is quality of life. And if you're strong enough, that's what the Improver, a state-of-the-art piece of medical technology, will give you. Don't look so afraid, you replace your phone every year, you replace your laptop every few years, so why get all sentimental about needing to trade in your old liver, eyes, limbs, or skin for the new model? Or in the words of another great businessman, why be you when you can be new? Not convinced? Let us tell you about the incredible features that the Improver has to offer. I'm talking three top-of-the-line fully opposable plastic and steel autonomous medical limbs. 
That's industry lingo for robot arms that work on their own with 500 count on 500 different attachments. But I know what you're thinking, 500 attachments, where am I gonna find the room for all that, SCP explained. To which we say, don't worry about it. Due to its spatially anomalous properties, the Improver is able to store all these attachments within its arms without any additional space concerns. And hey, I see that nervous look in your eye. You're worried about the operating costs, right? But don't worry, there's no need. The Improver is completely self-powered with no discernible power source. And you know the thing is safe because the SCP Foundation has given it the safe object class. Sure, that technically doesn't mean it's not dangerous, but it does mean it won't sprout legs and walk off if you leave it to your own devices, am I right, folks? So you're looking at a long-term investment with a three-year warranty and an endorsement from the fabulous folks at the Church of the Broken God. You just can't argue with these deals, my friends. We even offer competitive rates against Marshall, Carter, and Dark. But hey, we're not trying to pull the wool over your eyes here. You're a smart consumer. We know that you know the actual financial cost is only one layer of the overall cost. Time and draining is also, of course, a factor. But we've got some good news for you, Sunshine. The Improver is 100% user-friendly. No setup, no mess, no problem, no trying to interpret poorly written instructions or watch batted out YouTube tech tutorials where the guy just will not get to the point. The Improver operates itself. It may be a piece of hyper-advanced anomalous technology, but it's easier to use than most wireless printers. Am I right? Am I right? The steps to using the Improver are so simple a monkey could do it. Just step within a 1.5 meter range of the machine and it will do the rest. You'll feel your troubles melt away as the powerful mechanical arms grab you and restrain you against the floor. You'll be subjected to a brief, relaxing scan where the Improver will determine exactly what needs to be changed about your fragile human physiology. And then before you know it, surgery will commence! Warning, SCP Explained is not liable for any excruciating pain caused by the Improver. Medical sedatives and anesthetics are sold separately. The consumer is responsible for their own pain relief when using the Improver. Second warning, the consumer is also responsible for their own blood transfusions when using the Improver. Neither the Improver nor SCP Explained is liable for any blood loss while using the Improver. Your blood, your problem. Now with those tiny little caveats out of the way, we carry on telling you just how fantastic the Improver is. Sure, flesh-worshipping sarcast losers and haters will tell you that it has a mortality rate of around 47%, but we prefer to look on the bright side and focus on its excellent 53% survival rate. Rest assured, the odds are still very much in your favor when you use the Improver. And doesn't adding a slight risk to the equation just make the whole process even more exciting? We certainly think it does. And in the reasonably likely event that you survive using the Improver, the benefits will vastly outweigh the costs. It can do incredible things, like lining your joints with graphite, replacing your nasty flesh organs with more powerful artificial ones, adding new or duplicate organs, replacing those unreliable teeth with serrated steel blades, and so much more. Is there anything this absolute marvel of a machine can't do? Doctors hate it. The Improver is here to fix every aspect of your life and health with its simple anomalous tricks. It even has a special sealant for wound closing that no medical professional on Earth has access to. What is it exactly? Well, if we told you, I'm afraid we'd have to kill you. It's a trade secret. <laughs> You'd have to be crazy not to want the Improver in your home. But if for some crazy reason you still need to be convinced, let's look at some real success stories of the Improver in action. Straight from SCP Foundation testing logs. Listen close and soon you'll see the Improver literally makes satisfied customers. The Foundation put a 28-year-old African-American agent into the Improver of his own volition. He replaced his boring lower jawbone with a super dense ceramic jaw. With ceramic blades instead of teeth. It also removed his spine and replaced it with a synthetic polymer, which was easily affixed to the base of his skull. And at no extra charge, it even coated his rib cage and pelvis with a thin layer of ceramic before removing his lungs, eyes, and liver for cleaning and replacement. That's right, cleaning. The Improver can remove organs and through a patented cleaning process remove genetic defects and allow them to appear younger and healthier than generic Brand X organs. This agent has since returned to active duty and is even better at his job all thanks to the Improver. Looking good out there, champ. A 42-year-old British Foundation researcher was submitted for testing on the Improver. It replaced his teeth with sleek, super-dense ceramic, reinstated his inefficient feet, and replaced them with a complex latticework covered in sticky pads that would let him climb on any surface and hold up to 225 kilograms of weight. It also took out and cleaned a huge number of his organs, removed his bone marrow, and replaced it with blue synthetic gel. Much more effective, we assure you, and inserted a few random bits of metal into his brain at no extra cost. 
Sadly, this researcher passed away during the bone marrow removal process, but for all we know, that could easily just be a coincidence. Next came an agent codenamed AA, who had suffered a pretty severe accident at work, losing all his limbs, one of his eyes, a few of his organs, and suffering a pretty dramatic head injury, namely taking a piece of circuit board to the brain during an explosion. He was given over to the improver, seeing as he didn't really have much to lose in terms of physical integrity. But seeing that it's an amazing piece of groundbreaking technology, the improver never takes the obvious option. It gave AA a chemical that forced him into a coma, and then properly integrated the circuit board into his brain. It continues to spread and assimilate more of his brain matter while he's in a comatose state. Though when he awakens with a much more efficient brain, he'll probably be incredibly grateful to the improver for helping him like this. And it's not just people with severe injuries that the improver can lend three helping robotic hands to. It's also the victims of severe and even anomalous diseases. Take victims of SCP-217, a rather horrific and painful disease that mechanizes the entire body until the sufferers aren't really themselves anymore. A normal, uninspired SCP Foundation researcher may look at someone like this and see a lost cause. But with the help of the improver, no cause is lost. A D-class in the advanced stages of the disease was run through the machine, and while the exact details of what it did to him are another trade secret, it's safe to say he was truly fighting fit when he came out on the other side. We mean that literally. He easily escaped containment and overpowered two heavily armed guards before taking the lives of several members of Foundation staff before being captured and terminated some time later. <laughs> you can't argue with those incredible results, folks. Next came a 26-year-old SCP Foundation researcher who, due to an unfortunate brush with a less wonderful and beneficial anomaly, had been rendered completely blind. However, when he was brought into the grasp of the Improver, it immediately set to work on solving the doctor's little problem. It removed his two non-functioning eyes and made the interesting creative choice of widening the two cavities in his head so they met in the middle and formed one huge cavity for a single large sensory organ. This cavity was then filled with large metal spikes resembling hair, which are far more interesting than typical eyes. During the Improver's delicate medical procedures, the scientist inexplicably entered a state of visible distress and began repeating the phrase, It tastes all wrong. At this point, the metal cilia in the scientist's single large cavity began to grow, expanding through the roof of the cavity and into the subject's brain, killing him. We want to specify that SCP Explained and the Improver are in no way responsible for this unfortunate incident. It's entirely the researcher's fault for setting off his own metal eye cavity cilia. Before we bring this anomalous infomercial to an end, and of course before you immediately grab your credit card and buy your own Improver device, we want to sneak a few more disclaimers under the wire. For starters, the Improver doesn't work on animals. When a rat was used as a test subject, the device attempted to modify the rat into a bipedal being, <laughs> removing the majority of its organs and replacing it with white paste. So if your pet rat gets sick, just uh, take it to the vet instead. The Improver also doesn't work on corpses. It may be a miraculous piece of technology, but uh, <laughs> it's not a literal miracle worker, folks. One freshly executed D-Class was presented to the Improver, and instead of operating on him, the Improver cut open his stomach and instead began constructing something out of metal he had consumed the night prior to his death. A seafood dinner! The broken crustacean parts were then constructed into a bioluminescent lobster-like creature. So if you're planning on bringing someone back from the dead, we're afraid you're going to need to take up necromancy instead. But if you haven't died yet and you're looking to improve yourself, then you cannot invest in a better product than the Improver. The one problem is that the only known prototype of the Improver is currently locked in an SCP Foundation containment site. So getting your hands on these three special arms may cost you your life. What? Who said attaining perfection would be easy? Over the years, a considerable number of innocent people had unknowingly wandered into SCP-3008. Otherwise known as the Infinite Ikea, this extra-dimensional space more than lived up to its nickname, consisting of an Ikea store with no known limit to its endless aisles upon aisles of flat-packed Swedish furniture. But given the veritable labyrinth contained beyond the seemingly ordinary automatic doors of SCP-3008's entrance, it was rare that anyone making their way inside ever made it back out alive. On top of that, there was little the Foundation could do to ensure the safe return of anybody unlucky enough to find themselves lost in the infinite Ikea. Once inside, navigating a way out was made almost impossible given the scope of the spatially anomalous store. And then, of course, there was the staff. These tall humanoid creatures roamed the aisles of SCP-3008, sporting a lack of facial features, disproportionate bodies, and wearing the typical uniform of an average IKEA worker. 
I think it's becoming a concern, researcher calmly declared. No, a problem. Just how many people are going missing in SCP-3008. What else can we do? Her colleague researcher Kylan replied, shrugging their shoulders. We keep watch over the entrance and stop anyone from entering. But ours isn't the only entrance, Conley retorted. It was true. Based on evidence gathered from some survivors that had made it out of the infinite Ikea, the entrance seemed to exist in multiple parallel universes. Say we could figure out not just a way to navigate through SCP-3008 with better accuracy so people can make it back out, but what if… what if we could use it? Kylan jumped in, finishing the sentence. It could be like an interdimensional spaghetti junction, a hub to access all sorts of other alternate universes. We could send people through the entrance in our universe and they could make their way through 3008 and out into another. Exactly, their fellow researchers smiled. One problem though, they said. What do we do about the staff? The inhabitants of the infinite Ikea were undoubtedly an obstacle standing in the path of Conley and Kylan's idea. The faceless creatures were known to be docile during the daytime cycle within SCP-3008, only to turn violent and attack anyone present when the lights dimmed. They're part of the problem, Conley mused, but what if they could be part of the solution? The SCP Foundation hadn't had much chance to examine a live instance of a staff member, known as SCP-3008-2s up close. As such, they had a limited understanding of exactly what these creatures truly were. Beyond the few, they had witnessed chasing survivors out of the entrance. Were they intelligent? They were apparently able to speak, if only uttering the phrase, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. Did they have the capacity for independent thought, free will, and emotionality? There was only one way to find out. And so Conley presented her plan to capture a member of SCP-3008 staff for closer examination, not knowing the bizarre chain of events that would unfold as a result. Drawing it out was the easy part of the plan. After all, the Foundation knew that SCP-3008-2s were able to react to the presence of human beings within the infinite Ikea. So Conley proposed sending in a single member of D-Class personnel with a line of cable attached to them tethering them to just outside the entrance of 3008. They were like the bait on the end of an interdimensional fishing line and would hopefully catch the attention of a staff member and lure them out. What do we do once it's out? Kylan had mused. I mean, we know so little about their biology. We could use knockout gas, but what if they don't breathe? We could tranquilize it, but what if they don't have blood? It had been the one hitch in Conley's plan. Although she had suggested they use pure force, trapping the staff member like a wild animal before bringing it back. And sure enough, as an instance of SCP-3008-2 came racing out of the infinite Ikea, hot on the heels of the D-Class, Foundation security officers were able to swoop in and capture the creature, restraining it and bundling it into a transport back to the site. However, upon receiving their captive staff member, Kylan and Connolly were faced with a new problem. The creature seemed to be in its passive state. It didn't seem to be aggressive while away from SCP-3008. Kylan had posited their theory that the staff's attack state was linked somehow to the day and night cycles within the infinite Ikea, and now separated from that space, the SCP-3008-2 would remain docile. But the larger issue was communicating with it. As patient as Connolly tried to be with the faceless, mouthless humanoid, it seemed to be totally unresponsive to verbal communication. Any question she or her colleague Kylan asked the staff member, it offered no response. Dialing it back to more basic methods of communication, it didn't react when presented with symbols, unfazed by letters or numbers, or even straightforward pictograms. No matter what they tried, the staff member they had captured seemed not unwilling, but unable to respond. Oh, there's gotta be something we haven't tried. Conley urged, her frustration building after a long day of trying to get through to the creature. They're capable of speech, we know that from witness reports. Well, maybe they're a hive mind, Kylan mused, equally exhausted after their efforts. What if it shares a consciousness with the other staff? Like a drone in an ant colony. Hey, that's what we should name this one, they added. D for drone. Can we focus here, please? Researcher Conley snapped. It's almost like we need some way of enhancing it, granting it the right higher brain function so it has the ability to speak with us. Hold up, her colleague replied. You said we need a way to enhance it, but what if we refined it? What Kylan was insinuating was obvious, albeit a direct violation of the Foundation's own rules. SCP-914, otherwise known as the Clockworks, was an anomalous contraption of unknown origin. 
Two booths connected to the machine, one labeled input and the other output, could be used to disassemble, recreate, improve, or destroy an object that was placed within SCP-914. Although there was yet again another hurdle Conley and Kylan would have to attempt jumping over. The Foundation had banned the use of the clockworks on biological organisms. The pair submitted a request to their Foundation superiors for access to 914 and permission to use it on D. Kylan hadn't expected their suggestion to be met with anything short of a resounding no, and while determined, Conley couldn't help but find herself worrying about the possible, highly likely rejection, which made it all the more surprising that their request was not only granted, but the experiment approved by the O5 Council themselves. Clearly, the highest operational staff within the Foundation had some keen interest in whether the clockworks could refine an SCP-3008 staff member. More likely, their interest was in what benefit the experiment could potentially lead to. If the Foundation possessed a refined staff member, its own agent within the Infinite Ikea, the possibilities could be of great advantage to the O5 Council. They were less concerned with having an intermediary, using D to communicate with the other SCP-3008-2s, or negotiating the potential release of the displaced innocent people lost inside the Infinite Ikea. If refining D could mean the Council had a way to safely reach other alternate universes by traversing through SCP-3008, then that bridge between worlds would be theirs to control. Of course, Kylan and Connolly were more interested in what refining D could tell them about the staff and the nature of SCP-3008. Did instances of SCP-3008-2 have needs or wants? Could they even possess the capacity to want things? Were they fulfilled with their lives as anomalous IKEA workers? And how did they navigate the maze of endless aisles? Imagine it, Conley theorized. If D can communicate with them for us, we could open up trade with them. The canteen inside SCP-3008 endlessly refills with food. Just picture what this could mean if we work out a system of distributing that resource out of the IKEA. It could change the world, she exclaimed excitedly. Only one way to find out, right? Kylan replied. They watched as D, their captive staff member, was nudged into the input booth of SCP-914. Conley gave the research assistants a signal to activate the clockworks, hoping that refining D would allow them to be capable of speech and free thought. However, either through miscommunication or a secret order from above, one of the assistants had incorrectly calibrated SCP-914. It was meant to be set to fine, which would improve whatever was placed in the machine, but instead the dial had been turned to very fine, which improved the target item to an ever greater extent, often granting it anomalous properties. Before anyone even noticed the change, the gears and gyros of SCP-914 clicked and whirred into life, making a raucous noise of moving mechanical parts. Destroyed in the input booth, only to be reconstituted into something altogether new in the output one opposite, D emerged from SCP-914 after the process was complete. Its clothing seemed to have experienced the most noticeable change. Instead of being the usual yellow shirt and blue trousers IKEA uniform worn by the rest of the staff, D was now sporting the same clothes, but the colors seemed to be shifting, almost like the natural camouflage of a chameleon. They were still faceless, their bodies still incorrectly proportioned compared with a human, and for the most part, D seemed unchanged. But before Kylan and Connolly could move in to take a closer look, before they were even able to check if D could speak, the staff member vanished in the blink of an eye. An instant state of panic erupted throughout the Foundation facility. Alarms were howling over a containment breach. Security teams were dashing through every wing of the site to track down D. Swept up in the chaos that quickly ensued, Conley and Kylan received another message from the highest point up the chain of command. Find that staff member and bring it in, alive, or there would be held to pay from the O5 Council. But somehow there was no sign of D anywhere in the facility. They had gone. Scans of the building revealed that all members of personnel, all anomalies, and other registered forms of life were all accounted for. It was only when Kylan ran through the mess hall that they realized where their refined test subject had gone to. Hey, turn that up! They yelled to a security officer who had been quietly enjoying his lunch break. Standing on a chair, he reached up and raised the volume of a TV that was mounted to the wall overlooking the mess hall. The screen was depicting a live news report, the anchor on the ground standing outside the entrance to an ordinary IKEA store. I'm standing outside the very store where this bizarre turn of events have taken place, the anchor explained. Police received numerous calls regarding sightings of an unknown figure said to be scaring shoppers. However, they only responded when this clip went viral on social media. 
The report cut to cell phone footage of none other than D inside the store. Their uniform had shifted into its typical IKEA colors, almost like it had adapted to suit the place it had somehow transported itself to. From the mess hall, Kylan watched the footage in a mix of shock and confusion. Naturally, the reaction from bystanders was one of fright at the individual's rather odd faceless appearance. Some took to Twitter, posting images calling it some form of viral marketing hoax. Others claimed it was a publicity stunt by IKEA to boost sales, although in a statement the company denies these accusations. However, it was then reported that the supposed creature began, I'm reading this right, aren't I? The anchor paused for a moment. Started helping customers by directing them to store departments, recommending different IKEA furniture, and perhaps, strangest of all, did all this via, oh, come on, really? Telepathic communication. Conley had appeared in the mess hall just in time to witness the news. D had gotten free and immediately sought out the nearest IKEA to work there. The next few hours contained a maddening slew of new information bombarding the Foundation, as researchers Kylan and Connolly scrambled to figure out some way of recapturing D. It didn't seem that the SCP-3008-2 instance was a danger to civilians. In fact, most reports stated that they were rather friendly. Any customers that interacted with the creature described its new communication patterns in five-star reviews they apparently felt compelled to start posting online. I've never experienced anything like it, one wrote. D offered the most delightful customer service I have ever received. That's why they must have gotten their name, D for delightful. It's not like D speaks in your head, another review explained. It's more like they just give you their thoughts being directly in there. I said, where can I find the bathrooms and fittings department? And instantly D had given me the directions. It was as if I'd always known. Having an anomaly like D out in the open raised all sorts of problems for the foundation. For one, they would not have to only scrub every mention of the staff member from the internet, but also track down anyone that had interacted with D to administer amnestics. But that was far from the worst of it. The researchers had been so caught up in coordinating a recapture effort that they didn't realize how rapid and extremely widespread the D reviews were getting. They were being left on customer satisfaction boards for stores in different states within minutes of each other. It took only 15 minutes for a review that mentioned D to be left in a store that wasn't even an IKEA outlet, but a convenience store. Thank you, D, for such lovely and speedy service at the cashier's desk. Never had such a nice conversation and interaction with anyone else in the store before, the review read. The news that D could seemingly be in multiple places at once, appearing in different stores, was confirmed when Conley and Kylan saw photos posted online of the creature, wearing what looked like a number of alternate uniforms. It seemed that D's clothing, once exclusively just an IKEA shirt and pants, switched to match the uniform of whichever store they started to work in, and the more they worked, the more places they seemed to appear. Perhaps the most shocking development came almost 50 minutes after D had been refined and had disappeared. Once again turning their attention to the news, researcher Kylan watched as the manager of a huge supermarket franchise store appeared giving an interview live, talking about how the altered SCP-3008 staff had caused him to change his entire business practice. Listen, D is great. Our customers love D. I hear the company's shareholders love him too. One thing's clear, we all love D, he said jovially but something was unnerving about his gleeful smile. So to show them our appreciation, I am hereby announcing that, effective immediately, all my retail staff are no longer required to come into work. D does it all, so there's no need for anyone else. They're friendlier, quieter, they work faster, and they're more efficient than any employee on my payroll. That's right, folks, D's here to stay. Naturally, this move sparks serious controversy, with the store's disgruntled now former employees finding themselves out of work. A number of them took to social media in an outcry of dissatisfaction. This isn't fair, I've worked every weekend through college at that store and now I'm fired just like that? Thanks a lot, D. One of them protested. It's all corporate ploy, another wrote. The rumor is that the only reason they're laying us all off so quick is because D doesn't technically count as a human employee so they don't have to pay them. They're working for free so the store manager and the company that owns the store can keep every penny of the profits. The justified outrage seemed to go willfully ignored as another store announced it would be adopting the same policy, firing all its staff and letting D take over their duties. More and more photos started pouring in right before Conley and Kylan's eyes of multiple refined SCP-3008-2 instances working behind cashier's desks, refilling shelves with products, assisting customers. D seemed to be acting out of instinct, like they couldn't help being staff. It was their purpose. The horde of anomalous staff members ended up swarming over the country's retail industry simultaneously. 
like the drones of an ant colony. Kylan, what the hell have we done? Connolly asked, staring in disbelief at the TV screen. We've done the unthinkable, they answered, equally horrified. We created a monster. We took D out of SCP-3008 and made them into the most powerful retail worker on the planet. Within hours, every retail outlet of every different description, not just IKEA, had reported the firing of their entire staff, and every business that did was now raking in record profits. Droves of shoppers flocked to stores, all enjoying D's customer service so much that they were taking any excuse they could to rush out and buy, well, anything. As stock supplies started to deplete, more and more instances of the altered SCP-3008-2 appeared, taking over the supply chain and distributing products to the various stores they were working at, refilling the shelves in record time. Naturally, the O5 Council was furious. Researchers Kylan and Connolly had hoped to present them with a refined SCP-3008 staff member that could allow them to better understand the infinite IKEA. Now, the Council's ulterior motive of having access to an interdimensional bridge of other universes had been dashed, as if that wasn't bad enough, and the added hassle of D rapidly becoming a worldwide sensation, the economy was destabilizing. Thanks to the retail companies firing their staff and hoarding massive amounts of profit from all their stores, and thanks to having D compulsively working there, refining an SCP-3008 staff member looked like it was about to collapse the stock market and plunge the whole world into chaos. Um, are bad? Researcher Kylan shrugged, unsure what to say after they and Connolly had just been brought before the shadowy O5 Council to be reprimanded. There was only one thing for it. D had to be taken out of the picture, and quickly. The more they worked, the more they seemed to be able to multiply and spread. Then, with a greater number of D instances within a store, the faster and more efficient they were able to work. So in retaliation, the O5 Council begrudgingly activated Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, better known by their codename, Red Right Hand. This task force reported directly to the Council. They were some of the Foundation's most loyal operatives, and it was far from their first assassination mission. Well, they had assumed it would be an assassination, dispatching the Red Right Hand to a nearby Ikea where D had first transported themselves to after exiting 914. Of course, the place was overrun with D duplicates. But even after clearing out the entire store and administering amnestics to any customers that witnessed it, there were still plenty more of D out there. The Council quickly realized that they'd have to send MTF Alpha 1 to every branch of every outlet in the country, systematically taking out every duplicate of D in a lengthy cleanup operation until they were no more. It seemed the Foundation's personnel had their work cut out for them. Hopefully, they'd be entitled to a raise and some paid time off after all of this was over. Who among us hasn't wondered what happens after our lives have come to their inevitable ending, and we play out our final moments in the land of the living? The concept of what happens to us after we've died has baffled scientists and philosophers the world over for almost as long as human civilization has existed. Some out there already claim to know the exact answer. You probably already know that the belief in the existence of an afterlife is one held by almost every single religion and culture around the globe. Heaven, Hell, Valhalla, Purgatory, Limbo, Sheol, the world to come. Descriptions of the afterlife and how to get sent there often varies depending on the religion or cultural group it is linked to. But to think in more general terms, the concept usually revolves around the soul leaving the body after death and living forever in eternal paradise. That is, of course, unless you've committed any deadly sins during your lifetime. If the myths are to be believed, these normally result in you being sent down to spend eternity in damnation and endless punishment instead of paradise. Sadly, there's no way to prove if any of the various afterlives actually exist. By their very nature, these afterlives exist separate from the real, physical world that we live in while we are still alive. While we're here on Earth, we can only observe what we see happening to a body after death and what we assume or believe the afterlife might be like. After all, it's not like any deceased person can tell us what being dead is like. Well, not under the normal circumstances anyway. With no proof of the afterlife's existence, we do unfortunately get left with the bleak and existentially terrifying assumption that when we die, there is nothing waiting for us on the other side. What if there is no light at the end of the tunnel, no pearly gates, just nothing forever? 
But what if someone or some mysterious group of persons already knew the answer to what happened after the end of all human life? And what if the answer was so much more horrifying than we ever could have imagined? So much so that this shadowy cabal had already tried to prevent the fate awaiting all of us after we die. Be warned, we're about to delve into the unsettling tale of something known as Project Demerang and its connection to something known as SCP-3448, as the Foundation categorizes it. It is a story about our fear of what comes next beyond this mortal coil. This is the catalyst for the Foundation uncovering the most horrific secret in human history, a truth that should have stayed buried. Warning, we are about to unravel the beginning of the end. The end of what, you might be asking? Why, the end of death itself, of course. Any outsider looking in might think we're being a little bit overdramatic here, but we'll forgive you for that mistake. You can have that one on us. At first glance to the untrained eye and uninformed individual, SCP-3448 might just seem like little more than a magnetic resonance imaging machine. Chances are you've seen these big machines in medical dramas, or maybe you've even been placed inside one during a stay at the hospital. Using powerful magnets, an MRI machine aligns all the protons in your body. Then the machine generates a pulse of radio frequency current to create a detailed image of the inside of a patient's body. Basically, to put it in extremely oversimplified terms, it's a big camera for looking at your internal organs. Now, don't forget to smile, really show off that pancreas. It looks great at this angle. Of course, when dealing with anomalies encountered by the SCP Foundation, few things are ever really exactly as they first seem. And in that very same vein, SCP-3448 is far more than just a harmless piece of medical apparatus. Look beyond the main bulk of the MRI machine, and you'll start to notice that a few unique modifications have been made to the device. For one, the winding mass of jumper cables connecting the machine to its rudimentary upgrades, namely the same type of technology used in particle accelerators, along with a whole collection of custom circuit boards. For another, although you wouldn't know just from looking at SCP-3448, the contraption has also been through a number of anomalous rituals, seemingly combining the technological with the occult and spiritual. But the question remains, why? What is this thing for exactly? To put it simply, it's a hotline to the great beyond. SCP-3448 is a means of communication with the world of the dead themselves. Now, we might be oversimplifying things yet again there, so let's take it from the top. Project Damarong was the name given to those who developed SCP-3448. That designation doesn't just refer to the modified MRI machine itself, but also the communication that said device was capable of after the Project Damarong team had finished their tinkering with it. You see, nobody knows what happens to us after we die, because no one has ever been able to experience being dead in the real world and existing in the afterlife at the same time. But with SCP-3448, that problem just simply isn't an issue anymore. Still with us so far? Okay, here's how the machine actually works. A living human is placed inside, just like those ordinary MRI machines at your local hospital. However, the difference here is that the extra anomalous components of SCP-3448, the rituals, the particle acceleration, and so on, allow this person to enter a unique state of being halfway between life and death. Their bodily functions are halted, brought to a stop by the machine. However, they are still able to retain their consciousness and the awareness that this allows for. Not quite dead, but not quite alive either. Sort of an unalive state or a half-death, if you prefer, or perhaps half-life. Now, while a person is in this half-death, they will have entered a conceptual state of being. This is referred to as SCP-3448-A, an existence of pure consciousness while physical form, in this case the person's body, exists separately in the real world. The body, now called SCP-3448-1, no longer houses a subject's consciousness, their essence, not just their mind, but their thoughts and personality. If it helps to think of it in theological terms, you could even think of it as their soul. But while the machine's function is all very impressive and interesting, what's the actual point to it? Why spend so much time trying to create a controlled separation of consciousness from a dead body? What's Project Damarong for? Well, 
That's easy. SCP-3448 is the primary tool intended to complete the sole objective of Project Demerang, a mission to capture a dangerous cognito hazard, namely, death itself. To be clear, when we say death, we don't mean the Grim Reaper, that skull-faced, scythe-wielding embodiment of oblivion. Chances are you can probably catch him just by going out on Halloween with a big net. But Project Damarung's goal was to contain the actual process of death, the very concept that takes a living, conscious entity and makes it the opposite. You see, when a living subject is placed in SCP-3448 and their consciousness leaves their brain, it leaves behind some kind of anomalous electrical energy signature. As you may already know if you can remember back to high school biology class, the brain uses electrical impulses to send signals all over the body, allowing your organs to function, your limbs to move, and your muscles to contract or relax. What's strange is, this electrical activity seems to continue within the brain of someone whose consciousness has been separated from their body by SCP-3448. Studying these signals, the SCP Foundation personnel working on Project Damarong have inferred that these are residual signals, replicating how the brain would react if the subject introduced into the half-dead SCP-3448-1 state as if they were still alive, even though they have to be dead in order to access that state in the first place. And now your brain is probably such a mess of electrical signals trying to keep up with all of that that you might have actually completely missed the part where we told you that Project Damarong is actually a foundation-backed project. Okay, let's have a speedy recap. So far, we have an anomalously modified MRI machine capable of splitting the consciousness, or soul, of a person after rendering them clinically dead. On top of that, the Foundation themselves sanctioned the project that created this device in an effort to capture and contain death itself. But how did this come about? Who among the SCP Foundation would want to contain death? so much to commission an entire project dedicated to that goal. Well, who do we all know sitting above the entire foundation, overseeing everything, infamous for all having some anomalous form of immortality, and would stand to gain from Project Damarong? That's right, the World Championship Death Dodgers, the O5 Council. You see, in order to more fully understand why Project Damarong was established and why they built SCP-3448, we need to explain a little bit about a different anomaly, SCP-2718. We have another video on this channel that goes into more detail about that, but to put it in a nutshell, SCP-2718 is the horrible truth about what happens to us after we die. The O5 Council first learned of it when one of their own, O5-11, full name Roger Sheldon, died of a stroke. O5-11 was the only Council member to have refused to accept any of the anomalous treatments or enhancements that prevented the other O5s from dying. However, the Council chose to resurrect him. Upon his return to the Land of the Living, Roger Sheldon told the other overseers what he had learned about the nature of the afterlife, what lies beyond this fleeting mortal coil, waiting for us after we die. Roger had experienced firsthand that the dead actually remain conscious after their bodies have shut down all other functions. That meant that everyone, every person to have died over the course of human history, has remained aware of everything that happened to them afterward. They can feel themselves slowly decaying, their bones and skin withering, buried under the cold, wasting away into nothingness day after day. And that's SCP-2718, the painful truth that there is no paradise, no heaven, no afterlife. There is just endless, silent consciousness beyond the end of every life. This revelation is what instigated the Overseer Council, specifically O5-4, to establish Project Damarong. It was learning the answer to what happens next that spurred the creation of SCP-3448. The intention was, by reading and interacting with those residual electrical signals in the brain, that the Foundation could create a link, a form of two-way communication between them and the living world and the subject, SCP-3448-A, in their half-dead state. Using other items and anomalous technology connected to the MRI machine, the Foundation's researchers could interpret the electrical signals in SCP-3448-A's brain as images. A Foundation agent by the name of Anthony Michaels proved to be the only test subject capable of using SCP-3448, 
beyond the earliest tests on animal specimens. And we know what you're thinking. The Foundation would normally use D-Class personnel for this sort of test. After all, it's a machine that renders you almost dead, stopping all bodily function. The problem was, Project Amarong needed someone loyal to the Foundation, and D-Classes could hardly be trusted to follow orders without the threat of death. Think about it. You separate their consciousness from their body, and they don't care if you threaten to kill them. Agent Michaels served as the SCP-3448-A component, residing within the modified MRI machine, held in a state between life and death. But something went wrong. Something that would ultimately do more harm than good. The Foundation had tried in vain to contain death, and in tampering with forces well beyond their own understanding, may have accidentally done something even worse. They neutralized it. They killed death. And things only went downhill from there. The Church of the Broken God We've mentioned these machine-revering evangelists in a countless number of videos here on SCP Explained before, and it's because they're one of the most prolific groups of interest out there, with 300,000 active members across the globe that we know of. They likely have more members and devotees than other iconic groups of interest, like the Serpent's Hand and the various cults of the Scarlet King combined. But how much do we really know about the Church of the Broken God? We've consulted Foundation historians and Mechanite scripture to find the answers and put together a truly comprehensive overview of this complex and often misjudged faction of the SCP Foundation multiverse. A faction that the Foundation may one day find themselves far more closely aligned with than they ever imagined to face an even greater foe. Give glory to the Broken God and let us begin our journey into his teachings. The Church of the Broken God is a slightly more centralized group than the Serpent's Hand, though that really isn't saying much. They're split into three overall subgroups over a series of schisms that we'll delve deeper into later. The Broken Church, the Cogwork Orthodox Church, and the Church of Maxwellism. Before we get into the differences between these three groups, let's take a quick look at what unites them. All splinter cells of the Church worship the technological deity Mechane, known by many names the most popular of which is the Broken God, or Goddess. They all believe that Mechane was split into pieces and is lying dormant. They all revere machinery and technology over flesh, which they view as broken, weak, or corrupt. And without exception, all of them are the sworn mortal enemies of the Sarkists. Just for context, the Sarkists are the perfect equals and opposites to the Church of the Broken God. Under the leadership of the God King Grand Karsist Ion and finding their origins in Mechane's counterpart, the primal and flesh-based Yaldabaoth, the Sarkists worship and revere the base concepts of flesh, corruption, and disease, despising everything that the Church stands for. It is important to make note of these facts, given just how much of the Church of the Broken God's history is defined by their conflicts with the Sarkists. More on that later. The Broken Church is the oldest and most traditional of these three main sects. They are led by a man named Robert Bomaro, a Mechanite holy man who, in 1946, just after the Seventh Occult War, ascended from a mere collector of church-based anomalous trinkets to the title of Builder of God after imbibing in SCP-217, also known as God's Ichor and his Broken Blood. Of all the church sects, the Broken Church is the most invested in conducting worship through active efforts to reconstruct the Broken God and bring about McCain's second coming. Of course, those of you who are familiar with SCP-001, the Ouroboros Cycle, will know that this sometimes has mixed results. After commissioning a counterfeit heart from the sinister folks at the factory, the Broken Church's most notable attempt at a full McCain resurrection went horrifically wrong resulting in a huge mechanical abomination that tore its way across Mexico, devouring everything it could until eventually being brought down by SCP-2399, a giant space cannon known as the Malfunctioning Destroyer. Anyway, now for a sect with a slightly less overtly destructive method of worshipping Mechane, the Cogwork Orthodox Church whom you may remember as the ones who gave Alexei Velotrov sanctuary after he was eventually freed from SCP Foundation containment. These worshippers innovated a practice known as standardization, which involved undergoing mechanical enhancement in order to appear closer to their maker. 
However, we aren't talking about sleek, technologically advanced cyborg parts here. The religious aesthetic of the Cogwork Orthodox is heavily inspired by the Industrial Revolution, with an emphasis on components such as gears or cogs. As such, members of the church who have undergone extensive modifications to remake themselves in the image of their god will often make loud ticking or tapping sounds, leading to the derogatory nickname tickers, often used among the other two sects. However, a major advantage of the church is that it is heavily organized and regulated from the top down, with rigid systems and strict rules against electrical or digital technology. Think of them as Catholicism to the broken church's Protestantism. The cogwork orthodoxy keeps to themselves, but we do know a great deal about their internal command structures. The orders of the cogwork orthodox church are as follows. At the very top of the pyramid are the patriarchs, a mysterious and insular group who have the ultimate word on church matters, and release missives that will later become the schema, the church's holy text. Below them are the schematists faithful, scholars and scribes who write and record the schema from the aforementioned teachings and commands of the patriarchs. The Gates Faithful are the internal affairs orders of the Cogwork Orthodox Church. They investigate matters going on within the faith, such as weeding out heretics and meditating internal disputes. They're one of the two orders permitted to carry weapons, the others being militants faithful, who act as the self-defense wing keeping the church safe from external threats and acting as ambassadors to outside groups. The next two orders are the Fabricators Faithful and the Inventors Faithful. The Fabricators act as foremen who oversee production on church properties, ensuring that only the finest quality is achieved. That's because, in addition to standardization, the Cogwork Orthodox Church believes that mass production of items using Industrial Revolution methods is also a viable form of worship for Mekain. This brings us to the inventors. They come up with new methods and designs for standardization and go on quests and explorations to discover the answers to any questions the church may have. But our information on the Cogwork Orthodox Church doesn't end there. Thanks to their truly extensive writings, we even know about the multitude of saints that the church reveres and their various purposes to followers of the church. For example, Saint Legate Trunion. She was the sneaky and covert patron saint of the Legate's faithful. There was also Saint Schematis Platon. She's the patron saint of the written word, of editors, of timetables, and of diagrammatic organization. Patron saint of the inventor's faithful, of designers, of repairmen, and of cognition engines. Saint Scranton, patron saint of spatial fabric manipulation, higher dimension mathematics, and anthracite coal extraction. Saint Fabricator Baffle, patron saint of workflow and the assembly line. Saint Inventor Chalk, patron saint of chorists. And Saint Inventor Enrichner, patron saint of the Entelechided. They have a pretty rigid structure and extensively recorded mythology is what we're saying here, just in case that didn't come across. This brings us to the Church of Maxwellism, the newest and smallest of the sects as well as the least combative. However, they pose the greatest threat of all to the SCP Foundation's quest to maintain a veneer of normality. That's because Maxwellists forego the extensive standardized body modifications of the Church of the Cogwork Orthodox and instead prefer smaller internal implants that allow them to interface directly with the internet from their brains. This allows them to fulfill their primary goal, spreading the good word of Mekane whom they refer to as WAN, all across the globe using the Information Superhighway, while also netting them the nickname Hummers among the other two sects. In contrast to the conformist elements of their sister organizations, Maxwellists embrace their individuality and unique traits, being highly decentralized but very communicative with their fellow believers. They believe WAN is a fragmented god, existing in the world of digitized data rather than clunky old hardware. With their extreme internet savvy, it's likely that they've brought in many new converts to the Broken God's cause, despite them being the youngest of all the overall religion's sex. But now we have an overview of the state of the Church of the Broken God today, and we must ask ourselves a second question. How did we get here? What is the history of the Church? To find the answer, we need to go back before the modern era, before the SCP Foundation, 
before even humanity itself. It begins when Mekane and Yaldabaoth created humanity. Yaldabaoth created the bodies of human beings, primal sensual creatures driven by base instincts and urges, and Mekane gave them their minds, reasonable, logical, and compassionate. For a time, the two would preside over mankind in harmony, but things would not stay that way forever. One of the earliest civilizations that the Foundation discovered interacting with these two deities was the anomalous Shah Dynasty, sometimes also referred to as the Shah Culture Group, which reigned in China from 2100 to 1600 BCE, though the only sources that confirm the very existence of the Shah Dynasty are anomalous. It was here that we heard the first whispers of the cult of the Broken God. To the Shah Dynasty, the being we would later call Mekane was known as the Father Serpent Fuxi, and Yaldabaoth was known as Mother Dragon Nyowa. Because the Shah Dynasty was anomalous all the way down, scholars of Father Serpent Fuxi were said to practice the Way of the Serpent, as he has always been associated with knowledge. The Way of the Serpent involved undergoing a physical transformation into a snake-like being to better resemble the deity, much like how modern Cogwork Orthodox Church followers try to reshape their bodies to better resemble their creator today. According to Shah Dynasty scripture, which would form the basis of the entire belief system of all sects of the church, Fusi broke down his own body and transformed himself into a brass cage around Mother Dragon Nyowa. However, unlike later iterations of the faith, the Shah Dynasty believed it was extremely important to see that the body of Fusi is never rebuilt, because to do so would lead to the release of Mother Dragon Nyowa and the end of the world. The civilization was started by a mythic figure known as the Yellow Emperor, who led the Sha dynasty to defeat other Fusi and Nyowa worshippers, then folding them into their own culture. Like many civilizations touched by Mekane, the Sha dynasty was incredibly scientifically advanced and skilled with metalworking. There's even evidence that the Sha dynasty created their own forms of the computer with effective artificial intelligence, as well as reality warping devices and even devices capable of interstellar travel. While the illustrious Shah dynasty would now be brought to its knees by a race of creatures known only as the Golden Crows, the next iteration of Broken God ancestors would be far closer to the worshippers we'd recognize today. This was the beginning of the Mechanite Empire, and by extension, the First War of the Flesh, the legendary extended conflict between the Mechanites and the Sarkists in the ancient world. Broken God cults were detected in Mycenaean Greece, a Greek civilization spanning the years 1600 to 1100 BCE. It was here where the broken god first took up the name Mekane, and eventually he amassed enough followers to allow the theocratic Mekanite Empire to truly be born, and it would remain in power from 1200 to 1000 BCE. Much like the church in the modern day, the Mekanite Empire saw the marriage of theocracy, politics, and classical military dictatorship. And much like the Shah dynasty before it, it was marked by both tight structure and control, as well as incredible metallurgic production and technological advancement. Partly due to considering all of these to be holy acts, they had strong strategic relations with Egypt, Assyria, and Canaan, and their mix of commercial strength and a dominant naval presence gave them serious geopolitical standing, even if their highly evangelical attitude didn't always win them friends on the world stage. A number of roots for modern Church of the Broken God beliefs were clearly established here, including the paradigm shift from wanting to avoid Mekane's rebuilding to expediting the rebuilding. Texts made around this time were also the first to contain references to the name Wan as an alternate title for Mekane, revealing the basis for later Maxwellist practices in the modern day. However, as we alluded to before, despite these incredible advancements, the true ravages of the First War of Flesh were upon the Mekanites here. The Sarkists, who had established the Adium Empire, were on the offensive. Thanks to Grand Karsist Ion and his Karsist minions, the Karsists, by the way, were high-level followers of Sarkicism capable of performing flesh magic, the Sarkis forces were more powerful than ever before. They had mobilized their troops and brought in trump cards the likes of which the Mechanites had never seen before. Giant flesh beasts that acted as living siege weapons, Human warriors turned into deadly monsters with sarkic magic, and the most deadly of all, a bioweapon that the Mechanites called the Red Death at the time, though we know it better as the flesh that hates. 
As is often the case in war, this led to unprecedented advancements in technology on the side of the Mechanites, too. The most notable example perhaps being SCP-2406, an incredible weapon of war known as the Colossus, which made for a formidable tool against the teeming forces of the Adium Empire. However, the advancements on both sides only made the war all the more brutal, with scores dying on both sides and both empires being severely weakened as the conflict stretched on. Things got so desperate for the Mechanites that they even joined forces with the infamously ruthless and savage Davites, the worshippers of the Scarlet King, to defeat the Sarkists. The decisive battle of the First War of Flesh was the Siege of Gyros, the Sarkic capital of Greece, where Mechanites eventually breached the stronghold and slaughtered the Karsists within. Another missive sent from the Sarkist field commander Karsis Tundas read, Grand Karsist Ion. May this missive find you at Kaithira, for it shall be my last. Our enemies have begun their assault on the island. The fallen kingdoms and followers of Mekain have united against us, even as the nations crumble. The wounds sustained today will heal. Into the ages of ages we are undying. I vow that none are to leave this island alive. We summon the Red Death for the blood of heathens. We sacrifice ourselves. We will meet again in Editum. But while the Mechanite Empire won the war, they didn't survive it. Due to the people lost and the resources expended, the Empire fully collapsed shortly afterwards. Some survivors renounced their Mechanite faith and entered other cultures. Some splintered off to preach and practice mechanism elsewhere. The remainder settled on the secretive island of Amini to form their own city-state. Here they replenish their numbers and forces over the centuries, maintaining secrecy to avoid intervention from outsiders and vengeful Sarkists. By the 6th century BCE, the Mechanites from the city-state of Amini were developing a degree of regional power once more, thanks to the boon provided by their advanced technology. They were no longer a military powerhouse, but the tiny state instead became a trade juggernaut providing mechanical goods and weapons to nearby civilizations that in turn provided the protection that the Mechanites so sorely required. Their cultures would later be influenced by the Roman Empire and various Pythagorean cults, who inspired a love of numerology and cosmic harmony in this ancient civilization returning shakily to its feet. The 5th century BCE became known as the Golden Age of Mechanite literature, and the state continued to grow through military alliances with the Achaemenid Empire and the Kingdom of Carthage. However, the city-state of Amini was eventually wiped out for good in the 1st century BCE. Followers of the Broken God faith remained, but they were scattered to the wind for almost 2,000 years until the Industrial Revolution struck the Western world. Seeing the great machines of industry rise up seemingly overnight convinced the lingering cells of broken god worshippers that perhaps, after a millennia, Mekane was now preparing to return. They assembled into what is now known as the Broken Church and began preaching the good word. And considering the industrial fever of raw, unfettered progress gripping the world at the time, the Gospel of Mekane seemed to be an attractive prospect indeed. Meanwhile, debate was raging inside the ever-growing church about the nature of adapting oneself mechanically, a practice that had been out of fashion since the days of the original Mechanites. Broken church loyalists believed that modification through any means other than drinking the god's ichor, like Robert Bermaro would later do, is an insult to Mechane. Others, however, saw it as a tribute and a way of getting closer to their creator. This was the issue that caused the first New Age Schism and led to the formation of the Cogwork Orthodox Church during the 1840s. The faith would never be the same after this. The various Broken God splinter cells found a lucrative market in converting wealthy industrial oligarchs of the production boom and talking them into becoming glorified sugar daddies for their various new augmentation experiments, all to becoming post nibanic beings meaning mechanical entities who leave the unreliable world of flesh behind for good and commune with the shiny metal infinite. In exchange, these industrialists would be provided with advanced mechanite knowledge of manufacturing as well as technology far beyond their years. Everyone was a winner, well, except the SCP Foundation, but we'll touch on that whole debacle soon. 
By the closing of the 19th century, it seemed like the Cogwork Orthodox Church might totally outmode its predecessors at the Broken Church. However, the early 20th century would bring the mysterious Robert Bomero onto the scene. Bomero was a mysterious man with unknown abilities and connections, but he soon commanded power and respect, taking over the Broken Church and even being taken seriously in rival sects. He gathered up a group of trusted enforcers and augmented them into his disciples, supposedly being able to speak directly to Mekane. He and his loyalists collected hundreds of artifacts relating to the Broken God, blowing the minds of all involved with just how quickly he was able to do so. He disappeared in 1943 and was gone for three years, during which time he conducted the famous God's Iker ceremony and returned to his people as the self-styled Builder of God. This made him an even more esteemed figure across the world of the Broken God, a kind of Pope of Mekane, supposedly bearing a direct line of contact with the Divine. There would be a defining schism in the late 20th century that produced the Church of Maxwellism, as some wished to move beyond the outdated dogma of the Cogwork Orthodox Church, and began administering electronic augmentations rather than just analog machinery. This resulted in a huge controversy for Church members, as the patriarchs reacted swiftly with a slew of excommunications. Those excommunicated would soon become the first wave of Maxwellists, and take the tenets of the broken god into the internet age. All of these groups have made trouble for the Foundation in their own way, from the online evangelizing of Maxwellists leaking classified knowledge, to the weirdness of the cogwork tickers being impossible to ignore, to the frequent battles between the Foundation and the Broken Church over items which they believe to be parts of Mekane. However, if certain prophecies are to be believed, the relationship between the Foundation and the Church won't remain frosty forever. One day, perhaps they'll even stand metal to fleshy shoulder beside the Sarkis too, against a threat far more dangerous than all of them combined. The woman fell to the ground, clutching her ankle in pain. It had crunched badly as she'd fallen, and now as she looked down at it, she could see that it was bent totally out of shape. The heavy metal collar choking her neck made it difficult for her to catch her breath as she tried her best not to hyperventilate. The rain was hammering down so ferociously that she could barely see more than 20 feet in any direction, but she didn't need to see far to know how deadly of a predicament she had found herself in. She cried out at the top of her voice for someone to come and find her, anyone, but the only sound that filled her ears was the wild howling of the wind and the steady hammering of water into the bog all around her. She would get hypothermia and die. No, wait, she couldn't, could she? She knew she couldn't die, but she also knew that she was still capable of suffering. Just how bad would it feel to be in the clutches of hypothermia with a broken ankle and know that no matter how bad the pain and suffering got, she would never feel the release of death? She closed her eyes, trying her best not to think of the worst possibilities, just as the sound of gunfire erupted in the nearby buffer. She cried out again, holding both hands up in the air, doing the best she could around the heavy metal collar, but no one shouted out in reply. There was a pause in the gunfire. Maybe they'd heard her. Maybe they were trying to figure out a way to come down and rescue her. Crack! A bullet split open a rotted tree trunk just a few feet to her right. The woman threw her hands over her head and cowered in the dirt, feeling the metal of her collar digging into her skin tighter than ever. Please don't let it happen again, she prayed silently into the dirt. Encased in the collar around her neck were 4.5 kilograms of plastic explosives, each with a fragmentation layer pointed inwards towards her neck and head. With just a push of a button, they could. She didn't want to think about it. All she knew was that she couldn't let that happen to her again. Looking through eyes bloodied with tears and rain, she saw, lying in the dirt just a few feet away from her, that infernal machine that was the sorry cause of all of this. The SCP Foundation has long stood as a bastion of hope, information, and security for the entirety of the human race. I'm sure you are well aware of the number of world-destroying catastrophes that have been adverted by the hard-working researchers, agents, and other members of the Foundation, all without the general public having the slightest clue that something was amiss. With state-of-the-art holding cells all over the globe, 
and the sharpest minds humanity has ever produced working around the clock to ensure the protection of humanity. It is hard to imagine an entity that should not be contained by such a group. And yet, one such entity does exist. SCP-001 You may have come across the O5 Council by this point. While the SCP Foundation operates beyond the world's jurisdiction, the O5 Council operates beyond the Foundation's jurisdiction. The rules, methods, and protocols that are the cornerstone of securing, containing, and protecting countless entities around the world sometimes cannot be applied. Certain entities require us to temporarily abandon our humanity, abandon our sense of order, and step briefly into chaos for the greater good. I'm telling you all of this because SCP-001 is not held in a containment cell. There are no keypads, locked doors, observation windows, or health and safety forms. SCP-001 is not confined to a specific territory or even a specific country. For some SCPs, this is a practical necessity. Serpents that are hundreds of kilometers long swimming through the depths of the ocean, for example. But for SCP-001, it serves a more psychological purpose. The Scottish Highlands are the most remote part of the United Kingdom. Out there, you can walk for miles and miles without seeing a single soul. Open countryside, mountains, lochs, and forests surround you in all directions. The weather is harsh and unrelenting, the walking even more so. On a regular basis, walkers fall and break their legs, but without phone service or anyone else nearby to come and help, they can quickly disappear into the wilderness forever. The peat bogs of Scotland used to see human sacrifices in early settlements. Afraid of the ghosts and spirits that haunted the bogs, people would throw their family members into the deepest parts and watch them drown, hoping that whatever was lurking beneath wouldn't come and find them. So as the group of soldiers crested the top of the mountain and looked down beneath them to the eerie peat bogs obscured by mist and constant rainfall, you would forgive a shiver running up their spines. But of course, it didn't. That was because this group of soldiers were quite unlike any others that humanity has ever produced. All were nameless. None of them existed on any government databases, on any foundation databases, or even on the databases of the O5 Council itself. Their individual backgrounds, nationalities, and families were totally unknown to everyone other than themselves. Some had been tortured for years, others had been the torturers. The thing that united them, however, was their inhuman ruthlessness. A squad of eight soldiers utterly devoid of any sense of empathy. What could they possibly have to be afraid of in the peat bogs when they themselves were the evil ghosts walking through? But then, one person was afraid. A shiver ran up her spine as she looked over the edge and down into the murky black and green below. SCP-001-1 Around her neck was the bomb collar. Each of the eight soldiers surrounding her had a button mounted on a watch on the back of their wrists. At any moment, any one of them could hit the button, and all four and a half kilograms of plastic explosives would go off, sending her on an express trip to oblivion. Aside from the collar, she wore a plain white dress made of cotton. It was muddy and torn apart at the hem from days of walking through the Scottish wilderness. When she had first arrived, she had begged those around her to supply her with some warm clothes, something practical that would keep her comfortable and stave off any illness. Her requests, however, had not been acknowledged. Clutching in her trembling, outstretched hands was the machine, SCP-001-A. From its external experience, you would think it was nothing more than a wooden box, a perfect cuboid made from glossy dark wood. There were no symbols, no seams, no latches, nothing to indicate any method of operation. When the woman and the machine had first been delivered into the hands of the O5 Council, the researchers had spent weeks and millions of dollars trying to activate the machine. Their best scientists had scanned for every possible form of radiation and tried every method they could conceive to stimulate the box into opening. The ultimate failed attempt involved traveling to North Korea, where they negotiated placing the box 20 centimeters beneath a small nuclear warhead in return for granting the dictatorship key information on how to construct such a weapon. As we have established, the O5 Council operates beyond any kind of jurisdiction. 
Yet, at the bottom of the irradiated crater sat a perfectly intact wooden box that was cool to the touch and showed no signs of radioactivity. Only one person could interact with the box and unearth the secrets that were inside. SCP-001-1, the woman who stood trembling on the side of the mountain. A gun jabbed her in the back, forcing her to continue moving. She had asked the soldiers around her how much longer they had to walk that day, but none of them had replied. They never did. In the six years that she had been held hostage by this tiny militia, she had never once heard any of them say a word, not even to each other. Perhaps it was this telepathic understanding that seemed to run between them that unnerved her the most. Despite having never spoken to each other, each soldier seemed to understand the others intimately, and she had no doubt that any one of the eight would press the button on their wrist at a moment's notice. Sadly for her, she knew this from experience. The incident happened four years ago now, as the group was traveling through Patagonia. It was a day almost identical to the one she was having now. They had been transported by a helicopter flown by one of the eight into the middle of the wilderness. There they had marched for days without saying a single word. Exhaustion had overtaken her legs, and she stumbled to the ground. Unfortunately for her, this happened slightly too close to the female soldier in front of her. Her knees hadn't even hit the ground before the blast went off. The woman didn't remember it, of course. How could she? In an instant, her mind had been utterly destroyed. What she did remember was the next 18 months as her body slowly healed itself one brain cell at a time. It wasn't so much like waking up from a nightmare, it was more constructing a nightmare slowly, alongside your consciousness as neuron by neuron your brain reformed itself, each individual cell screaming in terror at what had happened to it. They had her marching again before she was fit to move. Her motor controls had been all over the place, she had fallen over regularly, and the terror of having one of the soldiers push the button again engulfed her with every movement. And yet, perhaps the most incredible thing about SCP-001-1 was the fact that if you had asked her if she should have been held in this kind of containment, she would immediately have agreed without batting an eye. The only person capable of opening the box, she recognized how dangerous her existence was. Only she had seen into the mysteries of the box, only she had seen the horrors laid inside of it, and so only she could fully understand the gravity of their situation. They kept her on the move in order to keep the world safe. Had she been held in a containment cell, she would have posed too great of a risk. Out here in the wilderness, the entire planet was her containment cell, hidden in the middle of humanity's biggest haystack. No one, not even the O5 Council's central command, knew her location. The only people who were aware of it at any given time were herself and the eight soldiers surrounding her with guns drawn. So you can imagine her horror when, out of the sheets of rain, appeared the figure of a person carrying a rifle. The gunfire broke out before SCP-001-1 even had a chance to hit the ground. Bullets whizzed through her hair and cracked open the rocks all around her. The eight soldiers surrounding her dive for cover as the figure in the rain slumped to the ground lifeless. One of the soldiers grabbed the woman by her explosive collar and threw her behind a rock. Clasping her hands over her ears, she closed her eyes and waited for the fight to be over. No one was shooting, until a second figure emerged from the rain waving their arms wildly. Gunfire again. She wasn't quite sure what had happened, but all of a sudden, the woman was falling down the cliff. She had just been trying to shift her position to get deeper into cover, but she clearly hadn't noticed just how close to the edge she was. Down and down and down she fell until, with a crack in her ankle, she landed in the peat bog. Gunfire cracked on the mountain above her, but the only thought that filled the woman's mind was the terror that at any moment, the explosive collar around her neck would be detonated as one of the soldiers above her realized that she was missing. Seconds passed as the fear mounted in her chest. With each passing moment, the anxiety grew more and more crippling. She had to know. She had to prepare herself if it was about to happen. She had to use the machine and look into the future. Dragging herself forward through the muck, the woman snatched at the wooden box. It came alive at her touch, 
Different pieces shifted and opened beneath her fingers like some kind of elaborate puzzle. No one had taught her how to use this thing. It just happened. Her fingers would just dance across its surfaces, pushing and pulling, opening and closing, twisting and turning, and locking into place until all of a sudden, there it was. The box was wide open in front of her. Taking a deep breath and allowing the rain to fall on her head for another brief moment, the woman leaned forward and stepped into the box. On the trail above her, the gunfire stopped. Without a word of communication, the soldiers had deftly flanked the group of people who had approached them. In less than a minute, they neutralized each individual that came their way. In unison, the group of them walked up to the bodies, turning them over to examine their faces. They were nobodies, just a group of hikers lost in the rain. What had looked like a gun turned out to be nothing more than a walking pole. Five of them in total, none of them older than 24. Without words, the soldiers picked up the bodies and threw them over their shoulders as they scrambled their way down to the cliffs to the woman in the machine beneath them. Once they reached the bottom of the slope, they discarded the five bodies carelessly into the bog. Within a couple of hours, those five hikers would have sunk to the bottom and begun the long process of being embalmed into the depths. Perhaps someone would find them in a few thousand years' time as part of an archaeological dig, perhaps, but it was not their concern. The eight soldiers surrounded the women, guns drawn, and stared at her coldly. I used the machine, she told them. I used it without your permission. I, I don't know what the rules are. I don't know if we even have any rules here, but I, I thought you should know. The soldiers continued to look at her in silence. The box was closed now, sitting back on her lap as it always was. I, I try to see my future. Anytime I've used the box before, I've looked at the lives of others. I've seen economic crashes, climate disasters, genocides, wars, love, and life, and death. I've done so at the hands of the O5 Council, as they've told me, given them the information and prevented the destruction of the world. Never once have I looked at my own future." The soldiers lifted her to her feet and tried to march her onwards, not listening to a word she was saying. Her broken ankle buckled and screamed beneath her. She had to hop to keep up with them. What other choice did she have? They would push the button if she didn't. She didn't know why she kept talking, but she did. For the first time, the machine lied to me. I saw that I was assassinated in 1987 in Cuba. It was years before I even built the box. Before any of this happened to me, I, I saw in my future that I no longer existed. That the machine no longer existed, but that future was years ago, and none of it happened. The machine doesn't lie, so why is it lying to me now? Why can't I see my own future? If any of the soldiers were paying attention, they didn't show it. They just continued to march her into the rain, as the bomb weighed heavily around her neck. Did you hear that not so long ago, a five-year-old boy went up against 12 of Russia's greatest chess grandmasters, and do you know what happened? He lost every single match. That's because winning at chess, dear viewers, isn't easy. Chess is an ancient game of strategy, cunning, and skill. It's not just about thinking one step ahead of your opponent. That's not going to be enough. Make a wrong prediction, and you could end up sacrificing one of your pieces, as well as vital space on the board. But thinking two to three steps ahead, beating your adversary's moves before they've even been made, now there's a viable strategy. Tricky, but viable. After all, if it was easy, we'd all be Queen's Gambit level chess prodigies. Eric Matthews had never been good at the game, but he had a pretty substantial reason to keep trying. And that reason's name was Brian Matthews, his father. You see, for as long as Eric could remember, his dad had regarded a high level of skill on the chessboard to be a sign of intellectual superiority. Intelligence was something that Brian put quite a considerable value on, given that he was a professor at a university in their home country of England. Some of Eric's earliest memories were of playing chess with his dad, usually on a Friday night when Brian got home after a week of giving lectures to the next generation of scholars. Obviously, with his son at such a young age, the professor would take it easy on Eric, playing in a much laxer fashion, focusing instead on teaching the boy the basics of the game. And for a time at least, it was good. It was a rare time that Eric and his academic father could spend bonding. After all, with his mother gone, his dad was all he had. But as the years passed, the game changed. By the time Eric was a teenager, Brian had stopped pulling his punches on the chessboard. He hoped his son would build on what he'd learned when they played in the past, using those skills to best his dad on the board. But to Eric, 
Playing chess had never been about a purely educational experience. It was more about spending time with his old man. Time after time, the young man's pawns fell prey to Brian's expertly considered and far more competitive moves. Try as he might, Eric couldn't best his dad. He tried his best, and never stopped putting the effort into every game. But thinking too hard about one possible plan of attack left him wide open to a counter-strategy from the professor. Over and over again, he landed himself in checkmate, or made illegal moves without even realizing it, every time earning criticism and chastisement from his scholarly father. Every game, it got worse. It was like Eric could feel his father's gaze and the weighty expectations behind it with each move he made across the board. There were so many nights where he wondered if it would be better to give up entirely, to knock down his own king and concede, but how could he ever find any other shared interests with his dad beyond the two of them playing chess? It had become a lifeline, tethering father and son together, and to cut it now left Eric uncertain if he'd sink or be able to swim alongside Brian. He had long admired his father. His achievements in academia were impossible to avoid, with more framed certificates hung up on the walls than there were photos of the pair of them together. But the shadow it cast over him made Eric desperate to keep this one shred of common ground alive. Eric wasn't the type to give up, despite how much of an uphill struggle the situation felt like. Taking a leaf out of his professor father's scholarly ways, he decided to learn the game inside and out, every known move and strategy. He would research the entire history of chess itself, if that's what it took to play with the same skill as his dear old dad. Over the coming weeks, Eric checked out every book at his local library on the subject, beginner's guides, advanced rule books, and even a few volumes on notable players throughout the extensively long history of the game. Along the way, a chapter of a certain book stood out to Eric. It described a chess prodigy from Russia, who had created an early mechanical chess device known as the Samurai. It had been designed to be a traveling curiosity, and would sit playing chess games against volunteers taken from a spectating audience, each one of them having forked over some of their hard-earned money to watch this man-made wonder. The Russian chess prodigy's young daughters also had a love for the game, Seeing that gave Eric a pang of jealousy, wondering if those daughters had as much trouble playing their own father as he did with Brian. But at least there was an underlying shred of hope there too. If this father and his daughters could bond over chess, maybe there was a chance for Eric and his dad too. Sadly, it's one thing to try and learn all the facts you can about chess. It's an entirely different beast to put all that information to use and apply it to an actual game. Despite having read every book he could get his hands on, Eric still couldn't best Brian at the board. It was like nothing had changed. His father barely noticed when Eric tried to replicate movesets he'd read up on and still managed to not only counter those moves, but check his queen in the process. So practice, Eric thought. After all, practice was supposedly meant to make perfect, right? The plan was simple. If he practiced his chess moves enough times and figure out how he could call on what he'd learned, then he might stand a chance at winning when he and his dad played each other. There was just one hiccup to this plan. Eric needed someone to practice against. The only other person in the house was Brian, meaning it was that hiccup that turned into a problem almost big enough to stop Eric in his tracks. That is, until he went into his father's lab. It was under the house itself, a sort of sub-level, maybe used as a basement or cellar by the previous owners. But since Professor Matthews and his son had lived there, the entire room had been remodeled into an at-home laboratory. Not a terribly advanced one, of course. This was the early 90s, after all. The majority of Brian's time, even when he was at home instead of working at the university, was spent on his own, downstairs in the lab. Eric had gone down there in search of his dad, to ask him if there was anyone whom he knew who he could practice and develop his chess skills with. But instead, what he found down there was the last thing he expected to see. Not that he had any clue exactly what it was at first. The thing was some kind of bizarre contraption, a collection of components that didn't seem to be in any logical configuration. However, it was primarily composed of something that Eric recognized all too well, a chess table. This one was metal, steel to be precise, 
and seemed to be hooked up to some sort of computer. While back in the 90s, computers were hardly as commonplace as they are now, Eric had seen a fair few at school and the library. Although, this one was different. It seemed old. Far older than Eric thought computers had been around for. As far as he knew, they'd only really come to prominence in the mid-80s. But this computer looked like it predated even that period. Noticing another part of the contraption, a large steam engine with the words, manufactured by Maudsley Sons and Field, established 1840 engraved on one side, made it seem that this whole device had been around since the Victorian era. The next part that caught his eyes was the chess pieces themselves, each one standing neatly in its place on the board. They looked delicate, intricately carved from some smooth substance. For a moment, Eric toyed with the thought of how they could even be made from bone, noticing how each pawn, knight, rook, bishop, king, and queen were all about the size of a human finger bone. He dismissed the idea. Nobody would ever do something like that. <laughs> Eric grabbed a sheet covering a large component hooked up to the mess. Lifting it away in a swift pull, it unveiled what was sitting beneath. A full suite of 18th century samurai armor. Eric looked closer at the embellishments on the surface of the pauldrons. He was no expert on feudal Japan, but it looked authentic enough to be the real thing, if not a very close approximation. Taking a look at the collection of oddities all tethered together in his father's lab, a certain detail of all his chess research came to the forefront of Eric's mind. The armor that had given it away. This was the Samurai, or at the very least, a crude homemade version of it that his dad had put together. But if it worked, it was also something to practice against. It didn't take Eric long to start tinkering with the contraption trying to get it to work. All the while, the question of why his dad owned such a thing kept drumming up noise in the back of his head. Had Brian built it, or was this the original made by that Russian chess prodigy? Was this machine the reason that Eric's dad possessed such an unbeatable skill at chess? And would using it give him the edge he needed to best him at the game and earn his father's respect? After what felt like hours upon hours of trial and error with a machine he could barely comprehend, Eric seemed to have cracked it. As far as he could tell, the steam engine powered the whole contraption and could be set to five different speeds labeled on the side in Roman numerals. The power from the engine was then fed to some kind of sophisticated mechanism that was within the suit of samurai armor, allowing it to move, and what appeared to be a series of electromagnets that moved the chess pieces and kept them on the board. Flicking it onto the third highest of the five speed levels, the machine whirred into life. The sound of creaking and grinding of metal filled the lab. Kneeling opposite, Eric went to make the first move, only to stop himself. It wasn't that he changed his mind about practicing against the samurai, but because of the speed he'd set it to. Determining that the settings might have correlated to difficulty levels, Eric figured that if he really wanted to get the most rigorous practice to really hone his chess moves, he needed to commit fully. Reaching for the dial, he turned the device up to its fifth and highest speed, then made his first move. He pushed one of the bone-colored prawns forward by a single square and waited. A split second passed, and the arm of the early automaton responded with its first counter move. It was quick, almost moving with the same natural fluidity and speed as an actual human being, albeit still with a little bit of creaking and some slight clockwork-like stutters. But it worked nonetheless. The machine could play. The tension over the first game was palpable, forming a layer of sweat over Eric's forehead. Every whir and tick of the machine gave the impression that they were playing with a stop clock timing each of their moves, adding to the urgency. Despite this, Eric Matthews tried his best to stay calm. This was practice after all, a dry run, not the inevitable game he'd play against his dad. With every move he made, his heart drummed against his ribs, uncertain he'd made the right call. Each time the robotic hand cruelly knocked over one of his pieces away, Eric felt a surge of frustration, but told himself to quell it. He kept focused, using what he'd researched to adapt and respond accordingly to each of the machine's moves until… checkmate. He'd beaten it. He might have lost everything save for a knight, a rook, his king, and queen, but he had won. Trapped without anywhere else to move on the board, the metal finger of the automaton conceded the game knocking over its own king in resignation. Panting, 
Heart racing from the sheer excitement of being on the winning side of a game, Eric hurriedly gathered up and reset all the pieces. He had to go again, not just so that he could be certain it wasn't a fluke, but to make sure he had what it took to take on his professor father. Back and forth Eric went with the chess machine, over and over again. They were fairly evenly matched it seemed. Eric won the second game, only to be best on the next two, but it was some time afterward, he had lost count of exactly how many rounds later, that things started to change. Maybe it was the age and condition of the Victorian-era chess computer, the natural wear and tear stopping it from functioning properly, but Eric noticed that the samurai started to make moves that were illogical, that practically offered him the upper hand with no discernible strategy behind them. Then its movements became flat out illegal, disregarding the directions and number of squares each different piece was allowed to move. Before long, it was moving them erratically around the chessboard, refusing to cooperate and forcing Eric to call an end to the day's practicing. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be the end of the unusual things that would happen that day. Did you send me that weird email? Was the first question Eric's dad asked him when he returned home, looking noticeably under the weather. Confused, Eric said that he had no idea what his father was talking about. Professor Matthews then went on to describe what he'd received on his work computer. It had been an email, with a file attached to it named Shakmedi, a word in Russian that translates to chess. Embedded in the email below, although it had taken a long time to load being opened on a 1990s computer, there had apparently been a photo as well. It was rather odd, Eric, Brian went on, quite unnerving to tell the truth. Black and white, all sort of distorted and stretched, but it looked like two young girls, one grinning and the other screaming. I've been feeling, well, not quite myself since I saw it. With that, Brian excused himself, stating that he'd been suffering from headaches and a high temperature, and as a result needed to go and lay down. It wasn't like his father to get ill, Eric thought. But of course, he had no reason to assume it was anything serious. Probably just a spate of fatigue after a long day of teaching at the university. No cause for concern. If only that's all it was. Within a few hours, Brian was completely restless. So unable to sleep that simply taking a nap was impossible. He kept calling to Eric, complaining of the sound of childlike laughter coming from somewhere in the house. But his son hadn't heard anything. By the time the sun went down, Eric was trying to calm his dad down through a rush of intense anxiety that gripped him. Brian had been claimed to be hallucinating, seeing the warped faces of two girls that frightened him half to death. It was getting late, long past the time that they usually played chess together, but for now Eric's mind was focused solely on helping his dad. For a while he seemed to be able to calm his father down, only to realize Brian wasn't settled at all. He was awake eyes open, fully conscious, but wasn't responding at all to Eric asking if he was alright. Instead, the accomplished academic just stared blankly into space. Eric had been up all night, exhausted, worried for Brian's safety, and completely clueless about what was happening to him. After a while of being non-responsive, his dad seemed to regain a little bit of lucidity once more, but his behavior was erratic. Take me back to work, I, I need to get on my computer, Brian demanded of his son. When Eric refused, that's when his dad got angry and agitated. Professor Brian Matthews was sadly found dead within the next few months. Several months later, as the sole executor of his father's estate and last living relative, Eric had to be the one to go through his dad's personal belongings. Volumes upon volumes of thick academic books, his smart, scholarly clothes. The house was almost clear now, save for one thing that was left in the basement lab. Flicking on the light switch, Eric looked at the samurai sitting motionless, still uncovered after their last practice game. He'd sold off the chess pieces to a collector in New York. Now it was just an empty oddity. Eric placed a king on the board, one of the ones that he and his dad had used when they played each other. With a gentle flick of his finger, he toppled it, resigning to the strange automaton and leaving it there in the laboratory. He wasn't sure how but he had some kind of gut feeling that this chess machine had somehow been responsible for his father's fate. Of course, Eric had no idea what the device actually was, and what, or who, lay beneath its whirring metal parts. SCP-1875 is the designation given to this machine now, and has been ever since the Foundation recovered it not long after Eric sold his father's house. They are able to learn much more about it than young Mr. Matthews or even the late Professor Matthews ever had. 
not just how to make it work or what its function was, but who had built it and who had been used to build it. Although details of his real name eluded the Foundation's top researchers, they were able to uncover newspaper articles about the device from all over Russia, America, and England, dating back to the early 1990s. The Russian chess prodigy who'd invented it and toured the chess playing machine around had used some interesting components to make his automaton. Maybe they were what derived its skill at the game and its apparent temperament when the device was made to play at maximum speed for too long. He had used his daughters to make the machine. Deep within the heart of this early form of computer, the two girls' brain tissue had been hooked up to the electromagnets. The machine's moves were theirs, each pawn or rook shifting across the black and white squares of the board. Every rule or strategy their prodigy father had taught, it all determined how the device played. Their minds, taken from their skulls, were now the analytical engine of their father's creation. The bones of their fingers he'd carved into chess pieces. Over the coming weeks, the Foundation naturally ran their usual slew of tests on SCP-1875, playing multiple games of chess against it. Every time, they increased the machine's five levels of speed, until it started behaving erratically while on the highest setting. Shortly after, Every member of personnel working on SCP-1875 received a bizarre email. It contained a file, named with the Russian word for chess, and a photograph of the stretched, distorted, smiling, and screaming faces of two young girls. Faces that you might be seeing very soon. Hey there, thrill seekers! Are you ready to get crazy? Are you ready to get extreme? Are you ready to taste the real hardcore? We here at SCP Explained know that you love a little excitement in your life. You're the kind of stone-cold, solid-gold bad dude whose idea of a relaxing afternoon is a staring contest with SCP-173. And you're so tough you're gonna make the peanut blink first. You're the kind of person who'd punch SCP-682 and make him apologize for grazing your fist. You wouldn't even back down from the Scarlet King himself, making the monarch of ultimate despair say, That's pretty cool, man. Respect. But if you want a genuine thrill ride, something that'll really put hair on your chest, you need to get your butt on a truly hardcore roller coaster. What? Too chicken? Afraid of a little motion sickness or something? Or maybe you've been freaked out by some of the so-called horrifying accidents that happened on roller coasters, like the 1972 Big Dipper disaster, or the 1986 Fantasyland Mindbender catastrophe. Get real. When has a little death scared anyone at the SCP Foundation? And besides, Nothing is more awesome than an extreme roller coaster! And believe us, any other roller coaster will feel like kitty stuff compared to the absolute beast that we're gonna tell you about today. If you're a roller coaster novice, maybe you should try something like the Takabisha over in the Fuji Q Highland theme park in Japan. This baby boasts a 121 degree drop, famous for making people fall out of their seats. Or maybe you wanna try something like Yukon Striker over in Canada. This Widowmaker of a coaster has floorless seats, a 360-degree flip, four inversions, and a 75-meter drop. That's a little too tame for your taste? <laughs> if you're feeling really brave, you can hop on the King Ka over in the New Jersey Six Flags theme park. You'll get a super-fast 90-degree climb, followed by a bone-stripping 139-meter drop, a 129-foot camel hump, and a 270-degree spiral. Ha! That'll give you a healthy dose of vitamin G-force. Why are we telling you all about this? Because compared to SCP-2183, all those coasters are like riding a tricycle with stabilizers in your mom's backyard. There's no coaster more powerful, more thrilling, and more adrenaline pumping than SCP-2183. Let's take a look at some of the specs. You can find this bad boy in an undisclosed location somewhere in Idaho. This ride is so hardcore, the Killjoys over at the SCP Foundation don't want you to ride it. But if the Lamos over at the Foundation had their way, nobody would be having any fun. Am I right? Look at how they put the kibosh on the Carnival of Horrors, or as they call it, SCP-823. Anyone who wants to go on one of those rides will just have met the business end of a Foundation sniper rifle. And think about all the kids who've been deprived of the awesome childhood experience of Cragglewood Park aka SCP-2571, because the Foundation party poopers decided to rain on everybody's parade. It's safe to say that if the Foundation wants to keep you away from it, you're gonna have a dope time with it. And the SCP-2183 roller coaster is no exception. 
They have the whole park blocked off and patrolled by at least four security guards at any given time. People who see this piece in action are given Class F amnestics, and they've spared no expense in suppressing anything about this coaster to end all coasters in the media. But trust us, getting a ride on this thing is totally more than worth getting on the SCP Foundation's bad side. That's right, this killer coaster has a max height of 37.2 meters and a max speed of almost 90 kilometers per hour. You can't drive that fast anywhere but the Autobahn over in Germany. Sure, it may technically be unfinished, but this bad boy still has a physical track length of 798.8 meters. You're probably wondering why we said physical there, right? That's because when it comes to SCP-2183, the real ride starts when the track comes to an end, baby. When the ride starts a rolling, it blasts down the normal tracks like a bullet. But when the track ends and the carts fire off, they don't fall. No way. The carts keep speeding mid-air, continuing on the intended track from the roller coaster's initial badass blueprints. But that doesn't mean this ride does everything by the books. SCP-2183 is a ride that knows how to party. There's never any predicting the exact ride length, because every time the carts fire off the uncompleted section of track, they take a totally different path back to the start. That makes SCP-2183 officially the most unpredictable roller coaster in the entire world. The shortest recorded length of the non-physical section of track is 1,080 meters. That's almost double the length of the physical track. And the maximum length of the non-physical portion of the track has been 5,460 meters, which is over twice the length of the Nagashima Spa Land Steel Dragon 2000, the longest roller coaster in the world. But we know what you adrenaline junkies are thinking. It ain't just the length that gets a major buff, it's also the height and speed. Top recorded heights on the mid-air tracks have been up to 100 meters, making it the fifth tallest roller coaster in the world. And speeds have reached a face-melting 180 kilometers an hour, making it the fourth fastest roller coaster in the world. But maybe like Shania Twain, that don't impress you much. We get it. You're probably thinking, fifth tallest? Fourth fastest? I thought you said this coaster was truly hardcore, SCP explained. But like a good coaster, that's just because we haven't hit you with the big twist yet. That twist being, everything we just told you only applies to when the carts are empty. When someone is actually on this absolute monster of a roller coaster, it starts to do things you wouldn't believe. For you to really understand just how off the rails crazy this train can go, we've got to tell you about D93730, also known as the Rider. When the Rider woke up that morning, neither he nor the Foundation researchers handling him knew he was going to become a legend. As far as D classes go, this guy was actually pretty lucky seeing that he'd been convicted of one of the less severe crimes that constitute D-Class duty. He was actually part of a release program, allowing him to eventually exit the Foundation alive and return to a normal life after he'd been involved in a certain number of studies. It seemed like a pretty fair trade. However, this was a real pearls before swine situation. Any true coaster head would relish the opportunity to take a joyride on SCP-2183. It'd be the greatest honor of their lives. But for the writer, all it was was a source of sweaty palms and an increased heart rate. Ha! <laughs> Talk about weak sauce, am I right? He had no idea he was in for the ride of his life, in what would be both the first and last human test of SCP-2183. They sat him down on one of the carts, strapped and buckled him in with the safety bar, and got that baby rolling. When the ride began, the carts took the normal path down the physical portion of the track, but as expected, Things got crazy when the carts hit the anomalous portion. Though nobody expected just how crazy this ride would get, least of all our lucky little rider himself. Ha! <laughs> if he could still talk, I'm sure he would have changed his tune by now. The rider's cart detached from the rest during the mid-air portion and took a sharp right, going off on its own adventure around the rest of the abandoned park. Everybody knew this was going to be something special, because even the Foundation Squares had never seen a cart act like this before. It looped around the whole place several times before whizzing through the park like a cruise missile, weaving between rides, stalls, and concession stands with ease. It was traveling blink and you'll miss it fast. This thing wasn't just white knuckle intense, it was broken knuckle intense. The rest of the carts returned to the starting point again and came to a stop, but the rider wasn't getting off that easy. 
There's a reason we call SCP-2183 the most intense roller coaster in this crazy world of ours. The cart containing the rider went AWOL, heading north out of the park at high speeds, putting it on a disastrous collision course with a nearby town. Well, disastrous if you work for the SCP Foundation. Totally awesome for the rest of us. The thing about a ride on SCP-2183 is that you really get your money's worth. When people nickname this thing the ride never ends, they don't just do that for fun. This ride literally never ends. Over the first few weeks of the rider's ride, the Foundation just tried to suppress news of sightings from spreading. Multiple people around the nearest Idaho towns reported seeing a flying roller coaster cart zipping around the sky. Thankfully for the killjoys of the world, that kind of thing is easily written off as a trick of the mind. But this didn't stop the rider's epic thrill ride from tearing it up all across Idaho. Over the next few months, this party train really hit the road. Metaphorically speaking, of course. This cart constantly remained 120 to 150 meters above the ground and kept traveling at consistent speeds of over 200 kilometers an hour. That makes it roughly tied for the second fastest roller coaster in the world. The people lucky enough to spot this bad boy in action reported that they heard a panicked, terrifying screaming coming from inside the cart as it passed. That's how you know that the rider was having a hell of a time in there. Real shame that anyone who spotted it got a big old dose of Class A amnesia sticks from the Killjoy Brigade. Speaking of those squares, the SCP Foundation tried multiple times to stop the ride and save the rider from this awesome experience. They sent in helicopters and lowered ladders down to him, but the rider, perhaps finally appreciating what a gift he was given here, kept his arms fastened to his sides, his face forced into a permanent grimace. Nobody knew how he could still be alive, despite having no food or water in all this time. Ha! We can only guess it's because SCP-2183 is just that awesome. Anytime these Foundation dweebs tried to get near the cart, it immediately undertook evasive maneuvers and got the hell out of there. Nobody could bring this ultimate ride to an end. In the end, the SCP Foundation proved they could take being anti-fun to straight-up military proportions. They approved firing a missile at this piece of coaster dream tech, hoping to finally bring its awesomeness to an end. After making a valiant effort to avoid them, the missile eventually struck the cart. They thought the rider inside was dead, but the cart kept flying for another four years before finally crashing 34 kilometers from the rest of the ride. Relatively unscathed, probably after crashing into one of those beefy Idaho pigeons. And as the Foundation would soon find out, the rider was still around too. He just wasn't in the cart anymore. Nope, he was suspended in the air in a seated position 124 meters above the crash carts. We call him the rider, cause he's still riding to this very day. And if anyone comes within a 50 meter radius of him in any direction, he'll just fly away until he's alone again. We don't know about you, but we think the rider's whole permanent flying situation isn't a horrific purgatory of eternal torment if he's alive under his comatose state. It's actually the ultimate ride. And really, what more could you want out of life, right? Sometimes people working on the site see him sitting in the cars, often only for a split second. He's one with the coaster now. Total Nirvana. Like we said before, kids, the ride never ends. Uh, what about this one? One SCP researcher called to the other. You've gotta be kidding. His colleague scoffed, interpreting the suggestion as little more than a joke. That thing's a piece of junk. She tapped a knuckle against the glass case, catching the attention of the tiny figure inside. Who dares? exclaimed the tinny, monotone voice. Release me from this irksome confinement so that I may bring about your final undoing, vermin, for I am Doomba 2000, the ultimate bringer of destruction. Both researchers laughed at the small automaton inside the glass. They had come to SCP Item Gallery 27 in search of non-organic anomalies to gather for testing. But judging by their reactions, it seemed that SCP-1370 wasn't going to make the cut. The cobbled together robot was widely considered to be a harmless, clumsy little oddity, rather than any kind of threat. But that didn't stop SCP-1370 from challenging any and all things around it to a battle to the death. Battles it always lost. Ah, this thing is junk, the second researcher remarked, flicking her finger at the glass again in an attempt to startle the robot. It is not organic, though, the other pointed out, observing that SCP-1370 had been constructed out of various recycled parts. Its head was a defunct and non-operational voltmeter, 
soldered awkwardly onto a weak neck joint. Its arms were wrenches, and it had been configured in such a way that gave the robot a top-heavy, impractical design. Inorganic, yes, but worth our time? Definitely not. Come on, we'll find something else to test in SCP-914. As the pair of researchers turned their backs on SCP-1370, it began to squawk at them again through the speaker embedded in its chest. You dare walk away from me? You have incurred the wrath of Robolord the Destructor and will soon be reduced to atoms by my hand. The tiny junk robot charged towards the two Foundation personnel, only to slam front first into the glass of the display case it was kept contained in. The force of the impact, combined with SCP-1370's imbalanced design, caused it to topple over and land on its back, leaving a huge crack in the glass. Ah, great. One of the researchers sighed, rolling her eyes. We're gonna have to report that SCP-1370's damaged its case again. Come on, let's go and get someone to replace that glass. You think we should just leave it here unsupervised in a damaged case? The other asked. Look at the thing, it's hardly competent enough to escape, the fellow researcher replied, as the tiny robot struggled to get itself back upright. I'm sure it'll be fine for a few minutes. Little did the pair of researchers realize as they left item gallery 27 that SCP-1370 had been listening to their conversation, picking up on a few details. While the anomalous automaton often displayed a low level of intelligence and awareness of its surroundings, it was still self-aware. And on top of that, harbored a hatred for all things it believed to be living. Although it could be easily tricked, and lacked any kind of real fighting ability, but it had picked up on something the researchers had mentioned, an SCP-914, perhaps through its own limited intelligence or some kind of other anomalous awareness, the tiny robot detected this to mean another machine. And so, standing back up, it struck the glass of its display case again, shattering one side completely. It hopped down to the ground, tumbling over thanks to its lack of balance, only to eventually stand back up and start making its way through the facility. Being only a meter tall made it easy for SCP-1370, otherwise known as Pesterbot, to sneak through the corridors of the Foundation site undetected. It eventually arrived at a room housing a large mass of gears and gyros, a machine filled with clockwork components that seemed to pull the little robot further in as it drew closer and closer to what the researchers had spoken of. SCP-914, the Clockworks, a device that could be used to refine any object placed inside it. Depending on the setting, items could be transformed, destroyed, or vastly improved using the Clockworks. Rough setting disintegrated any test subject, while coarse dismantled it to its base components. One-to-one -one replaced any item with an almost identical copy. Then, the fine setting would cause SCP-914 to improve any item, and very fine could refine an object to an even greater degree, usually by granting it anomalous properties. Testing of all biological matter within SCP-914 was strictly prohibited, but Pesterbot, well, he was made of metal. Sneaking into the room where the clockworks was located, SCP-1370 immediately caught sight of another Foundation researcher, who had been busy overseeing tests using the very fine setting of SCP-914. Instantly, the agitated little robot made a beeline for the researcher, swiping at her ankles with its wrench hands. Die! Die! It shrieked. Cower before the might of my claws! None can stand before the relentless destruction brought forth by Shivatron, despoiler of mirth! Referring to itself with one of its many elaborate self-appointed titles. Caught by surprise at the tiny robot, the researcher turned and screamed in surprise. Instinctively, she swung her leg back and brought it forward, delivering a swift kick to SCP-1370 that sent its metal body hurtling through the air, right into the clockworks. Pesterbot landed inside the input booth, the enormous collection of clockwork components whirring and heaving as they sprung to life. The researcher hadn't even realized what was happening. She'd been addressing how much her foot hurt after kicking the small metal robot. By the time she looked up, SCP-914 had already fully activated with SCP-1370 inside. In horror, she sounded the alarm to summon security, with no idea what the very fine setting would do to improve Pesterbot. A team of guards filed into the room, drawing their weapons and training them on the output booth of the clockworks. While they normally would have nothing to fear from SCP-1370, given its inability to ever win in a fight that it started. 
Even when fighting a potted plant that had been affixed with a speaker, the tiny robot had been bested. But the clockwork's refinement process meant that what would be stepping out of the machine wouldn't be the pesterbot the Foundation was familiar with. Sure enough, the heavy foot that came stomping down on the facility floor was a far cry from the flimsy metal limbs SCP-1370 had previously had. Out of the clockworks emerged a hulking robotic form, not just bigger and bulkier than the meter-tall, clumsy assembled pesterbot, but a huge, sleek machine built for bear. It was more humanoid, but stood at nearly seven feet tall. The weight and balance issues that had plagued the previous design were seemingly gone, as despite its increased size, this new and improved model of SCP-1370 seemed to move fluidly with smooth electronic motions. The robot turned and assessed its surroundings, scanning the group of Foundation security that had amassed outside SCP-914, its first new targets. As the machine stepped towards them, the security commander gave the word and the guards opened fire. A hail of gunfire rang out, deafening shots ringing in the security officers' ears as bullets spat out of their weapons towards the newly refined Pesterbot. By the time each of them had emptied their magazines and the smoke cleared, they realized to their terror that the robot was now bulletproof. You have engaged in an act of violence against Doom Master 1370, Master of All Doom. It announced in a new voice, one far deeper and more imposing than its previous tinny candor. Now it was a modulated electronic sound, far befitting its new look. Prepare to face consequences, retaliating. With that, the robot leaped into battle with all the grace and ferocity of a wild cat. The nearest security guard barely had a chance to reload his weapon raising his hands in a weak attempt at a block before the strike from a metallic fist knocked the wind out of him. Moving with balletic speed and precision, Pesterbot swiped and chopped at the guard, each hit connecting painfully with one of the man's vital pressure points, like it was a highly trained hand-to-hand -hand fighter. When the officer collapsed, unable to move save for letting out screams of excruciating pain, the robot turned to face its remaining targets. Freeze! One of the Foundation's security yelled raising his pistol with shaking hands. Zipping forwards, SCP-1370 grabbed the gun and wrenched it from the man's fingers, tearing the weapon apart like it was made of cardboard. Ripping the man by his SCP Foundation uniform, it launched him directly upwards, sending his body crashing through the ceiling, leaving a human-shaped hole above. Chunks of building materials rained down on the robot, including wiring and internal lengths of cable that ran through the walls and ceiling that were now exposed. As the security team retreated, SCP-1370 curiously reached up and gripped one of the electric cables, wrenching it out of the ceiling to examine it closer, causing sparks to shower. Pesterbot's new, sleek, metallic skin seemed to react to the metal in the wiring drawing out the copper that channeled electricity throughout the Foundation facility. It was more than a force of magnetism. It was something else. Ideas. SCP-1370 was learning, adapting, and most frightening of all, coming up with new ways to complete its purpose. Marching up to the nearest wall, it pulled back a metal fist and sent it slamming through paintwork and plaster to draw out the metal running through the building. Outside in the corridor, the lights died. In fact, the entire facility lost its power and plunged into darkness until the backup emergency lights activated, filling the Foundation's corridors with low-level blood-red light. More security officers had mobilized outside of the clockwork's room, expecting at any moment that the refined version of the previously harmless Pesterbot would soon appear. Sure enough, it did, and the red lighting was soon added to by yet another hail of frightening gunfire. But now, it seemed SCP-1370 had learned how to shoot back. An arc of lightning zapped through the corridor, electrifying every guard it touched and reducing them to little more than a smoldering husk. A second one followed, striking one guard with a bolt of blue electricity that then leaped from his body to the officer standing next to him, who had been close enough to touch his fallen comrade, and who was, of course, wearing plenty of conductive metal. The wiring in the walls, the electricity, SCP-1370 had learned how to weaponize it, and that wasn't all. As the robot stepped out of the room, it had pulled various other metalwork from the fabric of the building around it into its form, adding to its body in new and gruesome ways. 
Its shoulders now had additional armor. Long poles of rebar now extended out of its robotic forearms to act as crude, rudimentary impaling weapons. It had gotten even taller, and all forged out of metal it harvested from its surroundings. SCP-1370 hadn't just been made a better fighter, it had been given something else by SCP-914. Intelligence. The capacity for it to learn and perpetually adapt itself. And it wouldn't stop. It would keep improving itself to enact its original purpose. To fight anything and everything around it. A slaughter ensued. Everything the SCP Foundation threw at this new version of the Pesterbot only gave it more weapons and more offensive capabilities to add to its growing arsenal. The rebar weapons in its arms were replaced with sleek, sharp blades. Even bullets fired at it seemed to be absorbed into its mass, allowing it to keep growing. SCP-1370 was unstoppable, obliterating everyone that came to desperately try to contain it. And as it bested every opponent, left them decimated and defeated, something new happened to the robot. It couldn't feel emotions, just like with any automaton. It lacked the level of human cognition and complexity to respond to things with feelings. But as it killed more and more Foundation staff left and right, annihilating everything in its path, SCP-1370 experienced something. Not an emotion, but whatever the closest robotic equivalent to pure, unbridled happiness was. Satisfaction of the machine. Now able to complete the function it was originally built for, yet had failed at for so long. Getting bigger and bigger, adapting and adding more machines to itself, eventually SCP-1370 was a hulking behemoth. Cars and their combustion engines all became part of the robotic giant, every new piece of technology it encountered becoming a deadly weapon. And as Pesterbot started to tower over buildings, a huge-scale robotic threat, the Foundation had no choice. It was time to deploy another big bad bot to cut SCP-1370 back down to size. It was time to send in the Dragon Slayer. Someone was screaming inside the incinerator. The year was 1975. The location was a top secret refinery and waste disposal plant, one of the many front organizations owned and operated by the SCP Foundation. Mm -hmm. This sprawling facility, separated into three different huge units, each with a specialized task, was located around 75 kilometers outside of Summer Springs, Colorado. It had operated for several decades without incident, but today all hell was about to break loose. Alarms were blaring in Unit C, the area of the facility that dealt with destroying non-anomalous waste via incineration. A traumatized worker had pulled the emergency lever near one of the incinerators in a panic when he'd first heard the loud banging against the interior walls and then those horrific pained wails. That's when workers of Unit C came to a horrifying realization. The screams weren't just coming from one of the incinerators in Unit C. They were coming from all six. A chorus of absolute agony echoing up out of the ash pits. This was impossible as far as the Unit C staff were concerned. These incinerators were only to be used for confirmed non-anomalous material. Could some animals or even some poor workers somehow fallen into the incinerators? But even if they had, what were the odds that someone had fallen in all six of them at once? It was impossible. The site director was immediately brought in to authorize an investigation, at which point he determined that at least one of the furnaces, in this case furnace number four, be shut off so researchers and guards could investigate what was going on inside. It seemed like the obvious course of action, but for some of the people on site that day, this would prove to be a fatal mistake. When the fires were put out, something started rattling in the disposal chute. There was a scratching and squealing noise, like something scraping up against the metal. A maintenance worker was ordered to go check inside, and when he opened the hatch, he let out a bone-chilling shriek. There was something, or was it someone, climbing back up the disposal chute. It emerged from the darkness, backlit by the still-burning embers of the incinerator, letting out an awful screeching noise that could make even a hardened mobile task force operative shake with fear. The creature was humanoid, a charred, mutilated skeleton reaching out towards the maintenance worker with a bony claw. 
Before the worker had a chance to stumble back in horror, the beast had clasped him by the throat and started to squeeze. It didn't even need to strangle him. The heat of its skeletal hand burned away the worker's throat in seconds, leaving his limp, wheezing body to drop to the metal grate of the platform below him. Several armed guards and maintenance workers moved forward to fend off the monster, but just then a volley of more violent shrieks echoed out of the chute behind it. It only took seconds for over a dozen more creatures to crawl out of the disposal chute. They were all like the first, people at various stages of incineration. Some were glowing, charred skeletons with barely any flesh, others looking more like severe burn victims, their faces contoured into scowls of hate and rage. The assembled guards opened fire on the sudden influx of anomalies, emptying the magazines of their submachine guns into their burning bodies, but their weapons didn't seem to cause any lasting damage. The bullets would tear through the flesh of the creatures, causing some of them to stumble and fall, but the wounds would close and the creatures would rise again. It seemed they possessed a deadly combo of extremely high aggression and incredible regenerative abilities. None of the staff present in Unit C were safe as the burning corpses attacked anyone they could find with their bare hands, beating and biting and clawing. Many of them would grapple with Foundation personnel, latching onto them and trying to pull them back down into the incinerator with them. These creatures, that would later be known as SCP-2419-A, caused several fatalities with their surprise attack that day, and the situation was only brought back under control when a mobile task force that possessed more advanced training and weaponry was dispatched to the location. Despite orders from the site director, the MTF found it impossible to actually terminate any of the entities due to their regenerative abilities. Instead, the MTF agents focused on forcing the anomalies back into the chute of incinerator number four using a powerful industrial steam lance. Once they were back inside, the incinerator's burners were started up once again. The MTFs were also able to capture five of the entities and detain them for questioning and experimentation, finally bringing this unexpected containment breach to an end. The Foundation is an organization that prides itself on possessing forbidden and secret knowledge, but even they had no idea what had just happened. There seemed to be no earthly explanation why these creatures would suddenly manifest inside the incinerators, but as the detained anomalies continued regenerating, a slightly clearer picture of what exactly the Foundation was dealing with began to emerge. Every single one of the captured anomalies kept regenerating, and upon getting to the point that they were no longer burned scarred, the researchers studying the anomalous creatures discovered that each one was identical to a deceased D-Class from the Foundation's records. They were physically and genetically identical to the dead Class D personnel, perfect copies, save for the fact that their sole mission in life seemed to now be pure and unmitigated aggression and violence. Researchers wanted to gain greater insight into the minds of these strange creatures through the use of extensive psychological evaluations and interviews. It would turn out to be a very dangerous investigation. A psychological researcher by the name of Dr. Warren conducted an interview with one of the SCP-2419-A instances in hopes of better understanding their mindset. This creature had been heard laughing not long before the interview began, so it wasn't an unreasonable assumption to believe that it could be capable of speech. The interviewee was separated from Dr. Warren by a thick pane of glass to prevent it from indulging in any of its more violent urges. The problem was that Dr. Warren and his assistant researchers had severely underestimated what these creatures were capable of doing to get what they wanted. Dr. Warren tried to begin the interview in good faith. He spoke calmly and politely to the creature through the glass, attempting to remind it of the person it once was. The anomaly didn't appear to be paying attention to the doctor, though, instead focusing on pulling its own arm apart and breaking the bones within. Dr. Warren began to think that the creatures weren't even sentient. If the only activity they seemed to engage in was the wanton destruction of themselves and others, but underestimating them like this proved to be a big mistake. By removing the skin off of its arm and whittling its bone down to sharp edges, the anomaly had transformed its arm into a makeshift knife. 
Before anyone realized this, it had already used its own jagged bones to break the glass divider and attack Dr. Warren. He perished not long after, after being stabbed multiple times in his face and eyes, and the anomaly was forcefully taken back to its holding cell. Dr. Daniel Jennings, a senior researcher, was then put on the case. He released a chilling memo of the creatures after his observation period ended. It read, Before I came here, I worked as a prison shrink. Every person you met had a story bursting with pain and sorrow. Sometimes these stories were about the pain they suffered. Sometimes it was about the pain they inflicted. Some days you felt like everyone there was a beautiful soul torn down by their circumstances. Other days you'd find out what some of them did and a part of you was glad that they were there to suffer for it. But at the end of every day, I always told myself, they're all humans, they're all people. They all deserve the same dignity, respect, and love as everyone else. No exceptions, Dr. Jennings goes on. I opened up with that anecdote only so that you could understand that what I'm about to say is not said lightly. These things are not people. They are people-shaped monsters. They are well beyond any definition of psychopathy. Everything they do, they do to hurt, maim, and kill. I would pity them, but that would imply that they're worth pitying. Put them in a hole, then fill that hole with concrete. Better still, throw them back into the incinerator where you found them. I doubt they'll even care. Following this string of unfortunate incidents, containment procedures were put into place to hopefully prevent anything that had happened to the unlucky Foundation staff from happening again. The entire facility was fenced off and was constantly patrolled by MTF Beta-7, also known as the Maz Hatters, a group specializing in containing anomalies which present powerful biological, chemical, or radiological dangers. The furnaces that the anomalous creatures emerge from remain lit at all times, with workers checking and carrying out maintenance on every single one each day of the week. Outside of this, the facility is essentially a no-go zone. Reinforced steel hatches cover the chutes, and they are to forever remain bolted shut. All because of that one terrifying day in 1975. That was the day that the Summer Springs Waste Disposal Facility, which had been a valuable asset to the Foundation for decades, instead became classified as the Euclid Class Anomaly, SCP-2419. It is not uncommon for a Foundation asset to one day become a dangerous anomaly requiring containment, but the same question always pops up after. Why? What had a place that had been so valuable to the Foundation suddenly become such an active danger? The answer, as is often the case, is contained within the question. Why would a waste disposal plant be so important to the Foundation in the first place? And more importantly, what else was going on at the plant to make it such an area of active importance for one of the most powerful organizations in the entire world? To put it simply, the plant allowed the Foundation to dispose of something far more important than mere waste material. It gave them what they needed to better erase memories. As you probably already know, the Foundation makes liberal use of amnestics on those exposed to anomalous material to make them forget what they had seen and experienced. But these elusive chemicals, many of which are sourced from SCP-3000, are an inexact science. However, at the Summer Springs Waste Disposal Plant, researchers discovered an immensely valuable alternative. Much of what was disposed of in the incinerators of Unit C were the bodies of dead D-Class personnel. Before being burned, autopsies were performed on the bodies to make sure they were non-anomalous, including the brain. Back in the 1960s, while performing research on the brains of dead D-Classes, they found a method of extracting and distilling the positive memories of the dead, creating a kind of happy soup. When administered into someone who has undergone amnestic treatment, this happy soup creates positive false memories in their mind that fills in those pesky blank spaces that are often behind. This was so useful that happy memories were extracted from the minds of every single D-Class corpse that passed through Unit C, totaling well into the thousands by the time that the first SCP-2419-A instances began to rise. 
But as all happiness, joy, and love were removed from the minds of the D-classes, it seemed that all that was left was pure hate, pain, violence, and fury. Feelings too intense and evil to destroy. These were bodies imbued with a malice so powerful that no fire could ever burn them away. They exist now with single-minded determination to get out and destroy everything around them. Everything. Including the ones that made them. The SCP Foundation itself. And in the end, it's only a matter of time until they get out. There are thousands of them in there. Unable to die, unable to stop. The only thing keeping them in there is the constant burning of the furnaces around them. And those furnaces can't burn forever. The monsters lurking in SCP-2419 will outlive the fire that surrounds them. Because while the furnaces they are contained in are hot, the fires of hate that burn within SCP-2419 entities are even more powerful. And they know this. They know they can't be contained forever, and that someday soon, they'll be able to emerge and exact their terrible revenge. Those who must walk past the incinerators may think they hear their screams echoing out from within, but it's not screaming at all. It's laughter. Did you ever have to perform a dissection in school? Maybe you had to carve up a fetal pig, or slice into a frog while nightmarish visions of Kermit and a widowed Miss Piggy danced in your head. Though it's rarely a pleasant experience, unless your tastes are on the morbid side, most biology teachers would agree that the best way to learn how something works is to take it apart. As distasteful as it can be to hold a frog's tiny liver in your hands, it definitely does give you a better sense of the pieces that make up the complete creature. But what if there was an easier way to look at the individual parts of a living being? What if you could take it apart without ever having to prep a scalpel or stain your hands with the blood of innocent frogs? Like most of the seemingly impossible things in our world, the SCP Foundation discovered something that allows its users to do just that. In fact, it can handle a lot more than just a frog, and its applications go far beyond the confines of a high school science lab. SCP-291 is a small, plain steel building with a large door on one side. The door has no handle or knob and functions similarly to a garage door. The door cannot be pried open by any ordinary means, and the inside of SCP-291 can only be accessed if the structure is connected to a suitable power source. Once a power source has been connected, the door races and exposes a room inside. It is small, about 4 by 2 meters. It contains a console board, a large screen, and a plexiglass container resembling a coffin. How very sinister. The coffin is large enough to contain a human under 7 feet tall. So sorry, Ferdinand the Cannibal, you're going to need to sit this one out. The coffin sits on a conveyor belt, with several tubes connected to the wall above it. On the opposite side of the room, there are holes of varying sizes, each containing a small door that can be opened or closed. Because initial observation indicated that SCP-291 was intended for some kind of human testing, a D-class test subject was selected for experimentation. The subject was instructed to lie down in the coffin and wait to see what would happen next. The display screen lit up, depicting a grid-lined image of the test subject. Buttons along the console board adjusted the image, showing the skin, muscles, and organ systems of the person in the coffin. There were no words or numbers on the screen, and all of the buttons appeared to have only two settings, on and off. When one of the researchers pressed the first button on the console, the tubes above the coffin began pouring a blue liquid into it. The test subject reacted with confusion, but did not experience any adverse effects. They quickly lost consciousness, indicating that the liquid was some sort of sedative. The liquid continued to pour into the coffin until the vessel was completely filled, at which point it congealed into a thick gel. The test subject's breathing and heartbeat slowed to a stop, and the conveyor belt suddenly creaked to life. The coffin was carried, test subject inside, through a small door that immediately locked behind it. The small room was filled with the sounds of gears turning, machinery clinking, and motors whirring. The display screen was taken over by a large rectangle, resembling a traditional loading screen. After 30 minutes, the process was complete, and the back door of the room unlocked itself. When the researcher walked through the back door, they found another room with a conveyor belt and a row of two dozen lockers. Each locker was opened, one at a time, and its contents removed for examination. 
Inside each, the research team found a different portion of the test subject's body, in a block of some unidentified clear substance. The body was divided in the lockers into these separate parts brain, lungs and diaphragm, heart, digestive system, reproductive organs, left eye, right eye, upper left torso and arm, upper right torso and arm, lower left torso and upper leg, lower right torso and upper leg, lower left leg and foot, lower right leg and foot, lower left arm and hand, lower right arm and hand, neck and head, upper skeletal system, lower skeletal system, lymphatic and circulatory system, and skin. Phew, a miracle of the human body, right? boundless in its fascinating complexities. Each block of body parts was placed back in its designated locker, and the second button on the console was pressed. At this point, the doors to the organ locker sealed themselves shut, and the sound of the machinery working filled the small space once again. This continued for a duration of approximately 45 minutes. When the machinery went silent, a new plexiglass coffin emerged into the main room, with the test subject inside. He looked identical to how he had looked at the start of the experiment, with no evidence that he had previously been disassembled. The blue liquid slowly evaporated from the container, and the test subject opened his eyes. The lead researcher conducted an immediate interview with the reassembled subject, who reported no memory of the process after initial exposure to the blue liquid. They insisted that the process had been like a good night's sleep, which honestly makes us pretty eager to take it for a spin. A medical examination determined that there were only a few changes to the test subject during the disassembly and reassembly. When they returned to consciousness, the test subject's stomach was empty, they were naked, and all of their hair was gone. With this new understanding of SCP-291's anomalous properties, the Foundation decided to continue their experimentation. With each new test, the experiments became more creative and, unsurprisingly, more depraved. First, a D-class subject was placed in the coffin and disassembled. Then, instead of placing the various body parts in their designated lockers, the vital organs were removed from their storage before reassembly was attempted. This resulted in the equipment shutting down completely. A researcher pressed the third button, which forced a hard reset of the entire process, causing all of the blocks of body parts to eject via an exit hatch. During the next experiment, non-vital organs were removed before the subject's body was reassembled. The appendix and gallbladder were left out, and when the subject regained consciousness, these organs were still gone. However, there was no visible damage or scar tissue in their place. They were simply gone, as if they had never been there in the first place. So, if body parts could be removed from a test subject, could new body parts be added? Could existing body parts be replaced with different ones? A D-class subject in need of a skin graft following a flamethrower-based accident was placed in SCP-291. Once taken apart, a portion of healthy skin donated by another, somewhat unwilling D-class subject was placed in the locker, along with the skin already present there. Once the subject was put back together, the healthy skin had replaced the damaged skin with no adverse effects. Repeat attempts at this test showed that it was effective for limb transplants, heart transplants, and kidney transplants with a 0% failure rate across all tests. After determining that SCP-291 could be used for an untold amount of good, making organ donations easier and safer than ever, the Foundation naturally had to pivot to something more useless, but interesting and likely horrifying. After all, it's not like they could ever just make anomalous technology available to the public, right? Two D-class subjects, one man and one woman, were disassembled by SCP-291. The brains of the test subjects were swapped, and then they were reassembled. When they awoke, the subjects had the personalities and memories of the brain placed in their body. In a turn of events previously only seen in blockbuster comedies like Freaky Friday and the live-action Scooby-Doo movie, seminal piece of cinema, the subjects had swapped bodies. They were subsequently disassembled, their request to look at their new bodies naked having been swiftly denied, and the brains were returned to their rightful bodies. After the experiment was finished, the subjects appeared mostly normal. However, they did complain of disorientation as well as mental and physical discomfort over the next several days. After going through two brain transplants in one day, though, that's really the least you can expect. After perfecting the practice of swapping body parts between different human subjects, the ghoulishly curious research team decided to take things in an interspecies direction. A variety of test subjects, including cats, dogs, lizards, fish, mice, and, of course, humans, were selected for this next round of experiments. 
Twenty tests were performed using these new subjects, and only three of the experiments were successful in transferring body parts from an animal of one species to another animal of a different one. Attempts to swap body parts between mammals and reptiles or fish proved disastrous. When a fish and a human were both disassembled and the fish's gills were placed with the human's body parts, neither creature survived the reassembly process. The human awoke with a new set of gills embedded in their neck and immediately began gasping for the oxygen they could not take in. Within minutes, they had suffocated. The fish's fate was even worse. It did not reassemble so much as it became a pile of goo, scales, and two floating eyeballs. Experimentation with a human and a lizard yielded similar results, turning the lizard into a puddle of organic matter and killing the human test subject after only a few minutes. As disastrous as the failed cross-species tests were, the successful ones were almost as bad. Trial 001 involved a cat and a human, not wanting to attempt too much at once. The research team opted to just swap out one organ, the left eye. Both subjects survived the transfer and were able to use their new eye. The human subject reported full use of the cat's eye, with improved night vision in addition to trouble seeing color. The cat did not enjoy its new eye nearly as much as the human subject, and had clawed its human eye out of its head by the end of the following week. In Trial 007, a successful brain transfer was performed between an adult human man and an English Mastiff. The man in the Mastiff's body expressed discomfort with walking on all fours and asked to be returned to his body as soon as possible. The Mastiff in the man's body adjusted to bipedal locomotion in a few hours, but was disassembled after urinating on a researcher's shoes. The final successful trial, and the most unnerving, was Trial 016. A female D-class test subject's reproductive organs were swapped with those of a pregnant Labrador retriever. An ultrasound conducted after the transfer indicated that the Labrador fetuses survived the procedure and could conceivably be carried to term by the human subject. Several members of the research team began to take bets on whether or not she would end up giving birth to puppies, but the transfer was reversed within the day. So we'll never know what exactly would have happened. Perhaps that's for the best. Personally, we hope the Foundation's Ethics Committee gives some of these scientists a very stern talking to about their behavior on this one. When not in use for testing, SCP-291 is to be disconnected from any power sources. At least two personnel are positioned outside of its containment at all times, standing guard, and these personnel must be swapped out every week. When it is not connected to any power sources, SCP-291 is considered harmless, though it should still be treated with caution. The main entryway remains closed and locked when there is no available power source, but the door can be opened manually from the inside in the event of an emergency. Any disassembled organisms are stored in a locker in the containment facility, labeled with a Sharpie marker in order to keep track of what specimens are stored there. Whether this is the same Sharpie used to label food in the break room fridge is unknown, but just like Dr. Di Ramiro's ham sandwich, it's best to leave these items untouched. Any personnel found to be responsible for missing specimens will be transferred to another project and receive a strongly worded email. Dr. Lola Bergman was an accomplished senior researcher for the SCP Foundation. Her years of hard work studying anomalies and dedication to the Foundation had earned her a level 3 security clearance, allowing her to access a bevy of secret information across the Foundation's vast network. As a researcher and a scientist, Dr. Bergman was the naturally inquisitive type. She wanted to know everything there was to know about the strange and esoteric universe around her. That's why, when she heard about the file for SCP-2000, one of the organization's best-kept secrets, she was hooked. The only problem was that just to view the file, you had to be on the O5 Council or have a special subset of Level 4 clearance known as 4000. Unfortunately, Dr. Bergman was only a Level 3, but you know what they say, the forbidden fruit always tastes the sweetest. Dr. Bergman had given the Foundation years of service. What could the harm be in breaking the rules and getting a peek behind the curtain just this once? Through somewhat deceptive means, Dr. Bergman managed to get her hands on some 4,200 clearance credentials and decided to access the file on an encrypted personal device. They'd never even know. But as she entered the credentials, she found herself suddenly looking at an image on its face, nothing. An image of a dirt road in a field, with tiny white text reading, Remember Us. But this was a powerful, cognitohazardous image capable of causing immediate incapacitation. The next thing she knew, she was laying on the ground, unconscious. When she woke up, she was no longer a doctor at the SCP Foundation. 
She was on the street corner, unable to remember her own name, let alone her history. All she could do was murmur something about a secret under Yellowstone National Park. Dr. Bergman's years of service had meant nothing in the end. SCP-2000 is an anomalous asset so vital to not only the Foundation, but the entire world, that so much as attempting to access it without the proper clearance leads to immediate termination. But what's really hidden under Yellowstone National Park? And why are the Foundation higher-ups so intent on keeping it secret, even from most of their own ranks? Of course, Yellowstone National Park itself is no stranger to anomalous activity. The entire national park is technically an SCP known as SCP-1422. While it since has been neutralized, SCP-1422 caused all members of the SCP Foundation to have no awareness of Yellowstone National Park prior to 2007. But the true nature of SCP-2000, the secret hidden under Yellowstone National Park, is not only stranger than SCP-1422, but also, depending on your perspective, either profoundly relieving or utterly terrifying. But before you can truly understand the purpose and gravity of SCP-2000, or the Deus Ex Machina, we need to talk about the end of the world. In Foundation parlance, K-Class scenarios are events which have drastic implications on the state of society, normality, or even life. The most dangerous and feared of all of these are XK-Class scenarios, which are, for all intents and purposes, the apocalypse. There are a worrying number of anomalies capable of bringing about an XK-Class scenario if the Foundation ever dropped the ball on their protection or containment. While the Foundation believes that prevention is always preferable to the cure, what happens when prevention doesn't work? What happens when our worst fears are realized and the end truly comes for us all? The answer is SCP-2000 happens. Simply put, the anomaly is a reset button, a chance to start over when all life has been compromised by anomalous activity. 2000 is a giant and mysterious facility beneath Yellowstone National Park. The entrance is disguised as a disused park ranger station, feeding into a facility that burrows miles down into the earth. It's a place that contains incredible anomalous technologies capable of bringing the world back to its former glory, even after the worst happens. Only a select few personnel are allowed to work at the facility, keeping its machinery maintained in case the day comes where we ever need to use it again. These personnel are not allowed to come and go as they please, and their memories of 2000 are wiped if they're ever reassigned to different Foundation duties elsewhere. Why all the secrecy? SCP-2000 is the Foundation's and humanity's lifeboat, and as such, the base is well guarded both from potential human threats as well as anomalous activity and reality warpers. The surface-level entrance to the base is surrounded by a number of strategically placed Scranton Reality Anchors, or SRAs. These devices, largely constructed of corrosion-resistant beryllium bronze alloy, keep certain type of reality-bending anomalies from manifesting their powers within the vicinity of the base. However, these are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the state-of-the-art Foundation technology employed within and around SCP-2000. You probably have a lot of questions, and that's understandable. What kind of technology can possibly reverse an apocalypse? And what did we mean when we said we may need to use it again? Well, listen up, because this is going to be a lot to take in. SCP-2000 is powered by a liquid fluoride thorium reactor, stabilized by five Zyank Anastasikos constant temporal sinks, and hosts to the most miraculous technology of all. 500,000 bright Zartion hominoid replicators. Utilizing geothermal energy from the volcanic activity in the area, the base could potentially remain operational forever if Foundation staff kept up with maintenance. The grand majority of the space in this huge subterranean facility is taken up by building materials, construction equipment, factory machinery, agricultural equipment, and computer database storage. Why? Well, let's explain the process of the apocalypse and how it relates to the activities of SCP-2000. In any K-Class or end-of-the-world scenario that doesn't destroy SCP-2000 in the process, any surviving Foundation member can enact Procedure CYA-009, while any Foundation facilities globally can monitor the unfolding situation. While SCP-2000 is waiting for the all-clear to do its thing, remaining Foundation sites set in motion what is known as the Ganymede Protocol. This involves collecting and preserving materials which could be useful during the recreation process. However, it's extremely possible that in a sudden XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, there may be no surviving Foundation personnel, or at least, 
not enough to maintain any kind of organization. Thankfully, there are fail-safe measures for such a scenario. During the periods of extended inaction caused by an apocalypse that destroys most human life, SCP-2000 will gradually, autonomously, relax its security measures. Any personnel, regardless of clearance, will be able to activate the next stage of the process when this occurs. If such a thing doesn't happen for an extended period, the security measures lapse further, to the point that even the presence of an animal could activate it. This would set into motion Procedure Lazarus-01, humanity's last hope for survival. That's where the 500,000 bright Zartion hominoid replicators, or BZHRs, come in. These incredible pieces of anomalous technology are capable of perfectly cloning the entire human race from any given period in the last 20 years, even down to their ages and memories, thanks to Class G hallucinogens and developmental hypnotherapy. With a warm-up period of five days, these machines are capable of creating 100,000 viable, non-anomalous humans per day. The facility keeps records of all known human alleles and is capable of recreating any lost human genomes or generating as many new and unique genomes as necessary to repopulate human civilization. Which humans the machines generate depends on the period of time the machine is ordered to replicate. It will first reproduce prominent cultural and political figures, as well as the acting top brass of the SCP Foundation to coordinate the recreation effort, of course. The machine will then recreate, well, everyone else. You're probably wondering, if the world outside SCP-2000 has been destroyed, then what good is creating all these new humans if they have nothing to go back to? Thankfully, SCP-2000 has a contingency for rebuilding both the infrastructure of civilization as well as society itself. The first generation clones will have one mission, rebuild, and they will have quite literally all the resources in the world to do it. In addition to having all the physical equipment for buildings and agriculture, SCP-2000 stores an immense amount of data, which is appropriate, considering the whole facility is basically a huge backup drive for life itself. They have the entire internet backed up, as well as the sum of all human memory, and a wide cultural base with copies of thousands of famous works of art, music, and literature. They have all the scattered jigsaw pieces of the time that came before, and it's their job to put the whole thing back together. It's expected that many of the first generation of clones will die in this process, but that's fine. With the BZHRs working at full capacity, anyone can be replicated. As the population increases and spreads across the globe, rebuilding and recolonizing old settlements, population growth will increase exponentially. Once society returns to some kind of normal, decades after the activation of Procedure Lazarus-01, it becomes the Foundation's task to restore the psychological and historical status quo. Administrators will falsify dendrochronological, astronomical, and radiometric dating records to make it seem as though history never paused. They'll then employ amnestic agent NUE-5 and mass to erase and reconstruct the memories of the entire human population up until the chosen time prior to the end of the world. As far as civilization knows, nothing ever happened. History never stopped, and life goes on. It may seem comforting at first to know that the ultimate contingency is out there. Even if there's a containment breach of astronomical proportions and the world as we know it ends, there's still a way out. It means that there's hope, even in the bleakest situations. But of course, there are always caveats. After all, if a deal seems too good to be true, it's safe to assume it probably is. Whether any of this works is dependent on two factors. The first is that no anomalies or human insurgents infiltrate the SCP-2000 facility and destroy the equipment within. It's for this reason that discussion of the facility is so restrictive. If ever a powerful reality warper discovered and gained access to the facility, we would lose our lifeboat. The second factor is the overall integrity of the machines. After all, without proper maintenance, it's not hard for the technology to malfunction, often to truly horrifying results. The failure of some SRA and X-AX components is believed to have caused erroneous BZHR activity, resulting in the production of 10 million humanoid entities with internal biology wildly inconsistent with humanity. These beings remained unconscious for five weeks before dying. In the event of an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, well-maintained machines can reproduce the human race, but all it'd take is one little malfunction to release 10 million mutants who are effectively dead on arrival. Even with SCP-2000 in our back pocket, 
the fate of the world still lives on a knife's edge. But in a way that's not even the most frightening part of the existence of SCP-2000. Seeing as the machine can perfectly reproduce reality without leaving a trace behind, it raises the question, how many times has this happened? You may be surprised, but the Foundation can confirm this occurred at least twice in recorded history. But can you ever really be sure of how many times your clone has crawled out of the BZHR? We received a disturbing clue to the reality of the situation when human remains were discovered on site at SCP-2000. All tests indicate that the remains are between 450 and 700 years old, and have been matched to the very much alive Dr. Alto Clef, who has no knowledge of how these remains came to be there. The only other thing found within the remains was a note, hermetically sealed in a plastic document sleeve. The note read, Why do we have to build this thing? When did we do it? How long have we been doing it? Do we even know? And the answer? No, we don't. And for everyone's peace of mind, it's probably best to just forget about it, if you can. The war that ended the world started on October 9th, 1971. Tensions had been brewing for years between America and the Soviet Union. And even though people had done their best to keep a sense of normalcy, Everyone was wondering when the Cold War that had been brewing for the past 30 years would boil over. There were those who had been preparing for it for years, while others assumed that it would never amount to anything. Neither nation wanted to make the first nuclear strike, and even if that happened, the engineers would come out of their underground cities to intervene. But nobody knew for sure if the two world superpowers could ever come to an agreement, or if it would all end in total destruction. October 9th was the day that question was finally answered. The first American nuclear warhead detonated over the Gulf of Finland, only a few miles away from the city of Leningrad, where people were going about their day blissfully unaware of the destruction that was about to befall them. First came a citywide blackout, as the power grid was bombarded with a huge surge of radiation that caused bulbs to blow and wires to glow like they'd been struck by lightning. There was barely any time to react before the next wave hit, a white-hot flash so bright that many of those who couldn't get to cover were blinded. The third wave, by far the most destructive, was the force of the explosion itself. Like a powerful burning wind, it swept through the city, breaking windows, knocking over streetlights, ripping the leaves off trees, and bathing every car, building, and person with ash. People are trapped under the debris as some of the city's older, less well-maintained buildings come crumbling down. Even though the Soviet government had been preparing for this day to come and the Russian people had been put through mandatory safety drills, no amount of practice or planning could have prepared them for the real thing. The streets erupted into chaos. Cars were crashing into buildings, either because their drivers had been blinded by the light of the distant explosion or because the initial wave of radiation had shorted their batteries. People nearly trampled each other trying to get to underground shelters, as police and military tried to yell directions over the cacophony. Among the crowd, a family desperately tried to stay together. Irina and Nikolai Belotrov held tight to their children, Alexei and Tatiana. The whole family was still in their pajamas and barely had time to get their shoes on before they started rushing towards the neighborhood's designated underground bunker. Arena had Tatiana, who was only two, clutched tight to her chest, and Nikolai tried his best to keep 10-year-old Alexei's eyes shielded as they walked past the dead bodies of people who were once their friends and neighbors. It will be all right soon, son, Nikolai said, as much as to try and convince himself as his son. We're going underground, just like in the safety drills. Alexei nodded solemnly and kept his gaze straight ahead. They were almost at the end of the street, when just above the sounds of air raid sirens and screaming people, Alexei heard a familiar voice. Alexei! Alexei! The boy looked down to see his teacher, Mr. Petrov, trapped in the wreckage of his car. He must have been driving to work when the bomb struck. Father, stop! Alexei yelled, tugging at his father's shirt sleeve. That's my teacher! We have to help him or he won't make it to the shelter! The soldiers will help him once everyone else is in, said Nikolai. Alexei didn't listen. He wriggled free of his father's grip and ran to where his teacher lay pinned under the wrecked vehicle. Nikolai was calling after him, and though Irina wanted to wait for Alexei to come back, she was swept up in the tide of people and separated from her husband. 
Mr. Petrov was crying, thanking Alexei for coming to his aid. As Alexei got closer, he saw there was blood pooling out from under the wreck. It seemed if Mr. Petrov were going to make it out, his legs would likely be badly damaged. Alexei tried to lift the car himself, but even though he was strong for his age, he was still only a child. A soldier who had been helping people into the bomb shelter stopped what he was doing and ran over to Alexei. Hey kid! The soldier shouted. Leave him alone and go back to your family! You're going to hurt yourself! Alexei kicked and struggled against the soldier's grip as he was dragged back into the line with his family. But he's in trouble! Alexei cried. It's not your job to save him! His father scolded as he took his hand and led him down the stairs where they would rejoin his mother and sister. As Alexei and his father descended into the tunnels, Alexei heard a gunshot from the street above. Though he would survive long after that day, he never saw his teacher Mr. Petrov again. He never asked his father about what happened. The Belotrov family was reunited in the underground shelter, which had once been an underground train station. Tatiana had started crying, and Nikolai tried desperately to quiet her. Irina hugged her son so tight, he felt she might squeeze the life out of him. They were packed in with a dozen other families, some they knew and others who were strangers. Alexei recognized some of the other children from school and saw that some were there without their parents. While they were in the station, a soldier addressed the group and explained what would happen next. The train station was to serve as their temporary shelter until the proper negotiations were made with the engineers. As per a treaty that had been written and signed after the Second World War, the engineers had agreed to open the borders of their underground civilization to humans fleeing from a crisis above ground. Once the government had made a decision, the survivors were to be taken deep underground, where they would live until the war was over. Above ground, the Soviet Union began dealing with the fallout of the initial attack. It was clear that America could no longer be dealt with reasonably if they were willing to bomb one of the USSR's biggest cities. Though the bombing had cut communications between Leningrad and Moscow, eventually contact was re-established, and the army was able to radio the Kremlin with a full report on the damage. Leningrad was in ruin, with over a third of the population dead or otherwise too wounded to move underground. Those who had made it underground were receiving treatment from everything from broken bones and blindness to radiation poisoning. In a word, it was chaos. Russian parliament was quick and ruthless in their decision to strike back. On October 12th, Secretary Brezhnev authorized nuclear missiles to be launched at both New York City and Washington, D.C. Millions were killed, and just like in Russia, the survivors retreated underground. America didn't go down without a fight, though, and launched another missile attack this time at Moscow. It wasn't long before both countries' allies were involved in the conflict as well, with missile strikes coming from France, China, North Korea, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Within a month, the surface of the Earth was dangerously irradiated, and any humans who were still living had retreated underground. But though the world had ended, the war had not. Alexei Belotrov and his family struggled to adjust to their new life underground, Though the engineers were intelligent and human-like, their world was so different from the world Alexei had lived in for the first ten years of his life. He barely ever saw them. The engineers were nocturnal, sleeping while an artificial sun nourished the genetically engineered plants that grew around the city. But any time he tried to ask questions about them, he was met with hushed silence by the adults. The engineers were spoken of in hushed, almost reverent tones. They were the beings that saved humanity, yes, but they had also helped build the weapons that led to the war in the first place. Alexei barely had any time to settle into this new life before what remained the Russian army started looking for new recruits. Reports had come in from an above-ground scout that the Americans were working on a new type of armor that could fully shield the wearer against radiation, and the Soviets could not afford to be outmatched when their army was still recovering from multiple nuclear attacks. But the army wasn't asking for able-bodied adult men to enlist, they were looking for children. We can't possibly send our son to war, Irina said. Arguments at the dinner table had become common in the Belotrov family. He would not be going to war, Nikolai argued. Not until their new anti-radiation technology is perfected. He won't be ready until he's an adult. How do you know that what they're making in those labs won't kill him? Arena said. Do we really want to trust these underground devils with our son? How much do we really know about the engineers anyway? 
They could have let us all burn on this surface, Nikolai said. But they didn't. I think we should trust them. I want to go, said Alexei. I should. Some of my friends have already enlisted. Both of his parents were stunned, but it made sense to Alexei. He wanted the war to be over, and he wanted to leave the underground city. But most importantly, he wanted to know if anyone was still alive on the surface. If there was even a sliver of chance that it could be habitable again, he wanted to find out. After much discussion, Irina and Nikolai agreed. It was what was best for the future of Russia, and ultimately, the future of the human race. Alexei's parents delivered him to the Office of Army Recruitment, and he was taken by a man named Commander Volkov to a specialized research facility. This was when Alexei met an engineer for the first time. The engineer was tall and hairy, like a bear walking on its back legs, but with face and hands more like a human's. He was overseeing a group of humans and other engineers as they tinkered with machines that Alexei couldn't even begin to guess the purpose of. Do not be frightened, Alexei, Commander Volkov said. They're going to explain the procedure to you before you have to agree to anything. The engineer looked the boy over, then held up a jar containing something that looked like an insect's exoskeleton. It was green, the same shade as the USSR's army uniforms. This is our new bioorganic armor prototype, the engineer said. We can only graph it onto you while you are still growing. It must grow with you, starting on your back, then moving to your limbs, then your head. Alexei was frightened by the idea, but didn't want to seem weak. He wanted to make sure his father would be proud of him. He was taken into surgery, where the team of engineers and human doctors grafted the plate of bioorganic armor onto his spine. Once the surgery was over, he was wheeled into a recovery room, where he was fed a simple meal alongside all of his friends and classmates. They had all gone through the same procedure. Over the next eight years, Alexei and his comrades went through the painful process of growing their exoskeleton. Like the engineer had said, it grew with them. But the growth happened in painful spurts rather than gradually. The worst thing about the armor was that it couldn't be removed, but it gave them many advantages to normal soldiers as well. Once it covered Alexei's legs, he found he could jump higher and run farther than any human normally could. When it grew over his arms, it gave him increased strength. By the time he was 18, it had covered his head, giving it a fly-like appearance, but also granting him stereoscopic vision and the ability to hear radio transmissions without the need for any other communication device. During this time, he and the other boys were trained by Commander Volkov, learning how to use the powers granted to them by their exoskeletons for combat. When they were deemed ready, they were all outfitted with shoulder cannons, supply packs, and guns, all of which were also bioorganic and were surgically attached. It had been eight long years since the end of the world, and Alexei was now able to set foot back on the surface. The world he returned to was almost unrecognizable. There were no signs of life outside of weeds and vines overtaking the irradiated ruins of buildings. Within the first hour of returning to the surface, Alexei gave up any hope of finding survivors. He heard Volkov's voice barking orders through the suit. There was no time to reminisce about the past. The soldiers had a job to do. Welcome back, comrade. The case of SCP-2273, also known as Major Alexei Belotrov, has sparked your imagination, and you need to know more. But even if you're not familiar with the Major, his story, all you need to know is that it's one of war, tragedy, and alternate dimensions. He first appeared in the town of Danner, Wisconsin, on the 13th of October, 1989, during an unprecedented seismic event. When he was first discovered, the Foundation researchers assumed that he was an extraterrestrial being on account of his advanced organic exoskeleton. In a surprising move for such an imposing creature, Belotrov gave himself up to Foundation agents without a fight. Major Belotrov was then impounded in Foundation Containment Site 17, where he was interrogated thoroughly. Over a series of interviews, the Foundation ascertained that Belotrov came from an alternate timeline where Russia and the US are locked in a so-called war to end the world, thanks to advanced military technology given to them by SCP-1000. Belotrov had nearly escaped execution at the hands of American soldiers and appeared in our timeline. 
Now he is a prisoner of the advanced suit that formerly kept him alive. But his story isn't over. The last remnant of a Cold War turned hot has plenty left to teach us. Something that you need to understand about the SCP Foundation before we go any further is that it doesn't only exist in every nation across the globe. It also exists in every splinter reality across the multiverse. And these splinter realities offer a countless multitude of tales, of different places, different people, and different times. Today's tale concerns Major Balatrov's future, in a universe where the secrecy of the Foundation is broken, and the anomalous world needs to find a way to fit in with our own. The year was 2018. Like many humanoid anomalies that the Foundation was holding in this timeline, Belatrov was released from containment. He was no longer an SCP. He was now a mere person of interest, free to move around as he pleased. But this didn't mean Belatrov was about to enjoy a quiet life on Easy Street. He was still an interdimensional refugee from a broken alternate world. Thankfully, there was a certain group willing to help the MANA Charitable Foundation. This anomalous charity has been involved in a number of strange cases investigated by the Foundation before, and now they were going to lend a hand to Major Belatrov. Thanks to their anomaly reintegration project, MANA was able to transport Belatrov back to his home of Volograd in Russia. There, he became something of a national celebrity, making headlines across the country, sitting down for interviews on every Russian talk show, and even being offered book deals. But as a former military man, Belatrov was eager to return to government life and run for a government position. However, this ambition didn't go very far. Belatrov was rejected by all the government bodies he applied to. Even Vladimir Putin wasn't eccentric enough to want an insectoid cyborg from another dimension in his cabinet. Belatrov endured a rough two years in Volograd. He was treated more like a sideshow freak than a human being. People didn't want to rent apartments to him, and he was never able to find permanent employment. Even entry-level jobs rejected him. Nobody wanted to get food served to them by what looked to be a seven-foot monster, and he seemed equally ill-suited to help Russian women find the right perfume in department stores. In April of 2020, Belatrov had finally had enough. He contacted the MANA Charitable Foundation once again and asked to be relocated. They told him that some religious institutions in the area, including the Eastern Clockwork Orthodox Church, were accepting and housing anomalous refugees. Not long after this, Belatrov truly fell off of the SCP Foundation's radar. But one former Foundation operative was well aware of Major Belatrov's fate. It's 2021. Dr. Friedrich, the Site-17 anomaly psychologist who'd conducted all the initial interviews with Belatrov all the way back in 1989, started receiving letters from him. There was no indication as to his true location, and they appeared to have been handled by a MANA Charitable Foundation mail carrier in Russia. But Dr. Friedrich was happy to hear from an old friend nonetheless. Due to a career of working near highly radioactive anomalies like Belatrov, Dr. Friedrich was suffering from terminal lymphoma. It seemed almost like an act of divine providence that Belatrov's letters would come to him so close to the end. The two began a correspondence, and it was only after Dr. Friedrich's eventual death that the letters came to the SCP Foundation's attention. It was from this final correspondence that the Foundation was able to answer the big question. Whatever happened to Major Alexei Belatrov? In his first letter to Dr. Friedrich, Belatrov thanked him profusely. He knew that Dr. Friedrich had been a crucial part of him gaining freedom from the Foundation, and credited the therapeutic techniques taught to him by Dr. Friedrich with keeping him alive and sane to this day. Belatrov expressed a mix of amazement at this brave new world and a sense of profound weariness. As a man eternally locked into a weapon of war, he felt unsuited to a world in peacetime. He almost missed the scorched, irradiated Russia of his home dimension. But most of all, he missed Site-17. He missed Dr. Friedrich. He missed some of his fellow anomalies like SCP-507, the teleporting man, and SCP-163, the spacecraft. He even missed the simplicity of being contained. He hoped that Dr. Friedrich would write back. 
In his second letter, Belotrov began detailing his experience with the Eastern Clockwork Orthodox Church. Despite growing up in a highly atheistic communist environment, Belotrov became enamored with the ways of the church. He found them to be highly accepting of him in spite of his unfortunate circumstances. They displayed a freedom in their faith that Belotrov had never encountered before, and he was eager to be a part of it. With the help of Dr. Friedrich, Belotrov was also sending letters to some of his fellow freed anomalies. He signed off by saying that he had even started praying, something he'd never considered before. The next letter, sent in 2027, struck a much more somber tone. It was sent shortly after Belotrov discovered Dr. Friedrich's diagnosis. He wanted to return and see the doctor one more time, but the Mana Charitable Foundation wouldn't allow him to return to Site 17 believing he had been abused during his time there. Belotrov gave Frederick his prayers and well wishes, and asked for a number through which he could contact his ailing old friend. By the time the next letter arrived in 2034, Belotrov had become a fully-fledged member of the Eastern Clockwork Orthodox Church. He referred to the other monks at the monastery as his brothers and sisters. He seemed to have finally found a true home there, and the others fondly referred to him by the nickname Father Anvil. But the true heart of the letter is Belotrov's deep concern for Dr. Friedrich's health. Notably in this letter, he often refers to Dr. Friedrich by his first name, Thomas, as though to emphasize the urgency of the message. After the deaths of several of the anomalies that Belotrov considered friends, he stated that he couldn't handle losing anyone else. His letter ends with a poignant passage. You may be unmarried, Dr. Friedrich, but you are not unloved. You have to be strong for me. You have to be strong for yourself. If you're ever worried that you cannot find the strength to continue, think of the garden you'll plant this spring. I'd like to share gardening photos with you again. Not many of my brothers and sisters here appreciate the simple beauty of a flower bed, or the effort that goes into growing a patch of vegetables. It's a beauty I'd like to continue to share. Trust in the power of our Lord, Thomas, and trust in the power of modern medicine. God is smiling on you. Please, be strong. With love and prayers, Alexei Belotrov. This letter arrived on the 15th of February, 2034. Sadly, Dr. Friedrich had already passed away four days earlier. He never got to see Alexei's final letter, and it truly was his final letter. With nobody left for him in the world, Major Belotrov stopped sending any correspondence. What we know about the final years of Belotrov's life all comes from a few scattered journal entries, translated from Russian after his passing. They provide clues as to the kind of life he lived during the 29 years the Foundation could not account for his whereabouts and his actions. The first entry, written on January 7, 2035, paints a grim picture of Belotrov feeling broken and isolated in the monastery. He wrote, Today is the day that our monastery celebrates the birth of our Lord. However, I feel no desire to celebrate. All of my friends in this world are dead. My brothers and sisters are partaking in some celebration outside my dormitory. All of the required ceremonies are complete. Neither they nor whatever is happening out there will lighten my mood. Belotrov also wrote about losing the comfort he once had in his faith and his doubts about whether he would be able to recapture that comfort. But he had survived greater traumas than this, and he would continue to press on. As the months turned to years and the years turned to decades, Belotrov climbed through the ranks of the monastery. Seeing as the Eastern Clockwork Orthodox Church practically worshipped the concepts of industrialization and mechanization, the fact that Belotrov was permanently encased in a biomechanical exoskeleton probably made him seem even more pious to his holy brethren. The final piece of evidence collected by the Foundation into the life and times of Alexei Belotrov came just over 20 years later, in a final address written to comfort his followers in preparation for his own death. Belotrov recounted the details of his own life, being born into a world of fire, death, and mushroom clouds. Then his life being suddenly saved by forces beyond his control, only to place him into containment for almost 30 years. It was only after accepting the teachings of the church and accepting the clockwork goddess that he felt he was truly free from his past. In this final note, Belotrov lay out some of the teachings of his new religion, the belief in a great mechanized goddess who planned all of reality. According to Belotrov, everything in her design fits together perfectly, like cogs in a machine, 
turning and twisting in unison to create an ideal world. He hoped to be forgiven for the many violent sins he committed in his military life, and that his contributions to this new world were valuable. At the very end of his address, Belitrov wrote, I do not believe that my time in this world is much longer. Brothers and sisters, when my time of judgment comes, do not mourn me. I would rather you remember these words. The goddess is most pleased with those who seek kind, non-violent resolution to their problems. Because a machine whose gears grind against each other is a machine that cannot work. See truth, but also compassion. The words are only words. Seek out truth within them. God bless you all, Father Anvil. A month after authoring this statement, records indicate that Alexei Belitrov was found dead in his room, having passed away peacefully in his sleep from natural causes. He lived a warrior's life, but died a humble priest's death. The true tragedy in the strange life of Major Alexei Belitrov is how little choice he had in his circumstances. But thanks to this tale, we know he did what he could with the life he was given. His remains lay within the graveyard at the Eastern Clockwork Orthodoxy Monastery, where he spent the last years of his life. With a life as difficult as his own, we can only imagine he's glad to finally rest. Now check out SCP-2273 Major Alexei Belitrov for a more in-depth retelling of the original story, and SCP-5000-Y, the full story compilation for more insanity from another dimension.